Prefatory and Chapter One of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain. Chapter One. Prefatory. This book is merely a personal narrative and not a pretentious history or a philosophical dissertation. It is a record of several years of variegated vagabondizing, and its object is rather to help the resting reader while away an idle hour than afflict him with metaphysics or goad him with science. Still, there is information in the volume, information concerning an interesting episode in the history of the Far West, about which no books have been written by persons who were on the ground in person and saw the happenings of the time with their own eyes. I allude to the rise, growth, and culmination of the silver-mining fever in Nevada, a curious episode in some respects, the only one of its peculiar kind that has occurred in the land, and the only one, indeed, that is likely to occur in it. Yes, take it all around, there is quite a good deal of information in the book. I regret this very much but really it could not be helped. Information appears to stew out of me naturally, like the precious otter of roses out of the otter. Sometimes it has seemed to me that I would give worlds if I could retain my facts, but it cannot be. The more I caulk up the sources, and the tighter I get, the more I leak wisdom. Therefore I can only claim indulgence at the hands of the reader, not justification. The Author. CHAPTER One. My brother had just been appointed Secretary of Nevada Territory, an office of such majesty that it concentrated in itself the duties and dignities of Treasurer, Comptroller, Secretary of State, and Acting Governor in the Governor's absence. A salary of eighteen hundred dollars a year and the title of Mr. Secretary gave to the great position an air of wild and imposing grandeur. I was young and ignorant, and I envied my brother. I coveted his distinction and his financial splendor, but particularly and especially the long, strange journey he was going to make, and the curious new world he was going to explore. He was going to travel. I never had been away from home, and that word travel had a seductive charm for me. Pretty soon he would be hundreds and hundreds of miles away on the great plains and deserts and among the mountains of the far west, and would see buffaloes, and Indians, and prairie dogs, and antelopes, and have all kinds of adventures, and maybe get hanged or scalped, and have ever such a fine time, and write home and tell us all about it, and be a hero. And he would see the gold mines, and the silver mines, and maybe go about an afternoon when his work was done, and pick up two or three pailfuls of shining slugs, and nuggets of gold and silver on the hillside. And by and by he would become very rich, and return home by sea, and be able to talk as calmly about San Francisco, and the ocean, and the isthmus, as if it was nothing of any consequence to have seen those marvels face to face. What I suffered in contemplating his happiness, Penn cannot describe. And so, when he offered me, in cold blood, the sublime position of private secretary under him, it appeared to me that the heavens and the earth passed away, and the firmament was rolled together as a scroll. I had nothing more to desire. My contentment was complete. At the end of an hour or two I was ready for the journey. Not much packing up was necessary, because we were going in the overland stage from the Missouri frontier to Nevada, and passengers were only allowed a small quantity of baggage apiece. There was no Pacific Railroad in those fine times of ten or twelve years ago, not a single rail of it. I only proposed to stay in Nevada three months. I had no thought of staying longer than that. I meant to see all I could that was new and strange and then hurry home to business. I little thought that I would not see the end of that three-month pleasure excursion for six or seven uncommonly long years. 
I dreamed all night about Indians, deserts, and silver bars, and in due time, next day, we took shipping at the St. Louis Wharf on board a steamboat bound up the Missouri River. We were six days going from St. Louis to St. Joe, a trip that was so dull and sleepy and eventless that it has left no more impression on my memory than if its duration had been six minutes instead of that many days. No record is left in my mind now concerning it, but a confused jumble of savage-looking snags which we deliberately walked over with one wheel or the other, and of reefs which we butted and butted, and then retired from and climbed over in some softer place, and of sandbars which we roosted on occasionally and rested, and then got out our crutches and sparred over. In fact, the boat might almost as well have gone to St. Joe by land, for she was walking most of the time anyhow, climbing over reefs and clambering over snags patiently and laboriously all day long. The captain said she was a bully boat, and all she wanted was more sheer and a bigger wheel. I thought she wanted a pair of stilts, but I had the deep sagacity not to say so. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of Roughing It this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain. Chapter 2. The first thing we did on that glad evening that landed us at St. Joseph was to hunt up the stage office and pay a hundred and fifty dollars apiece for tickets per overland coach to Carson City, Nevada. The next morning, bright and early, we took a hasty breakfast and hurried to the starting-place. Then an inconvenience presented itself, which we had not properly appreciated before, namely, that one cannot make a heavy travelling trunk stand for twenty-five pounds of baggage, because it weighs a good deal more. But that was all we could take, twenty-five pounds each. So we had to snatch our trunk open, and make a selection in a good deal of a hurry. We put our lawful twenty-five pounds apiece all in one valise, and shipped the trunks back to St. Louis again. It was a sad parting, for now we had no swallow-tail coats and white kid gloves to wear at Pawnee receptions in the Rocky Mountains, and no stove-pipe hats, nor patent leather boots, nor anything else necessary to make life calm and peaceful. We were reduced to a war-footing. Each of us put on a rough, heavy suit of clothing, woolen army shirt, and stogie boots included. And into the valise we crowded a few white shirts, some underclothing, and such things. My brother, the secretary, took along about four pounds of United States statutes, and six pounds of unabridged dictionary, for we did not know, poor innocents, that such things could be bought in San Francisco on one day and received in Carson City the next. I was armed to the teeth with a pitiful little Smith & Wesson seven-shooter, which carried a ball like a homeopathic pill, and it took the whole seven to make a dose for an adult. But I thought it was grand. It appeared to me to be a dangerous weapon. It only had one fault. You could not hit anything with it. One of our conductors practiced while on a cow with it, and as long as she stood still and behaved herself, she was safe. But as soon as she went to moving about, and he got to shooting at other things, she came to grief. The secretary had a small-sized Colt's revolver strapped around him for protection against the Indians, and, to guard against accidents, he carried it uncapped. Mr. George Bemis was dismally formidable. George Bemis was our fellow-traveller. We had never seen him before. He wore in his belt an old original Allen revolver, such as irreverent people called a pepper-box. Simply drawing the trigger back, cocked and fired the pistol. As the trigger came back, the hammer would begin to rise and the barrel to turn over, and presently down would drop the hammer and away would speed the ball. To aim along the turning barrel and hit the thing aimed at was a feat which was probably never done with an Allen in the world. But George's was a reliable weapon, nevertheless, because, as one of the stage-drivers afterwards said, if she didn't get what she went after, she would fetch something else. And so she did. She went after a deuce of spades nailed against a tree once, and fetched a mule standing about thirty yards to the left of it. Bemis did not want the mule, 
but the owner came out with a double-barreled shotgun and persuaded him to buy it, anyhow. It was a cheerful weapon, the Allen. Sometimes all its six barrels would go off at once, and then there was no safe place in all the region round about, but behind it. We took two or three blankets for protection against frosty weather in the mountains. In the matter of luxuries we were modest. We took none along but some pipes and five pounds of smoking tobacco. We had two large canteens to carry water in, between stations on the plains, and we also took with us a little shot-bag of silver coin for daily expenses in the way of breakfasts and dinners. By eight o'clock everything was ready, and we were on the other side of the river. We jumped into the stage, the driver cracked his whip, and we bowled away and left the states behind us. It was a superb summer morning, and all the landscape was brilliant with sunshine. There was a freshness and breeziness, too, and an exhilarating sense of emancipation from all sorts of cares and responsibilities that almost made us feel that the years we had spent in the close, hot city, toiling and slaving, had been wasted and thrown away. We were spinning along through Kansas, and in the course of an hour and a half we were fairly abroad on the Great Plains. Just here the land was rolling, a grand sweep of regular elevations and depressions as far as the eye could reach, like the stately heave and swell of the ocean's bosom after a storm. And everywhere were cornfields, accenting with squares of deeper green this limitless expanse of grassy land. But presently this sea upon dry ground was to lose its rolling character and stretch away for seven hundred miles as level as a floor. Our coach was a great swinging and swaying stage of the most sumptuous description, an imposing cradle on wheels. It was drawn by six handsome horses, and by the side of the driver sat the conductor, the legitimate captain of the craft, for it was his business to take charge and care of the mails, baggage, express matter, and passengers. We three were the only passengers this trip. We sat on the back seat, inside. About all the rest of the coach was full of mail-bags, for we had three days delayed mails with us. Almost touching our knees, a perpendicular wall of mail-matter rose up to the roof. There was a great pile of it strapped on top of the stage, and both the fore and hind boots were full. We had twenty-seven hundred pounds of it aboard. The driver said, A little for Brigham and Carson and Frisco, but the heft of it for the engines, which is powerful troublesome out they get plenty of truck to read. But as he just then got up a fearful convulsion of his countenance which was suggestive of a wink being swallowed by an earthquake, we guessed that his remark was intended to be facetious, and to mean that we would unload the most of our mail matter somewhere on the plains, and leave it to the Indians or whoever wanted it. We changed horses every ten miles, all day long, and fairly flew over the hard level road. We jumped out and stretched our legs every time the coach stopped, and so the night found us still vivacious and unfatigued. After supper a woman got in who lived about fifty miles further on, and we three had to take turns at sitting outside with the driver and conductor. Apparently she was not a talkative woman. She would sit there in the gathering twilight and fasten her steadfast eyes on a mosquito rooting into her arm, and slowly she would raise her other hand till she had got his range, and then she would launch a slap at him that would have jolted a cow. And after that she would sit and contemplate the corpse with tranquil satisfaction, for she never missed her mosquito. She was a dead shot at short range. She never removed a carcass, but left them there for bait. I sat by this grim sphinx and watched her kill thirty or forty mosquitoes, watched her, and waited for her to say something. But she never did. So I finally opened the conversation myself. I said, "'The mosquitoes are pretty bad about here, madam.' "'You bet!' "'What did I understand you to say, madam?' "'You bet!' Then she cheered up and faced round and said, "'Danged if I didn't begin to think you fellers were deef and dumb. I did, begosh. Here I've sought and sought and sought.' a bustin musketeers and wonderin what was ailin ye fust i thought you was deef and dumb then i thought you was sick or crazy or suthin 
And then by and by I begin to reckon you was a parcel of sickly fools that couldn't think of nothing to say. Where'd you come from? The Sphinx was a Sphinx no more. The fountains of her great deep were broken up, and she reigned the nine parts of speech forty days and forty nights, metaphorically speaking, and buried us under a desolating deluge of trivial gossip that left not a crag or pinnacle of rejoinder projecting above the tossing waste of dislocated grammar and decomposed pronunciation. How we suffered, suffered, suffered! She went on, hour after hour, till I was sorry I ever opened the mosquito question and gave her a start. She never did stop again until she got to her journey's end toward daylight, and then she stirred us up as she was leaving the stage, for we were nodding by that time, and said, "'Now you get out at Cottonwood, you fellers, and lay over a couple days, and I'll be along some time to-night, and if I can do ye any good by edging in the word now and then, I'm right thar. Folks'll tell you that I've always been kind of offish and particular for a gal that's raised in the woods, and I am with a rag-tag and bobtail, and a gal has to be, if she wants to be anything. But when people comes along, which is my equals, I reckon I'm a pretty sociable heifer after all." We resolved not to lay by at Cottonwood. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Roughing It This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain Chapter 3 About an hour and a half before daylight we were bowling along smoothly over the road, so smoothly that our cradle only rocked in a gentle lulling way that was gradually soothing us to sleep and dulling our consciousness, when something gave away under us. We were dimly aware of it, but indifferent to it. The coach stopped. We heard the driver and conductor talking together outside, and rummaging for a lantern, and swearing because they could not find it. But we had no interest in whatever had happened, and it only added to our comfort to think of those people out there at work in the murky night, and we snug in our nest with the curtains drawn. But presently by the sounds there seemed to be an examination going on, and then the driver's voice said, "'By George, the thoroughbrace is broke!' This startled me broad awake, as an undefined sense of calamity is always apt to do. I said to myself, "'Now a thoroughbrace is probably part of a horse, and doubtless a vital part, too, from the dismay in the driver's voice. Leg, maybe. And yet how could he break his leg waltzing along such a road as this? No, it can't be his leg. That is impossible, unless he was reaching for the driver. Now, what can be the thoroughbrace of a horse, I wonder? Well, whatever comes, I shall not air my ignorance in this crowd, anyway. Just then the conductor's face appeared at a lifted curtain, and his lantern glared in on us and our wall of male matter. He said, Gents, You'll have to turn out a spell. Thoroughbrace is broke." We climbed out into a chill drizzle, and felt ever so homeless and dreary. When I found that the thing they called a thoroughbrace was the massive combination of belts and springs which the coach rocks itself in, I said to the driver, "'I never saw a thoroughbrace used like that before, that I can remember. How did it happen?' "'Why, it happened by trying to make one coach carry three days' mail. That's how it happened,' said he. "'And right here is the very direction which is wrote on all the newspaper bags, which was to be put out for the engines for to keep em quiet. It's most uncommon lucky, cause it's so nation dark I should have gone by unbeknownst if that air thoroughbrace hadn't broke.' I knew that he was in labor with another of those winks of his, though I could not see his face because he was bent down at work, and wishing him a safe delivery, I turned to and helped the rest get out the mail sacks. It made a great pyramid by the roadside when it was all out. When they had mended the thoroughbrace, we filled the two boots again, but put no mail on top, and only half as much inside as there was before. The conductor bent all the seat backs down, and then filled the coach just half full of mail bags from end to end. We objected loudly to this for it left us no seats. But the conductor was wiser than we, and said a bed was better than seats, 
and, moreover, this plan would protect his thoroughbraces. We never wanted any seats after that. The lazy bed was infinitely preferable. I had many an exciting day subsequently lying on it, reading the statutes and the dictionary, and wondering how the characters would turn out. The conductor said he would send back a guard from the next station to take charge of the abandoned mail-bags, and we drove on. It was now just dawn, and as we stretched our cramped legs full length on the mail-sacks, and gazed out through the window across the wide wastes of greensward clad in cool, powdery mist, to where there was an expectant look in the eastern horizon, our perfect enjoyment took the form of a tranquil and contented ecstasy. The stage whirled along at a spanking gait, the breeze flapping curtains and suspended coats in the most exhilarating way. The cradle swayed and swung luxuriously. The pattering of the horse's hoofs, the cracking of the driver's whip, and his hi glang were music. The spinning ground and the waltzing trees appeared to give us a mute hurrah as we went by, and then slack up and look after us with interest, or envy, or something. And as we lay and smoked the pipe of peace, and compared all this luxury with the years of tiresome city life that had gone before it, we felt there was only one complete and satisfying happiness in the world, and we had found it. After breakfast, at some station whose name I have forgotten, we three climbed up on the seat behind the driver, and let the conductor have our bed for a nap. And by and by, when the sun made me drowsy, I lay down on my face, on top of the coach, grasping the slender iron railing, and slept for an hour or more. That will give one an appreciable idea of those matchless roads. Instinct will make a sleeping man grip a fast hold of the railing when the stage jolts, but when it only swings and sways, no grip is necessary. Overland drivers and conductors used to sit in their places and sleep thirty or forty minutes at a time on good roads, while spinning along at the rate of eight or ten miles an hour. I saw them do it often. There was no danger about it. A sleeping man will seize the irons in time when the coach jolts. These men were hard-worked, and it was not possible for them to stay awake all the time. By and by we passed through Marysville, and over the Big Blue, and Little Sandy thence about a mile, and entered Nebraska. About a mile further on we came to the Big Sandy, one hundred and eighty miles from St. Joseph. As the sun was going down, we saw the first specimen of an animal known familiarly over two thousand miles of mountain and desert, from Kansas clear to the Pacific Ocean, as the jackass rabbit. He is well named. He is just like any other rabbit except that he is from one-third to twice as large, has longer legs in proportion to his size, and has the most preposterous ears that ever were mounted on any creature but a jackass. When he is sitting quiet, thinking about his sins, or is absent-minded or unapprehensive of danger, his majestic ears project above him conspicuously, but the breaking of a twig will scare him nearly to death, and then he tilts his ears back gently and starts for home. All you can see, then, for the next minute, is his long gray form stretched out straight and streaking it through the low sagebrush, head erect, eyes right, and ears just canted a little to the rear, but showing you where the animal is all the time, the same as if he carried a jib. Now and then he makes a marvelous spring with his long legs high over the stunted sagebrush, and scores a leap that would make a horse envious. Presently he comes down to a long graceful lope and shortly he mysteriously disappears. He has crouched behind a sagebrush, and will sit there and listen and tremble until you get within six feet of him, when he will get under way again. But one must shoot at this creature once, if he wishes to see him throw his heart into his heels, and do the best he knows how. He is frightened clear through now, and he lays his long ears down on his back, straightens himself out like a yardstick every spring he makes, and scatters miles behind him, with an easy indifference that is enchanting. Our party made this specimen hump himself, as the conductor said. The secretary started him with a shot from the colt, I commenced spitting at him with my weapon, and all in the same instant the old Allen's whole broadside let go with a rattling crash, and it is not putting it too strong to say that the rabbit was frantic. He dropped his ears, set up his tail, and left for San Francisco at a speed which can only be described as a flash and a vanish. Long after he was out of sight we could hear him whiz. 
I do not remember where we first came across sagebrush, but as I have been speaking of it, I may as well describe it. This is easily done, for if the reader can imagine a gnarled and venerable live oak tree reduced to a little shrub two feet high, with its rough bark, its foliage, its twisted boughs, all complete, he can picture the sagebrush exactly. Often, on lazy afternoons in the mountains, I have lain on the ground with my face under a sagebrush, and entertained myself with fancying that the gnats among its foliage were Lilliputian birds, and that the ants marching and countermarching about its base were Lilliputian flocks and herds, and myself some vast loafer from Brobdignag waiting to catch a little citizen and eat him. It is an imposing monarch of the forest, in exquisite miniature, is the sagebrush. Its foliage is a grayish green, and gives that tint to desert and mountain. It smells like our domestic sage, and sage tea made from it tastes like the sage tea which all boys are so well acquainted with. The sagebrush is a singularly hardy plant, and grows right in the midst of deep sand and among barren rocks, where nothing else in the vegetable world would try to grow except bunch-grass. Bunch-grass grows on the bleak mountain sides of Nevada and neighboring territories, and offers excellent feed for stock, even the, in the dead of winter, wherever the snow is blown aside and exposes it. Notwithstanding its unpromising home, bunch-grass is a better and more nutritious diet for cattle and horses than almost any other hay or grass that is known so stockmen say. The sage-bushes grow from three to six or seven feet apart, all over the mountains and deserts of the far west, clear to the borders of California. There is not a tree of any kind in the deserts for hundreds of miles. There is no vegetation at all in a regular desert, except the sagebrush and its cousin the greasewood, which is so much like the sagebrush that the difference amounts to little. Campfires and hot suppers in the deserts would be impossible but for the friendly sagebrush. Its trunk is as large as a boy's wrist, and from that up to a man's arm, and its crooked branches are half as large as its trunk, all good, sound, hard wood, very like oak. When a party camps, the first thing to be done is to cut sagebrush, and in a few minutes there is an opulent pile of it ready for use, a hole a foot wide, two feet deep, and two feet long is dug, and sagebrush chopped up and burned in it till it is full to the brim with glowing coals. Then the cooking begins, and there is no smoke, and consequently no swearing. Such a fire will keep all night, with very little replenishing, and it makes a very sociable campfire, and one around which the most impossible reminiscences sound plausible, instructive, and profoundly entertaining. Sagebrush is very fair fuel, but as a vegetable it is a distinguished failure. Nothing can abide the taste of it but the jackass and his illegitimate child, the mule. But their testimony to its nutritiousness is worth nothing, for they will eat pine knots, or anthracite coal, or brass filings, or lead pipe, or old bottles, or anything that comes handy, and then go off looking as grateful as if they had oysters for dinner. Mules and donkeys and camels have appetites that anything will relieve temporarily, but nothing satisfy. In Syria once, at the headwaters of the Jordan, a camel took charge of my overcoat while the tents were being pitched, and examined it with a critical eye, all over, with as much interest as if he had an idea of getting one made like it, and then, after he'd done figuring on it as an article of apparel, he began to contemplate it as an article of diet. He put his foot on it, and lifted one of the sleeves out with his teeth, and chewed and chewed at it, and gradually taking it in, and all the while opening and closing his eyes in a kind of religious ecstasy, as if he had never tasted anything as good as an overcoat before in his life. Then he smacked his lips once or twice, and reached after the other sleeve. Next he tried the velvet collar, and smiled a smile of such contentment that it was plain to see that he regarded that as the daintiest thing about an overcoat. The tails went next, along with some percussion caps, and cough candy, and some fig paste from Constantinople. And then my newspaper correspondence dropped out, and he took a chance in that. Manuscript letters written for the home papers. But he was treading on dangerous ground now. 
he began to come across solid wisdom in those documents that was rather weighty on his stomach. And occasionally he would take a joke that would shake him up till it loosened his teeth. It was getting to be perilous times with him. But he held his grip with good courage, and hopefully till at last he began to stumble on statements that not even a camel could swallow with impunity. He began to gag and gasp, and his eyes to stand out, and his forelegs to spread, and in about a quarter of a minute he fell over as stiff as a carpenter's workbench, and died a death of indescribable agony. I went and pulled the manuscript out of his mouth and found that the sensitive creature had choked to death on one of the mildest and gentlest statements of fact that I ever laid before a trusting public. I was about to say, when diverted from my subject, that occasionally one finds sage bushes five or six feet high, and with a spread of branch and foliage in proportion, but two or two and a half feet is the usual height. End of chapter 3 Chapter Four of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain. Chapter Four. As the sun went down and the evening chill came on, we made preparation for bed. We stirred up the hard leather letter sacks and the knotty canvas bags of printed matter knotty and uneven, because of projecting ends and corners of magazines, boxes, and books. We stirred them up and redisposed them in such a way as to make our bed as level as possible. And we did improve it, too. Though, after all our work, it had an upheaved and billowy look about it, like a little piece of a stormy sea. Next we hunted up our boots, from odd nooks among the mail-bags where they had settled, and put them on. Then we got down our coats, vests, pantaloons, and heavy woolen shirts from the arm loops where they had been swinging all day, and clothed ourselves in them, for there being no ladies either at the stations or in the coach, and the weather being hot, we had looked to our comfort by stripping to our underclothing at nine o'clock in the morning. All things being now ready, we stowed the uneasy dictionary where it would lie as quiet as possible and placed the water-canteens and pistols where we could find them in the dark. Then we smoked a final pipe, and swapped a final yarn, after which we put the pipes, tobacco, and bag of coin in snug holes and caves among the mail-bags, and then fastened down the coach curtains all around, and made the place as dark as the inside of a cow, as the conductor phrased it in his picturesque way. It was certainly as dark as any place could be, nothing was even dimly visible in it, and finally we rolled ourselves up like silkworms, each person in his own blanket, and sank peacefully to sleep. Whenever the stage stopped to change horses, we would wake up and try to recollect where we were, and succeed, and in a minute or two the stage would be off again, and we likewise. We began to get into country now, threaded here and there with little streams. These had high, steep banks on each side, and every time we flew down one bank and scrambled up the other, our party inside got mixed somewhat. First we would all be down in a pile at the forward end of the stage, nearly in a sitting posture, and in a second we would shoot to the other end and stand on our heads. And we would sprawl and kick, too, and ward off ends and corners of mail-bags that came lumbering over us and about us, and, as the dust rose from the tumult, we would all sneeze in chorus, and the majority of us would grumble and probably say some hasty thing like, "'Take your elbow out of my ribs! Can't you quit crowding?' Every time we avalanched from one end of the stage to the other, the Unabridged Dictionary would come, too, and every time it came it damaged somebody. One trip it barked the secretary's elbow, the next trip it hurt me in the stomach, and the third it tilted Bemis's nose up till he could look down his nostrils, he said. The pistols and coin soon settled to the bottom, but the pipes, pipe-stems, tobacco, and canteens clattered and floundered after the dictionary every time it made an assault on us, and aided and abetted the book by spilling tobacco in our eyes and water down our backs. Still, all things considered, it was a very comfortable night. It wore gradually away, and when at last a cold gray light was visible through the puckers and chinks in the curtains, 
we yawned and stretched with satisfaction, shed our cocoons, and felt that we had slept as much as was necessary. By and by, as the sun rose up and warmed the world, we pulled off our clothes and got ready for breakfast. We were just pleasantly in time, for five minutes afterward the driver sent the weird music of his bugle winding over the grassy solitudes, and presently we detected a low hut or two in the distance. Then the rattling of the coach, the clatter of our six horses' hoofs, and the driver's crisp commands awoke to a louder and stronger emphasis, and we went sweeping down on the station at our smartest speed. It was fascinating, that old overland stage-coaching. We jumped out in undress uniform. The driver tossed his gathered reins out on the ground, gaped and stretched complacently, drew off his heavy buckskin gloves with great deliberation and insufferable dignity, taking not the slightest notice of a dozen solicitous inquiries after his health, and humbly facetious and flattering accostings, and obsequious tenders of service from five or six hairy and half-civilized station-keepers and hostlers who were nimbly unhitching our steeds and bringing the fresh team out of the stables. For in the eyes of the stage-driver of that day, station-keepers and hostlers were a sort of good-enough low creatures, useful in their place, and helping to make up a world, but not the kind of beings which a person of distinction could afford to concern himself with, while, on the contrary, in the eyes of the station-keeper and the hostler, the stage-driver was a hero, a great and shining dignitary, the world's favorite son, the envy of the people, the observed of the nations. When they spoke to him they received his insolent silence meekly, and as being the natural and proper conduct of so great a man. When he opened his lips they all hung on his words with admiration. He never honored a particular individual with a remark, but addressed it with a broad generality to the horses, the stables, the surrounding country, and the human underlings. When he discharged a facetious, insulting personality at a hostler, that hostler was happy for the day. When he uttered his one jest, old as the hills, coarse, profane, witless, and inflicted on the same audience, in the same language, every time his coach drove up there, the varlets roared and slapped their thighs, and swore it was the best thing they'd ever heard in all their lives. And how they would fly around when he wanted a basin of water, a gourd of the same, or a light for his pipe but they would instantly insult a passenger if he so far forgot himself as to crave a favor at their hands. They could do that sort of insolence as well as the driver they copied it from, for, let it be borne in mind, the overland driver had but little less contempt for his passengers than he had for his hostlers. The hostlers and the station-keepers treated the really powerful conductor of the coach merely with the best of what was their idea of civility, but the driver was the only being they bowed down to and worshipped. How admiringly they would gaze up at him in his high seat as he gloved himself with lingering deliberation, while some happy hostler held the bunch of reins aloft and waited patiently for him to take it. And how they would bombard him with glorifying ejaculations as he cracked his long whip and went careening away. The station's buildings were long, low huts made of sun-dried, mud-colored bricks, laid up without mortar. Adobes, the Spaniards call these bricks, and Americans shorten it to dobies. The roofs, which had no slant to them worth speaking of, were thatched, and then sodded or covered with a thick layer of earth, and from this sprung a pretty rank growth of weeds and grass. It was the first time we had ever seen a man's front yard on top of his house. The building consisted of barns, stable-room for twelve or fifteen horses, and a hut for an eating-room for passengers. This latter had bunks in it for the station-keeper and a hostler or two. You could rest your elbow on its eaves, and you had to bend in order to get in at the door. In place of a window there was a square hole about large enough for a man to crawl through, but this had no glass in it. There was no flooring, but the ground was packed hard. There was no stove, but the fireplace served all needful purposes. There were no shelves, no cupboards, no closets. In a corner stood an open sack of flour, and nestling against its base were a couple of black and venerable tin coffee-pots, a tin teapot, a little bag of salt, and a side of bacon. By the door of the station-keeper's den outside was a tin wash-basin on the ground. Near it was a pail of water and a piece of yellow-bar soap. 
and from the eaves hung a hoary blue woolen shirt significantly, but this latter was the station-keeper's private towel, and only two persons in all the party might venture to use it, the stage-driver and the conductor. The latter would not, from a sense of decency, the former would not, because he did not choose to encourage the advances of a station-keeper. We had towels in the valise, they might as well have been in Sodom and Gomorrah. We, and the conductor, used our handkerchiefs, and the driver his pantaloons and sleeves. By the door, inside, was fastened a small old-fashioned looking-glass frame, with two little fragments of the original mirror lodged down in one corner of it. This arrangement afforded a pleasant double-barreled portrait of you when you looked into it, with one half of your head set up a couple of inches above the other half. From the glass frame hung the half of a comb by a string. But if I had to describe that patriarch or die, I believe I would order some sample coffins. It had come down from Esau and Samson, and had been accumulating hair ever since, along with certain impurities. In one corner of the room stood three or four rifles and muskets, together with horns and pouches of ammunition. The station men wore pantaloons of coarse, country-woven stuff, and into the seat and the inside of the legs were sewed ample additions of buckskin, to do duty in place of leggings when the man rode horseback. So the pants were half dull blue and half yellow, and unspeakably picturesque. The pants were stuffed into the tops of high boots the heels whereof were armed with great Spanish spurs, whose little iron clogs and chains jingled with every step. The man wore a huge beard and mustachios, an old slouch hat, a blue woolen shirt, no suspenders, no vest, no coat. In a leathern sheath in his belt, a great long navy revolver slung on right side hammer to the front, and projecting from his boot a horn-handled bowie-knife. The furniture of the hut was neither gorgeous nor much in the way. The rocking-chairs and sofas were not present, never had been, but they were represented by two three-legged stools, a pine-board bench four feet long, and two empty candle-boxes. The table was a greasy board on stilts, and the tablecloth and napkins had not come, and they were not looking for them, either. A battered tin platter, a knife and fork, and a tin pint cup were at each man's place, and the driver had a queen's ware saucer that had seen better days. Of course, this duke sat at the head of the table. There was one isolated piece of table furniture that bore about it a touching air of grandeur in misfortune. This was the caster. It was German silver, and crippled and rusty, but it was so preposterously out of place there that it was suggestive of a tattered exiled king among barbarians and the majesty of its native position compelled respect even in its degradation. There was only one cruet left, and that was a stopperless fly-specked broken-necked thing, with two inches of vinegar in it, and a dozen preserved flies with their heels up, and looking sorry they had invested there. The station-keeper upended a disk of last week's bread, of the shape and size of an old-time cheese, and carved some slabs from it, which were as good as Nicholson's pavement, and tenderer. He sliced off a piece of bacon for each man, but only the experienced old hands made out to eat it, for it was condemned army bacon which the United States would not feed to its soldiers in the forts, and the stage company had bought it cheap for the sustenance of their passengers and employees. We may have found this condemned army bacon further out on the plains than the section I am locating it in, but we found it. There is no gain saying that. Then he poured for us a beverage which he called Slumgullion, and it is hard to think he was not inspired when he named it. It really pretended to be tea, but there was too much dish-rag and sand and old bacon-rind in it to deceive the intelligent traveller. He had no sugar and no milk, not even a spoon to stir the ingredients with. We could not eat the bread or the meat, nor drink the slumgullion. And when I looked at that melancholy vinegar cruet, I thought of the anecdote, a very, very old one even at that day, of the traveller who sat down to a table which had nothing on it but a mackerel and a pot of mustard. He asked the landlord if this was all, and the landlord said, "'All?' Why, thunder and lightning, I should think there was a mackerel enough there for six. 
But I don't like mackerel. Oh, well, then help yourself to the mustard. In other days I had considered it a good, a very good anecdote, but there was a dismal plausibility about it here that took all the humor out of it. Our breakfast was before us, but our teeth were idle. I tasted and smelt, and said I would take coffee, I believed. The station boss stopped dead still, and glared at me speechless. At last, when he came to, he turned away and said, as one who communes with himself upon a matter too vast to grasp, "'Coffee! Well, if that don't go clean ahead of me, I'm ding We could not eat, and there was no conversation among the hostlers and herdsmen. We all sat at the same board. At least there was no conversation further than a single hurried request, now and then, from one employee to another. It was always in the same form, and always gruffly friendly. Its western freshness and novelty startled me at first, and interested me, but it presently grew monotonous, and lost its charm. It was, "'Pass the bread, you son of a skunk!' No, I forget. Skunk was not the word. It, it seems to me it was still stronger than that. I, I know it was, in fact. But it is gone from my memory, apparently. However, it is no matter. Probably it was too strong for print, anyway. It is the landmark in my memory which tells me where I first encountered the vigorous new vernacular of the Occidental Plains and Mountains. We gave up the breakfast, and paid our dollar apiece, and went back to our mail-bag bed in the coach and found comfort in our pipes. Right here we suffered the first diminution of our princely state. We left our six fine horses and took six mules in their place. But they were wild Mexican fellows, and a man had to stand at the head of each of them and hold him fast while the driver gloved and got himself ready. And when at last he grasped the reins and gave the word, the men sprung suddenly away from the mules' heads, and the coach shot from the station as if it had issued from a cannon. How the frantic animals did scamper! It was a fierce and furious gallop, and the gait never altered for a moment till we reeled off ten or twelve miles, and swept up to the next collection of little station huts and stables. So we flew along all day. At two p.m. the belt of timber that fringes the North Platte, and marks its windings through the vast level floor of the plains, came in sight. At four p.m. we crossed a branch of the river and at five p.m. we crossed the Platte itself, and landed at Fort Kearney, fifty-six hours out from St. Joe, three hundred miles. Now that was stage-coaching on the great overland, ten or twelve years ago, when perhaps not more than ten men in America, all told, expected to live to see a railroad follow that route to the Pacific. But the railroad is there now, and it pictures a thousand odd comparisons and contrasts in my mind, to read the following sketch in the New York Times of a recent trip over almost the very ground I have been describing. I can scarcely comprehend the new state of things. Across the continent. At 4.20 p.m. Sunday we rolled out of the station at Omaha and started westward on our long jaunt. A couple of hours out dinner was announced, an event to those of us who had yet to experience what it is to eat in one of Pullman's hotels on wheels. So, stepping into the car next forward of our sleeping palace, we found ourselves in the dining car. It was a revelation to us, that first dinner on Sunday and though we continued to dine for four days, and had as many breakfasts and suppers, our whole party never ceased to admire the perfection of the arrangements, and the marvellous results achieved. Upon tables covered with snowy linen, and garnished with services of solid silver, Ethiop waiters, flitting about in spotless white, placed as by magic a repast at which Delmonico himself could have had no occasion to blush and indeed in some respects it would be hard for that distinguished chef to match our menu. For in addition to all that ordinarily makes up a first chop dinner, had we not our antelope steak? The gourmand who has not experienced this, bah, what does he know of the feast of fat things? Our delicious mountain brook trout, and choice fruits and berries, and, sauce piquant and unpurchasable, our sweet-scented, appetite-compelling air of the prairies? You may depend upon it. We all did justice to the good things, and as we washed them down with bumpers of sparkling Krug, 
whilst we sped along at the rate of thirty miles an hour, agreed it was the fastest living we had ever experienced. We beat that, however, two days afterward, when we made twenty-seven miles in twenty-seven minutes, while our champagne glasses filled to the brim spilled not a drop. After dinner we repaired to our drawing-room car, and, as it was Sabbath Eve, intoned some of the grand old hymns, Praise God from Above, etc., Shining Shore, Coronation, etc., the voices of the men-singers and of the women-singers blending sweetly in the evening air, while our train, with its great glaring polyphemous eye, lighting up long vistas of prairie, rushed into the night and the wild. Then to bed in luxurious coaches, where we slept the sleep of the just, and only awoke the next morning, Monday, at eight o'clock, to find ourselves at the crossing of the North Platte, three hundred miles from Omaha, fifteen hours and forty minutes out. End of chapter four. Chapter five of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain. Chapter five. Another night of alternate tranquillity and turmoil. But morning came, by and by. It was another glad awakening to fresh breezes, vast expanses of level green sward, bright sunlight, an impressive solitude utterly without visible human beings or human habitations, and an atmosphere of such amazing magnifying properties that trees that seemed close at hand were more than three miles away. We resumed undress uniform, climbed atop of the flying coach, dangled our legs over the side, shouted occasionally at our frantic mules, merely to see them lay their ears back and scamper faster, tied our hats on to keep our hair from blowing away, and leveled an outlook over the world-wide carpet about us for things new and strange to gaze at. Even at this day it thrills me, through and through, to think of the life, the gladness, and the wild sense of freedom that used to make the blood dance in my veins on those fine overland mornings. Along about an hour after breakfast we saw the first prairie-dog villages, the first antelope, and the first wolf. If I remember rightly, this latter was the regular coyote, pronounced coyote, of the uh, farther deserts. And if it was, he was not a pretty creature or respectable either, for I got well acquainted with his race afterward, and can speak with confidence. The coyote is a long, slim stick and sorry-looking skeleton, with a gray wolf-skin stretched over it, a tolerably bushy tail that forever sags down with a despairing expression of forsakenness and misery, a furtive and evil eye, and a long, sharp face, with slightly lifted lip and exposed teeth. He has a general slinking expression all over. The coyote is a living, breathing allegory of want. He is always hungry. He is always poor, out of luck, and friendless. The meanest creatures despise him, and even the fleas would desert him for a velocipede. He is so spiritless and cowardly that even while his exposed teeth are pretending a threat, the rest of his face is apologizing for it. And he is so homely, so scrawny and ribby and coarse-haired and pitiful. When he sees you, he lifts his lip and lets a flash of his teeth out, and then turns a little out of the course he was pursuing, depresses his head a bit, and strikes a long, soft-footed trot through the sagebrush, glancing over his shoulder at you from time to time, till he is about out of easy pistol range, and then he stops and takes a deliberate survey of you. He will trot fifty yards and stop again, another fifty and stop again, and finally the gray of his gliding body blends with the gray of the sagebrush, and he disappears. All this is when you make no demonstration against him, but if you do, he develops a livelier interest in his journey, and instantly electrifies his heels, and puts such a deal of real estate between himself and your weapon, that by the time you have raised the hammer, you see that you need a mini-rifle, and by the time you have got him in line, you need a rifled cannon, and by the time you have drawn a bead on him, you see well enough that 
nothing but an unusually long-winded streak of lightning could reach him where he is now. But if you start a swift-footed dog after him, you will enjoy it ever so much, especially if it is a dog that has a good opinion of himself, and has been brought up to think he knows something about speed. The coyote will go swinging gently off on that deceitful trot of his, and every little while he will smile a fraudful smile over his shoulder that will fill that dog entirely full of encouragement and worldly ambition, and make him lay his head still lower to the ground, and stretch his neck further to the front, and pant more fiercely, and stick his tail out straighter behind, and move his furious legs with a yet wilder frenzy, and leave a broader and broader and higher and denser cloud of desert sand smoking behind and marking his long wake across the level plain. And all this time the dog is only a short twenty feet behind the coyote, and to save the soul of him he cannot understand why it is that he cannot get perceptibly closer, and he begins to get aggravated, and it makes him madder and madder to see how gently the coyote glides along, and never pants or sweats or ceases to smile and he grows still more and more incensed to see how shamefully he has been taken in by an entire stranger, and what an ignoble swindle that long, calm, soft-footed trot is, and next he notices that he is getting fagged, and that the coyote actually has to slacken speed a little to keep from running away from him, and then that town dog is mad in earnest, and he begins to strain, and weep, and swear and paw the sand higher than ever, and reach for the coyote with concentrated and desperate energy. This spurt finds him six feet behind the gliding enemy, and two miles from his friends. And then, in the instant that a wild new hope is lighting up his face, the coyote turns and smiles blandly upon him once more, and with a something about it which seems to say, "'Well, I shall have to tear myself away from you, bub. Business is business.' and it will not do for me to be fooling along this way all day." And forthwith there is a rushing sound, and the sudden splitting of a long crack through the atmosphere, and behold, that dog is solitary and alone, in the midst of a vast solitude. It makes his head swim. He stops and looks all around, climbs the nearest sand-mound, and gazes into the distance, shakes his head reflectively, and then, without a word, he turns and jogs along back to his train, and takes up a humble position under the hindmost wagon, and feels unspeakably mean, and looks ashamed, and hangs his tail at half-mast for a week. And for as much as a year after that, whenever there is a great hue and cry after a coyote, that dog will merely glance in that direction without emotion, and apparently observe to himself, "'I believe I do not wish any of the pie.' The coyote lives chiefly in the most desolate and forbidding desert, along with the lizard, the jackass rabbit, and the raven, and gets an uncertain and precarious living, and earns it. He seems to subsist almost wholly on the carcasses of oxen, mules, and horses that have dropped out of emigrant trains, and died, and upon windfalls of carrion, and occasional legacies of offal bequeathed to him by white men who have been opulent enough to have something better to butcher than condemned army bacon. He will eat anything in the world that his first cousins, the desert-frequenting tribes of Indians, will, and they will eat anything they can bite. It is a curious fact that these latter are the only creatures known to history who will eat nitroglycerin and ask for more if they survive. The coyote of the deserts beyond the Rocky Mountains has a peculiarly hard time of it, owing to the fact that his relations, the Indians, are just as apt to be the first to detect a seductive scent on the desert breeze, and follow the fragrance to the late ox it emanated from, as he is himself. And when this occurs, he has to content himself with sitting off at a little distance, watching those people strip off and dig out everything edible, and walk off with it. Then he and the waiting ravens explore the skeleton, and polish the bones. It is considered that the coyote, and the obscene bird, and the Indian of the desert, testify their blood kinship with each other, in that they live together in the waste places of the earth on terms of perfect confidence and friendship, while hating all other creature, and yearning to assist at their funerals. He does not mind going a hundred miles to breakfast, and a hundred and fifty to dinner, 
because he is sure to have three or four days between meals, and he can just as well be traveling and looking at the scenery as lying around doing nothing and adding to the burdens of his parents. We soon learned to recognize the sharp, vicious bark of the coyote as it came across the murky plain at night to disturb our dreams among the mail sacks, and remembering his forlorn aspect and his hard fortune, made shift to wish him the blessed novelty of a long day's good luck and a limitless larder the morrow. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of Roughing It this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain Chapter 6 Our new conductor just shipped had been without sleep for twenty hours. Such a thing was very frequent. From St. Joseph, Missouri, to Sacramento, California, by stagecoach, was nearly nineteen hundred miles and the trip was often made in fifteen days. The cars do it in four and a half now. But the time specified in the mail contracts, and required by the schedule, was eighteen or nineteen days, if I remember rightly. This was to make fair allowance for winter storms and snows, and other unavoidable causes of detention. The stage company had everything under strict discipline and good system. Over each two hundred and fifty miles of road they placed an agent, or superintendent, and invested him with great authority. His beat, or jurisdiction, of two hundred and fifty miles was called a division. He purchased horses, mules, harness, and food for men and beasts, and distributed these things among his stage stations, from time to time, according to his judgment of what each station needed. He erected station buildings, and dug wells. He attended to the paying of the station keepers, hostlers, drivers, and blacksmiths, and discharged them whenever he chose. He was a very, very great man in his division, a kind of grand mogul, a sultan of the Indies, in whose presence common men were modest of speech and manner, and in the glare of whose greatness even the dazzling stage-driver dwindled to a penny-dip. There were about eight of these kings, all told, on the overland route. Next in rank and importance to the division agent came the conductor. His beat was the same length as the agent's, two hundred and fifty miles. He sat with the driver, and, when necessary, rode that fearful distance night and day, without other rest or sleep than what he could get perched thus on top of the flying vehicle. Think of it! He had absolute charge of the mails, express matter, passengers and stage-coach, until he delivered them to the next conductor, and got his receipt for them. Consequently he had to be a man of intelligence, decision, and considerable executive ability. He was usually a quiet, pleasant man, who attended closely to his duties, and was a good deal of a gentleman. It was not absolutely necessary that the division agent should be a gentleman, and occasionally he wasn't. But he was always a general in administrative ability, and a bulldog in courage and determination, otherwise the chieftainship over the lawless underlings of the overland service would never in any instance have been to him anything but an equivalent for a month of insolence and distress, and a bullet in a coffin at the end of it. There were about sixteen or eighteen conductors on the overland, for there was a daily stage each way, and a conductor on every stage. Next, in real and official rank and importance after the conductor, came my delight, the driver. Next, in real, but not in apparent importance. For we have seen that in the eyes of the common herd the driver was to the conductor as an admiral is to the captain of the flagship. The driver's beat was pretty long, and his sleeping time at the stations pretty short sometimes. And so, but for the grandeur of his position, his would have been a sorry life as well as a hard and wearing one. We took a new driver every day or every night, for they drove backward and forward over the same piece of road all the time, and therefore we never got as well acquainted with them as we did with the conductors. And besides, they would have been above being familiar with such rubbish as passengers, anyhow, as a general thing. Still, we were always eager to get a sight of each and every new driver as soon as the watch changed, for each and every day we were either anxious to get rid of an unpleasant one, 
or loath to part with a driver we had learned to like and had come to be sociable and friendly with. And so the first question we asked the conductor, whenever we got to where we were to exchange drivers, was always, which is him? The grammar was faulty, maybe, but we could not know then that it would go into a book some day. As long as everything went smoothly, the overland driver was well enough situated, but if a fellow driver got sick suddenly, it made trouble, for the coach must go on, and so the potentate who was about to climb down and take a luxurious rest after his long night's siege in the midst of wind and rain and darkness had to stay where he was and do the sick man's work. Once in the Rocky Mountains, when I found a driver sound asleep on the box and the mules going at the usual breakneck pace, the conductor said never mind him, there was no danger, and he was doing double duty, had driven seventy-five miles on one coach, and was now going back over it on this without rest or sleep, a hundred and fifty miles of holding back of six vindictive mules and keeping them from climbing the trees. It sounds incredible, but I remember the statement well enough. The station-keepers, hostlers, etc., were low, rough characters, as already described, and from western Nebraska to Nevada a considerable sprinkling of them might be fairly set down as outlaws, fugitives from justice, criminals whose best security was a section of country which was without law and without even the pretense of it. When the division agent issued an order to one of these parties, he did it with the full understanding that he might have to enforce it with a Navy six-shooter, and so he always went fixed to make things go along smoothly. Now and then a division agent was really obliged to shoot a hostler through the head to teach him some simple matter that he could have taught him with a club if his circumstances and surroundings had been different. But they were snappy, able men, those division agents, and when they tried to teach a subordinate anything, that subordinate generally got it through his head. A great portion of this vast machinery, these hundreds of men and coaches and thousands of mules and horses, was in the hands of Mr. Ben Holliday. All the western half of the business was in his hands. This reminds me of an incident of Palestine travel which is pertinent here, so I will transfer it just in the language in which I find it set down in my Holy Land notebook. No doubt everybody has heard of Ben Holliday, a man of prodigious energy, who used to send mails and passengers flying across the continent in his overland stage-coaches like a very whirlwind, two thousand long miles in fifteen days and a half, by the watch. But this fragment of history is not about Ben Holliday, but about a young New York boy by the name of Jack, who travelled with our small party of pilgrims in the Holy Land, and who had travelled to California in Mr. Holliday's overland coaches three years before, and had by no means forgotten it or lost his gushing admiration of Mr. H. Aged nineteen, Jack was a good boy, a good-hearted and always well-meaning boy, who had been reared in the city of New York, and although he was bright and knew a great many useful things, his scriptural education had been a good deal neglected to such a degree, indeed, that all Holy Land history was fresh and new to him, and all Bible names mysteries that had never disturbed his virgin ear. Also in our party was an elderly pilgrim who was the reverse of Jack, in that he was learned in the scriptures, and an enthusiast concerning them. He was our encyclopedia, and we were never tired of listening to his speeches, nor he of making them. He never passed a celebrated locality, from Bashan to Bethlehem, without illuminating it with an oration. One day, when camped near the ruins of Jericho, he burst forth with something like this. Jack, do you see that range of mountains over yonder that bounds the Jordan Valley? The mountains of Moab, Jack. Think of it, my boy. The actual mountains of Moab, renowned in scripture history. We are actually standing face to face with those illustrious crags and peaks, and for all we know, dropping his voice impressively, our eyes may be resting at this very moment upon the spot where lies the mysterious grave of Moses. Think of it, Jack. Moses who? Falling inflection. Moses who? Jack, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You ought to be ashamed of such criminal ignorance. Why, Moses, the great guide, soldier, poet, lawgiver of ancient Israel. Jack, from this spot where we stand, to Egypt, stretches a fearful desert three hundred miles in extent, 
and across that desert that wonderful man brought the children of Israel, guiding them with unfailing sagacity for forty years, over the sandy desolation and among the obstructing rocks and hills, and landed them at last, safe and sound, within sight of this very spot. And where we now stand they entered the promised land with anthems of rejoicing. It was a wonderful, wonderful thing to do, Jack. Think of it. Forty years? Only three hundred miles? Humph! Ben Holliday would have fetched them through in thirty-six hours." The boy meant no harm. He did not know that he had said anything that was wrong or irreverent, and so no one scolded him or felt offended with him, and nobody could but some ungenerous spirit, incapable of excusing the heedless blunders of a boy. At noon on the fifth day out, we arrived at the crossing of the South Platte, alias Julesburg, alias Overland City, four hundred and seventy miles from St. Joseph, the strangest, quaintest, funniest frontier town that our untraveled eyes had ever stared at and been astonished with. End of chapter six. Chapter seven of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain. Chapter seven. It did seem strange enough to see a town again after what appeared to us such a long acquaintance with deep, still, almost lifeless and houseless solitude. We tumbled out into the busy street feeling like meteoric people, crumbled off the corner of some other world, and wakened up suddenly in this. For an hour we took as much interest in Overland City as if we had never seen a town before. The reason we had an hour to spare was because we had to change our stage for a less sumptuous affair called a mud-wagon, and transfer our freight of mails. Presently we got under way again. We came to the shallow, yellow, muddy South Platte, with its low banks and its scattering flat sandbars and pygmy islands a melancholy stream straggling through the center of the enormous flat plain, and only saved from being impossible to find with the naked eye by its sentinel rank of scattering trees standing on either bank. The plat was up, they said, which made me wish I could see it when it was down, if it could look any sicker and sorrier. They said it was a dangerous stream to cross now, because its quicksands were liable to swallow up horses, coach, and passengers if an attempt was made to ford it. But the mails had to go, and we made the attempt. Once or twice, in midstream, the wheels sunk into the yielding sand so threateningly that we half believed we had dreaded and avoided the sea all our lives to be shipwrecked in a mud-wagon in the middle of a desert at last. But we dragged through and sped away toward the setting sun. Next morning, just before dawn, when about five hundred and fifty miles from St. Joseph, our mud-wagon broke down. We were to be delayed five or six hours, and therefore we took horses, by invitation, and joined a party who were just starting on a buffalo hunt. It was noble sport galloping over the plain in the dewy freshness of the morning, but our part of the hunt ended in disaster and disgrace, for a wounded buffalo bull chased the passenger Bemis nearly two miles and then he forsook his horse and took to a lone tree. He was very sullen about the matter for some twenty-four hours, but at last he began to soften little by little, and finally he said, "'Well, it was not funny, and there was no sense in those gawks making themselves so facetious over it. I tell you, I was angry in earnest for a while. I should have shot that long, gangly lubber they called Hank, if I could have done it without crippling six or seven other people.' but of course I couldn't. The old Allens, so confounded comprehensive. I wish those loafers had been up in the tree. They wouldn't have wanted to laugh so. If I had had a horse worth a cent, but no, the minute he saw that buffalo bull wheel on him and give a bellow, he raised straight up in the air and stood on his heels. The saddle began to slip, and I took him round the neck and laid close to him and began to pray. Then he came down and stood up on the other end a while and the bull actually stopped pawing sand and bellowing to contemplate the inhuman spectacle. Then the bull made a pass at him, and uttered a bellow that sounded perfectly frightful, it was so close to me, 
and that seemed to literally prostrate my horse's reason, and make a raving distracted maniac of him, and I wish I may die if he didn't stand on his head for a quarter of a minute and shed tears. He was absolutely out of his mind. He was as sure as truth itself, and he really didn't know what he was doing. Then the bull came charging at us, and my horse dropped down on all fours and took a fresh start, and then for the next ten minutes he would actually throw one handspring after another so fast that the bull began to get unsettled, too, and didn't know where to start in. And so he stood there sneezing and shoveling dust over his back, and bellowing every now and then, and thinking he had got a fifteen-hundred-dollar circus horse for breakfast, certain. Well, I was first out on his neck the horses, not the bulls, and then underneath, and next on his rump, and sometimes head up, and sometimes heels. But I tell you, it seemed solemn and awful to be ripping and tearing and carrying on so in the presence of death, as you might say. Pretty soon the bull made a snatch for us and brought away some of my horse's tail, I suppose, but do not know, being pretty busy at the time. But something made him hungry for solitude, and suggested to him to get up and hunt for it. And then you ought to have seen that spider-legged old skeleton go. And you ought to have seen the bull cut out after him, too, head down, tongue out, tail up, bellowing like everything, and actually mowing down the weeds and tearing up the earth and boosting up the sand like a whirlwind. By George, it was a hot race. I and the saddle were back on the rump, and I had the bridle in my teeth and holding on to the pummel with both hands. First we left the dogs behind. Then we passed a jackass rabbit, then we overtook a coyote, and were gaining on an antelope when the rotten girth let go and threw me about thirty yards off to the left, and as the saddle went down over the horse's rump, he gave it a lift with his heels that sent it more than four hundred yards up in the air. I wish I may die in a minute if he didn't. I fell at the foot of the only solitary tree there was in nine counties adjacent, as any creature could see with a naked eye and the next second I had hold of the bark with four sets of nails and my teeth, and the next second after that I was astraddle of the main limb, and blaspheming my luck in a way that made my breath smell of brimstone. I had the bull now, if he did not think of one thing. But that one thing I dreaded. I dreaded it very seriously. There was a possibility that the bull might not think of it, but there were greater chances that he would. I made up my mind what I would do in case he did. It was a little over forty feet to the ground from where I sat. I cautiously unwound the lariat from the pommel of my saddle. Your saddle? Did you take your saddle up in the tree with you? Take it up in the tree with me? Why, how you talk! Of course I didn't. No man could do that. It fell in the tree when it came down. Oh, exactly. Certainly. I unwound the lariat and fastened one end of it to the limb. It was the very best green rawhide, and capable of sustaining tons. I made a slip-noose in the other end, and then hung it down to see the length. It reached down twenty-two feet, halfway to the ground. I then loaded every barrel of the allen with a double charge. I felt satisfied. I said to myself, if he never thinks of that one thing that I dread, all right. But if he does, all right anyhow. I am fixed for him. But don't you know that the very thing a man dreads is the thing that always happens? Indeed it is so. I watch the bull now with anxiety, anxiety which no one can conceive of who has not been in such a situation and felt that any moment death might come. Presently a thought came into the bull's eye. I knew it, said I. If my nerve fails now, I am lost. Sure enough, it was just as I had dreaded he started in to climb the tree. What, the bull? Of course, who else? But a bull can't climb a tree. He can't, can't he? Since you know so much about it, did you ever see a bull try? No, I never dreamed of such a thing. Well, then, what is the use of your talking that way, then? Because you never saw a thing done, is that any reason why it can't be done? Well, all right, go on. What did he do? The bull started up and got along well for about ten feet, then slipped and slid back. I breathed easier. He tried it again, got up a little higher, slipped again, but he came at it once more, and this time he was careful. He got gradually higher and higher, and my spirit went down more and more. Up he came, an inch at a time, with his eyes hot and his tongue hanging out, higher and higher. 
hitched his foot over the stump of a limb, and looked up, as much as to say, "'You are my meat, friend!' Up again, higher and higher, and getting more excited the closer he got. He was within ten feet of me. I took a long breath, and then I said, "'It is now or never.' I had the coil of the lariat all ready. I paid it out slowly, till it hung right over his head. All of a sudden I let go of the slack, and the slip-noose fell fairly round his neck. Quicker than lightning I out with the allen, and let him have it in the face. It was an awful roar, and must have scared the bull out of his senses. When the smoke cleared away, there he was, dangling in the air, twenty foot from the ground, and going out of one convulsion into another faster than you could count. I didn't stop to count, anyhow. I shinned down the tree and shot for home. Bemis, is all that true, just as you have stated it? I wish I may rot in my tracks and die the death of a dog, if it isn't. Well, we can't refuse to believe it, and we don't. But if there were some proofs— Proofs? Did I bring back my lariat? No. Did I bring back my horse? No. Did you ever see the bull again? No. Well, then, what more do you want? I never saw anybody as particular as you are about a little thing like that. I made up my mind that if this man was not a liar, he only missed it by the skin of his teeth. This episode reminds me of an incident of my brief sojourn in Siam years afterward. The European citizens of a town in the neighborhood of Bangkok had a prodigy among them by the name of Eckert, an Englishman a person famous for the number, ingenuity, and imposing magnitude of his lies. They were always repeating his most celebrated falsehoods, and always trying to draw him out before strangers, but they seldom succeeded. Twice he was invited to the house where I was visiting, but nothing could seduce him into a specimen lie. One day a planter named Bascom, an influential man, and a proud and sometimes irascible one, invited me to ride over with him and call on Eckert. As we jogged along, said he, "'Now, do you know where the fault lies? It lies in putting Eckert on his guard. The minute the boys go to pumping at Eckert, he knows perfectly well what they are after, and, of course, he shuts up his shell. Anybody might know he would. But when we get there, we must play him finer than that. Let him shape the conversation to suit himself. Let him drop it or change it whenever he wants to.' Let him see that nobody is trying to draw him out. Just let him have his own way. He will soon forget himself and begin to grind out lies like a mill. Don't get impatient. Just keep quiet, and let me play him. I will make him lie. It does seem to me that the boys must be blind to overlook such an obvious and simple trick as that. Eckert received us heartily, a pleasant-spoken, gentle-mannered creature. We sat in the veranda an hour, sipping English ale, and talking about the king, and the sacred white elephant, the sleeping idol, and all manner of things, and I noticed that my comrade never led the conversation himself or shaped it, but simply followed Eckert's lead, and betrayed no solicitude and no anxiety about anything. The effect was shortly perceptible. Eckert began to grow communicative. He grew more and more at his ease, and more and more talkative and sociable. Another hour passed in the same way, and then all of a sudden Eckert said, "'Oh, by the way, I came near forgetting. I have got a thing here to astonish you, such a thing as neither you nor any other man ever heard of. I've got a cat that will eat coconut, common green coconut, and not only eat the meat, but drink the milk. It is so. I'll swear to it." A quick glance from Bascom, a glance that I understood, then, "'Why, bless my soul, I never heard of such a thing. Man, it is impossible. I knew you would say it. I'll fetch the cat.' He went in the house. Bascom said, "'There, what did I tell you? Now that is the way to handle Eckert. You see, I have petted him along patiently, and put his suspicions to sleep. I am glad we came. You tell the boys about it when you go back. Cat eat a coconut. Oh, my! Now, that is just his way exactly. He will tell the absurdest lie, and trust to luck to get out of it again. Cat eat a coconut! The innocent fool!" Eckert approached with his cat, sure enough. Bascom smiled. Said he, "'I'll hold the cat. You bring a coconut.' 
Eckert split one open and chopped up some pieces. Bascom smuggled a wink to me and proffered a slice of the fruit to Puss. She snatched it, swallowed it ravenously, and asked for more. We rode our two miles in silence and wide apart. At least I was silent, though Bascom cuffed his horse and cursed him a good deal, notwithstanding the horse was behaving well enough. When I branched off homeward, Bascom said, "'Keep the horse till morning, and uh, you need not speak of this foolishness to the boys.'" End of chapter 7 This is chapter 8 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain Chapter 8 in a little while all interest was taken up in stretching our necks and watching for the Pony Rider, the fleet messenger who sped across the continent from St. Joe to Sacramento, carrying letters nineteen hundred miles in eight days. Think of that for perishable horse and human flesh and blood to do. The Pony Rider was usually a little bit of a man, brimful of spirit and endurance. No matter what time of the day or night his watch came on, and no matter whether it was winter or summer, raining, snowing, hailing, or sleeting, or whether his beat was a level straight road or a crazy trail over mountain crags and precipices, or whether it led through peaceful regions, or regions that swarmed with hostile Indians, he must be always ready to leap into the saddle and be off like the wind. There was no idling time for a pony rider on duty. He rode fifty miles without stopping, by daylight, moonlight, starlight, or through the blackness of darkness, just as it happened. He rode a splendid horse that was born for a racer, and fed and lodged like a gentleman, kept him at his utmost speed for ten miles, and then, as he came crashing up to the station where stood two men holding fast a fresh, impatient steed, the transfer of rider and mail-bag was made in the twinkling of an eye, and away flew the eager pair and were out of sight before the spectator could get hardly the ghost of a look. Both rider and horse went flying light. The rider's dress was thin, and fitted close. He wore a roundabout and a skull-cap, and tucked his pantaloons into his boot-tops like a race-rider. He carried no arms, he carried nothing that was not absolutely necessary, for even the postage on his literary freight was worth five dollars a letter. He got but little frivolous correspondence to carry. His bag had business letters in it, mostly. His horse was stripped of all unnecessary weight, too. He wore a little wafer of a racing saddle, and no visible blanket. He wore light shoes, or none at all. The little flat mail-pockets, strapped under the rider's thighs, would each hold about the bulk of a child's primer. They held many, and many an important business chapter and newspaper letter, but these were written on paper as airy and thin as gold leaf nearly, and thus bulk and weight were economized. The stagecoach traveled about a hundred to a hundred and twenty-five miles a day, twenty-four hours, the pony rider about two hundred and fifty. There were about eighty pony riders in the saddle all the time, night and day, stretching in a long, scattering procession from Missouri to California, forty flying eastward and forty toward the west and among them making four hundred gallant horses earn a stirring livelihood and see a deal of scenery every single day in the year. We had had a consuming desire from the beginning to see a pony rider, but somehow or other all that had passed us and all that met us managed to streak by in the night, and so we heard only a whiz and a hail, and the swift phantom of the desert was gone before we could get our heads out of the windows. But now we were expecting one along every moment, and would see him in broad daylight. Presently the driver exclaims, "'Here he comes!' Every neck is stretched further, and every eye strained wider. Away across the endless dead level of the prairie a black speck appears against the sky, and it is plain that it moves. Well, I should think so. In a second or two it comes a horse and a rider, rising and falling, rising and falling sweeping toward us nearer and nearer, growing more and more distinct, more and more sharply defined, nearer and still nearer, and the flutter of the hoofs comes faintly to the ear. Another instant, a whoop and a hurrah from our upper deck, a wave of the rider's hand, but no reply, and a man and horse burst past our excited faces, 
and go winging away like a belated fragment of a storm. So sudden is it all, and so like a flash of unreal fancy, that but for the flake of white foam left quivering and perishing on a mail-sack after the vision had flashed by and disappeared, we might have doubted whether we had seen any actual horse and man at all, maybe. We rattled through Scott's Bluffs Pass, by and by. It was along here somewhere that we first came across genuine and unmistakable alkali water in the road, and we cordially hailed it as a first-class curiosity, and a thing to be mentioned with eclat in letters to the ignorant at home. This water gave the road a soapy appearance, and in many places the ground looked as if it had been whitewashed. I think the strange alkali water excited us as much as any wonder we had come upon yet, and I know we felt very complacent and conceited, and better satisfied with life after we had added it to our list of things which we had seen and some other people had not. In a small way we were the same sort of simpletons as those who climb unnecessarily the perilous peaks of Mont Blanc and the Matterhorn, and derive no pleasure from it except the reflection that it isn't a common experience. But once in a while one of those parties trips and comes darting down the long mountain crags in a sitting posture, making the crusted snow smoke behind him, flitting from bench to bench, and from terrace to terrace, jarring the earth where he strikes, and still glancing and flitting on again, sticking an iceberg into himself every now and then, and tearing his clothes, snatching at things to save himself, taking hold of trees and fetching them along with him, roots and all, starting little rocks now and then, then big boulders, then acres of ice and snow and patches of forest, gathering and still gathering as he goes, adding and still adding to his massed and sweeping grandeur as he nears the three-thousand-foot precipice, till at last he waves his hat magnificently and rides into eternity on the back of a raging and tossing avalanche. This is all very fine, but let us not be carried away by excitement, but ask calmly, how does this person feel about it in his cooler moments next day, with six or seven thousand feet of snow and stuff on top of him? We crossed the sand hills near the scene of the Indian mail robbery and massacre of 1856, wherein the driver and conductor perished, and also all the passengers but one, it was supposed. But this must have been a mistake, for at different times afterward, on the Pacific coast, I was personally acquainted with a hundred and thirty-three or four people who were wounded during that massacre, and barely escaped with their lives. There was no doubt of the truth of it. I had it from their own lips. One of these parties told me that he kept coming across arrowheads in his system for nearly seven years after the massacre, and another of them told me that he was struck so literally full of arrows that after the Indians were gone, and he could raise up and examine himself, he could not restrain his tears, for his clothes were completely ruined. The most trustworthy tradition avers, however, that only one man, a person named Babbitt, survived the massacre, and he was desperately wounded. He dragged himself on his hands and knee, for one leg was broken, to a station several miles away. He did it during portions of two nights, lying concealed one day and part of another, and for more than forty hours suffering unimaginable anguish from hunger, thirst, and bodily pain. The Indians robbed the coach of everything it contained, including quite an amount of treasure. End of chapter 8 this is chapter 9 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain. Chapter 9 We passed Fort Laramie in the night, and on the seventh morning out we found ourselves in the Black Hills, with Laramie Peak at our elbow, apparently, looming vast and solitary, a deep dark, rich indigo-blue in hue, so portentously did the old colossus frown under his beetling brows of storm-cloud. He was thirty or forty miles away, in reality, but he only seemed removed a little beyond the low ridge at our right. We breakfast at Horseshoe Station, six hundred and seventy-six miles out from St. Joseph. We had now reached a hostile Indian country, and during the afternoon we passed Laparel Station, 
and enjoyed great discomfort all the time we were in the neighborhood, being aware that many of the trees we dashed by at arm's length concealed a lurking Indian or two. During the preceding night an ambushed savage had sent a bullet through the pony rider's jacket, but he had ridden on just the same, because pony riders were not allowed to stop and inquire into such things except when killed. As long as they had life enough left in them, they had to stick to the horse and ride, even if the Indians had been waiting for them a week, and were entirely out of patience. About two hours and a half before we arrived at La Parelle Station, the keeper in charge of it had fired four times at an Indian, but he said, with an injured air, that the Indian had skipped round so's to spile everything, and ammunition's blamed scarce, too. The most natural inference conveyed by his manner of speaking was that, in skipping around, the Indian had taken an unfair advantage. The coach we were in had a neat hole through its front, a reminiscence of its last trip through this region. The bullet that made it wounded the driver slightly, but he did not mind it much. He said the place to keep a man huffy was down on the southern overland, among the Apaches, before the company moved the stage line up on the northern route. He said the Apaches used to annoy him all the time down there, and that he came as near as anything to starving to death in the midst of abundance, because they kept him so leaky with bullet-holes that he couldn't hold his victuals. This person's statement were not generally believed. We shut the blinds down very tightly that first night in the hostile Indian country, and lay on our arms. We slept on them some, but most of the time we only lay on them. We did not talk much, but kept quiet and listened. It was an inky black night, and occasionally rainy. We were among woods and rocks, hills and gorges, so shut in, in fact, that when we peeped through a chink in a curtain we could discern nothing. The driver and conductor on top were still, too, or only spoke at long intervals in low tones, as in the way of men in the midst of invisible dangers. We listened to raindrops pattering on the roof, and the grinding of the wheels through the muddy gravel, and the low wailing of the wind, and all the time we had that absurd sense upon us, inseparable from travel at night in close-curtained vehicle, the sense of remaining perfectly still in one place, notwithstanding the jolting and swaying of the vehicle, the trampling of the horses, and the grinding of the wheels. We listened a long time, with intent faculties and bated breath. Every time one of us would relax, and draw a long sigh of relief, and start to say something, a comrade would be sure to utter a sudden hark, and instantly the experimenter was rigid and listening again. So the tiresome minutes and decades of minutes dragged by, until at last our tense forms filmed over with a dulled consciousness, and we slept, if one might call such a condition by so strong a name, for it was a sleep set with a hair-trigger. It was a sleep seething and teeming, with a weird and distressful confusion of shreds and fag-ends of dreams, a sleep that was a chaos. Presently dreams and sleep and the sullen hush of the night were startled by a ringing report, and cloven by such a long, wild, agonizing shriek. Then we heard ten steps from the stage. "'Help! Help! Help!' it was our driver's voice. "'Kill him! Kill him like a dog! I'm being murdered!' Will no man lend me a pistol? Look out! Head him off! Head him off! Two pistol shots, a confusion of voices and the trampling of many feet, as if a crowd were closing and surging together round some object, several heavy, dull blows, as with a club, a voice that said appealingly, Don't, gentlemen, please don't, I'm a dead man! Then a fainter groan and another blow, and away sped the stage into the darkness, and left the grisly mystery behind us. What a startle it was! Eight seconds would amply cover the time it occupied. Maybe even five would do it. We only had time to plunge at a curtain and unbuckle and unbutton part of it in an awkward and hindering flurry, when our whip cracked sharply overhead, and we went rumbling and thundering away down a mountain grade. We fed on that mystery the rest of the night, what was left of it, for it was waning fast. 
it had to remain a present mystery, for all we could get from the conductor in answer to our hails was something that sounded through the clatter of the wheels like, "'Tell you in the morning!' So we lit our pipes and opened the corner of a curtain for a chimney, and lay there in the dark, listening to each other's story of how he first felt and how many thousand Indians he first thought had hurled themselves upon us, and what his remembrance of the subsequent sounds was, and the order of their occurrence. And we theorized, too, but there was never a theory that would account for our driver's voice being out there, nor yet account for his Indian murderers talking such good English, if they were Indians. So we chatted and smoked the rest of the night comfortably away, our boding anxiety being somehow marvelously dissipated by the real presence of something to be anxious about. We never did get much satisfaction about that dark occurrence. All that we could make out of the odds and ends of the information we gathered in the morning was that the disturbance occurred at a station, that we changed drivers there, and that the driver that got off there had been talking roughly about some of the outlaws that infested the region, for there wasn't a man around there but had a price on his head and didn't dare show himself in the settlements, the conductor said. He had talked roughly about these characters, and ought to have drove up there with his pistol cocked and ready on the seat alongside of him, and begun business himself, because any softy would know they would be laying for him. That was all we could gather, and we could see that neither the conductor nor the new driver were much concerned about the matter. They plainly had little respect for a man who would deliver offensive opinions of people, and then be so simple as to come into their presence unprepared to back his judgment as they pleasantly phrased the killing of any fellow-being who did not like said opinions. And likewise they plainly had a contempt for the man's poor discretion in venturing to rouse the wrath of such utterly reckless wild beasts as those outlaws. And the conductor added, "'I tell you, it's as much as Slade himself want to do.' This remark created an entire revolution in my curiosity. I cared nothing now about the Indians, and even lost interest in the murdered driver. There was such magic in that name, Slade. Day or night now, I stood always ready to drop any subject in hand to listen to something new about Slade and his ghastly exploits. Even before we got to Overland City we had begun to hear about Slade and his division, for he was a division agent on the Overland, and from the hour we had left Overland City we had heard drivers and conductors talk about only three things. California, the Nevada silver mines, and this desperado Slade. And a deal the most of the talk was about Slade. We had gradually come to have a realizing sense of the fact that Slade was a man whose heart and hands and soul were steeped in the blood of offenders against his dignity, a man who awfully avenged all injuries, affront, insults, or slights, of whatever kind, on the spot if he could, years afterward, if lack of earlier opportunity compelled it a man whose hate tortured him day and night till vengeance appeased it, and not an ordinary vengeance either, but his enemy's absolute death, nothing less, a man whose face would light up with a terrible joy when he surprised a foe and had him at a disadvantage, a high and efficient servant of the overland, an outlaw among outlaws, and yet their relentless scourge. Slade was at once the most bloody, the most dangerous, and the most valuable citizen that inhabited the savage fastnesses of the mountains. End of chapter 9 This is chapter 10 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain Chapter 10 Really and truly, two-thirds of the talk of drivers and conductors had been about this man Slade ever since the day before we reached Julesburg, in order that the Eastern reader may have a clear conception of what a Rocky Mountain desperado is in his highest state of development, I will reduce all this mass of overland gossip to one straightforward narrative, and present it in the following shape. Slade was born in Illinois, of good parentage. At about twenty-six years of age he killed a man in a quarrel and fled the country. At St. Joseph, Missouri, he joined one of the early California-bound emigrant trains, 
and was given the post of train master. One day, on the plains, he had an angry dispute with one of his wagon drivers, and both drew their revolvers. But the driver was the quicker artist, and had his weapon cocked first. So Slade said it was a pity to waste life on so small a matter, and proposed that the pistols be thrown on the ground, and the quarrel settled by a fist fight. The unsuspecting driver agreed, and threw down his pistol, whereupon Slade laughed at his simplicity, and shot him dead. He made his escape, and lived a wild life for a while, dividing his time between fighting Indians and avoiding an Illinois sheriff, who had been sent to arrest him for his first murder. It is said that in one Indian battle he killed three savages with his own hand, and afterward cut their ears off and sent them with his compliments to the chief of the tribe. Slade soon gained a name for fearless resolution, and this was sufficient merit to procure for him the important post of overland division agent at Julesburg, in place of Mr. Jules removed. For some time previously the company's horses had been frequently stolen, and the coaches delayed by gangs of outlaws, who were wont to laugh at the idea of any man's having the temerity to resent such outrages. Slade resented them promptly. The outlaws soon found that the new agent was a man who did not fear anything that breathed the breath of life. He made short work of all offenders. The result was that delays ceased, the company's property was let alone, and no matter what happened or who suffered, Slade's coaches went through every time. True, in order to bring about this wholesome change, Slade had to kill several men, some say three, others say four, and others six, but the world was the richer for their loss. The first prominent difficulty he had was with the ex-agent Jules, who bore the reputation of being a reckless and desperate man himself. Jules hated Slade for supplanting him, and a good fair occasion for a fight was all he was waiting for. By and by Slade dared to employ a man whom Jules had once discharged. Next, Slade seized a team of stage-horses, which he accused Jules of having driven off and hidden somewhere for his own use. War was declared, and for a day or two the two men walked warily about the streets seeking each other, Jules armed with a double-barreled shotgun, and Slade with his history-creating revolver. Finally, as Slade stepped into a store, Jules poured the contents of his gun into him from behind the door. Slade was plucky and Jules got several bad pistol wounds in return. Then both men fell, and were carried to their respective lodgings, both swearing that better aim should do deadlier work next time. Both were bedridden a long time, but Jules got to his feet first, and, gathering his possessions together, packed them on a couple of mules, and fled to the Rocky Mountains to gather strength and safety against the day of reckoning. For many months he was not seen or heard of, and was gradually dropped out of the remembrance of all save Slade himself. But Slade was not the man to forget him. On the contrary, common report said that Slade kept a reward standing for his capture, dead or alive. After a while, seeing that Slade's energetic administration had restored peace and order to one of the worst divisions of the road, the Overland Stage Company transferred him to the Rocky Ridge Division in the Rocky Mountains to see if he could perform a like miracle there. It was the very paradise of outlaws and desperadoes. There was absolutely no semblance of law there. Violence was the rule. Force was the only recognized authority. The commonest misunderstandings were settled on the spot with the revolver or the knife. Murders were done in open day, and with sparkling frequency, and nobody thought of inquiring into them. It was considered that the parties who did the killing had their private reasons for it, for other people to meddle would have been looked upon as indelicate. After a murder, all that Rocky Mountain etiquette required of a spectator was that he should help the gentleman bury his game. Otherwise his churlishness would surely be remembered against him the first time he killed a man himself, and needed a neighborly turn in interning him. Slade took up his residence sweetly and peacefully in the midst of this hive of horse-thieves and assassins, and the very first time one of them aired his insolent swaggerings in his presence, he shot him dead. He began a raid on the outlaws, 
and in a singularly short space of time he had completely stopped their depredations on the stage stock, recovered a large number of stolen horses, killed several of the worst desperadoes of the district, and gained such a dread ascendancy over the rest that they respected him, admired him, feared him, obeyed him. He wrought the same marvelous change in the ways of the community that had marked his administration at Overland City. He captured two men who had stolen Overland stock, and with his own hands he hanged them. He was supreme judge in his district, and he was jury and executioner likewise. And not only in the case of offenses against his employers, but against passing emigrants as well. On one occasion some emigrants had their stock lost or stolen, and told Slade, who chanced to visit their camp. With a single companion he rode to a ranch, the owners of which he suspected, and, opening the door, commenced firing, killing three and wounding the fourth. From a bloodthirstily interesting little Montana book, The Vigilantes of Montana, by Professor Thomas J. Dimsdale, I take this paragraph. While on the road, Slade held absolute sway. He would ride down to a station, get into a quarrel, turn the house out of windows, and maltreat the occupants most cruelly. The unfortunate had no means of redress, and were compelled to recuperate as best they could. On one of these occasions, it is said he killed the father of the fine little half-breed boy Jemmy, whom he adopted, and who lived with his widow after his execution. Stories of Slade's hanging men, and of innumerable assaults, shootings, stabbings, and beatings, in which he was a principal actor, form part of the legends of the stage line. As for minor quarrels and shootings, it is absolutely certain that a minute history of Slade's life would be one long record of such practices. The Vigilantes of Montana, by Professor Thomas J. Dimsdale. Slade was a matchless marksman with a navy revolver. The legends say that one morning at Rocky Ridge, when he was feeling comfortable, he saw a man approaching who had offended him some days before. Observe the fine memory he had for matters like that. And, gentlemen, said Slade, drawing, it is a good twenty-yard shot. I'll clip the third button on his coat. Which he did. The bystanders all admired it and they all attended the funeral, too. On one occasion a man who kept a little whiskey-shelf at the station did something which angered Slade, and went and made his will. A day or two afterward Slade came in and called for some brandy. The man reached under the counter, ostensibly to get a bottle, possibly to get something else, but Slade smiled upon him, that peculiarly bland and satisfied smile of his, which the neighbors had long ago learned to recognize as a death-warrant in disguise, and told him to, none of that, pass out the high-priced article. So the poor barkeeper had to turn his back and get the high-priced brandy from the shelf, and when he faced around again, he was looking into the muzzle of Slade's pistol. And the next instant, added my informant impressively, he was one of the deadest men that ever lived. The stage drivers and conductors told us that sometimes Slade would leave a hated enemy wholly unmolested, unnoticed, and unmentioned for weeks together, had done it once or twice at any rate, and some said they believed he did it in order to lull the victims into unwatchfulness, so that he could get the advantage of them, and others said they believed he saved up an enemy that way, just as a schoolboy saves up a cake and made the pleasure go as far as it would by gloating over the anticipation. One of these cases was that of a Frenchman who had offended Slade. To the surprise of everybody, Slade did not kill him on the spot, but let him alone for a considerable time. Finally, however, he went to the Frenchman's house very late one night, knocked, and when his enemy opened the door, shot him dead, pushed the corpse inside the door with his foot, set the house on fire, and burned up the dead man, his widow, and three children. I heard this story from several different people, and they evidently believed what they were saying. It may be true, and it may not. Give a dog a bad name, etc. Slade was captured, once, by a party of men who intended to lynch him. They disarmed him, and shut him up in a strong log house, and placed a guard over him. He prevailed on his captors to send for his wife, so that he might have a last interview with her. She was a brave, loving, spirited woman. She jumped on a horse and rode for life and death. When she arrived, they let her in without searching her, 
and before the door could be closed, she whipped out a couple of revolvers, and she and her lord marched forth defying the party, and then, under a brisk fire, they mounted double, and galloped away unharmed. In the fullness of time, Slade's myrmidons captured his ancient enemy Jules, whom they found in a well-chosen hiding-place in the remote fastnesses of the mountains, gaining a precarious livelihood with his rifle. They brought him to Rocky Ridge, bound hand and foot, and deposited him in the middle of the cattle-yard with his back against a post. It is said that the pleasure that lit Slade's face when he heard of it was something fearful to contemplate. He examined his enemy to see that he was securely tied, and then he went to bed, content to wait till morning before enjoying the luxury of killing him. Jules spent the night in the cattle-yard, and it is a region where warm nights are never known. In the morning Slade practiced on him with his revolver, nipping the flesh here and there, and occasionally clipping off a finger, while Jules begged him to kill him outright and put him out of his misery. Finally Slade reloaded, and, walking up close to his victim, made some characteristic remarks, and then dispatched him. The body lay there half a day, nobody venturing to touch it without orders, and then Slade detailed a party, and assisted at the burial himself. But he first cut off the dead man's ears, and put them in his vest pocket, where he carried them for some time with great satisfaction. That is the story, as I have frequently heard it told, and seen it in print in California newspapers. It is doubtless correct in all essential particulars. In due time we rattled up to a stage station and sat down to breakfast with a half-savage, half-civilized company of armed and bearded mountaineers, ranchmen, and station employees, the most gentlemanly appearing, quiet and affable officer we had yet found along the road in the Overland Company's service was the person who sat at the head of the table at my elbow. Never youth stared and shivered as I did when I heard them call him Slade. Here was romance, and I sitting face to face with it, looking upon it, touching it, hobnobbing with it, as it were. Here, right by my side, was the actual ogre who, in fights and brawls and various ways, had taken the lives of twenty-six human beings, or all men lied about him. I suppose I was the proudest stripling that ever traveled to see strange lands and wonderful people. He was so friendly and so gentle-spoken that I warmed to him in spite of his awful history. It was hardly possible to realize that this pleasant person was the pitiless scourge of the outlaws, the raw head and bloody bones the nursing mothers of the mountains terrified their children with, and to this day I can remember nothing remarkable about Slade except that his face was rather broad across the cheekbones, and that the cheekbones were low, and the lips peculiarly thin and straight but that was enough to leave something of an effect upon me, for since then I seldom see a face possessing those characteristics without fancying that the owner of it is a dangerous man. The coffee ran out. At least it was reduced to one tin cupful, and Slade was about to take it when he saw that my cup was empty. He politely offered to fill it, but although I wanted it I politely declined. I was afraid he had not killed anybody that morning, and <laughs> might be needing diversion. But still, with firm politeness, he insisted on filling my cup, and said I had traveled all night and better deserved it than the he. And while he talked, he placidly poured the fluid to the last drop. I thanked him and drank it, but it gave me no comfort, for I could not feel sure that he would not be sorry presently that he had given it away, and proceed to kill me to distract his thoughts from the loss. But nothing of the kind occurred. We left him with only twenty-six dead people to account for, and I felt a tranquil satisfaction in the thought that, in so judiciously taking care of number one at that breakfast-table, I had pleasantly escaped being number twenty-seven. Slade came out to the coach and saw us off, first ordering certain rearrangements of the mail-bags for our comfort, and then we took leave of him, satisfied that we should hear of him again, some day and wondering in what connection. End of chapter 10 This is chapter 11 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain Chapter 11 And sure enough, two or three years afterward, we did hear him again. 
news came to the Pacific Coast that the Vigilance Committee in Montana, whither Slade had removed from Rocky Ridge, had hanged him. I find an account of the affair in the thrilling little book I quoted a paragraph from in the last chapter, The Vigilantes of Montana, being a reliable account of the capture, trial, and execution of Henry Plummer's notorious road agent band by Professor Thomas J. Dimsdale, Virginia City, Montana. Mr. Dimdale's chapter is well worth reading as a specimen of how the people of the frontier deal with criminals when the courts of law prove inefficient. Mr. Dimsdale makes two remarks about Slade, both of which are accurately descriptive, and one of which is exceedingly picturesque. Those who saw him in his natural state only would pronounce him to be a kind husband, a most hospitable host, and a courteous gentleman. On the contrary, those who met him when maddened with liquor and surrounded by a gang of armed roughs would pronounce him a fiend incarnate. And this, from Fort Kearney, west, he was feared a great deal more than the Almighty. For compactness, simplicity, and vigor of expression, I will back that sentence against anything in literature. Mr. Dimsdale's narrative is as follows. In all places where italics occur, they are mine. After the execution of the five men on the 14th of January, the vigilantes considered that their work was nearly ended. They had freed the country of highwaymen and murderers to a great extent, and they determined that in the absence of the regular civil authority they would establish a people's court where all offenders should be tried by judge and jury. This was the nearest approach to social order that the circumstances permitted, and, though strict legal authority was wanting, yet the people were firmly determined to maintain its efficiency, and to enforce its decrees. It may here be mentioned that the overt act, which was the last round on the fatal ladder leading to the scaffold on which Slade perished, was the tearing in pieces and stamping upon a writ of this court followed by his arrest of the Judge Alexander Davis, by authority of a presented Derringer, and with his own hands. J. A. Slade was himself, we have been informed, a vigilante. He openly boasted of it, and said he knew all that they knew. He was never accused, or even suspected, of either murder or robbery committed in this territory. The latter crime was never laid to his charge in any place but that he had killed several men in other localities was notorious, and his bad reputation in this respect was a most powerful argument in determining his fate, when he was finally arrested for the offense above mentioned. On returning from Milk River, he became more and more addicted to drinking, until at last it was a common feat for him and his friends to take the town. He and a couple of his dependents might often be seen on one horse, galloping through the streets, shouting and yelling, firing revolvers, etc. On many occasions he would ride his horse into stores, break up bars, toss the scales out of doors, and use most insulting language to parties present. Just previous to the day of his arrest he had given a fearful beating to one of his followers, but such was his influence over them that the man wept bitterly at the gallows, and begged for his life with all his power. It had become quite common, when Slade was on a spree, for the shopkeepers and citizens to close the stores and put out all the lights, being fearful of some outrage at his hands. For his wanton destruction of goods and furniture he was always ready to pay, when sober, if he had the money. But there were not a few who regarded payment as small satisfaction for the outrage, and these men were his personal enemies. From time to time Slade received warnings from men that he well knew would not deceive him of the certain end of his conduct. There was not a moment for weeks previous to his arrest in which the public did not expect to hear of some bloody outrage. The dread of his very name, and the presence of the armed band of hangers-on who followed him alone prevented a resistance which must certainly have ended in the instant murder or mutilation of the opposing party. Slade was frequently arrested by order of the court, whose organization we have described, and had treated it with respect by paying one or two fines, and promising to pay the rest when he had money. But in the transaction that occurred at this crisis, he forgot even this caution, 
and goaded by passion and the hatred of restraint, he sprang into the embrace of death. Slade had been drunk and cutting up all night. He and his companions had made the town a perfect hell. In the morning J. M. Fox, the sheriff, met him, arrested him, took him into court, and commenced reading a warrant that he had for his arrest by way of arraignment. He became uncontrollably furious, and, seizing the writ, he tore it up, threw it on the ground, and stamped upon it. The clicking of the locks of his companions' revolvers was instantly heard, and a crisis was expected. The sheriff did not attempt his retention. But, being at least as prudent as he was valiant, he succumbed, leaving Slade the master of the situation, and the conqueror and ruler of the courts, law and law-makers. This was a declaration of war, and was so accepted. The Vigilance Committee now felt that the question of social order and the preponderance of the law-abiding citizens had then and there to be decided. They knew the character of Slade, and they were well aware that they must submit to his rule without murmur, or else that he must be dealt with in such fashion as would prevent his being able to wreak his vengeance on the Committee, who could never have hoped to live in the territory secure from outrage or death, and who could never leave it without encountering his friend, whom his victory would have emboldened and stimulated to a pitch that would have rendered them reckless of consequences. The day previous he had ridden into Doris's store, and on being requested to leave he drew his revolver and threatened to kill the gentleman who spoke to him. Another saloon he had led his horse into, and, buying a bottle of wine, he tried to make the animal drink it. This was not considered an uncommon performance as he had often entered saloons and commenced firing at the lamps, causing a wild stampede. A leading member of the committee met Slade and informed him in the quiet, earnest manner of one who feels the importance of what he is saying, "'Slade, get your horse at once and go home, or there will be <coughs> to pay.' Slade started and took a long look, with his dark and piercing eyes, at the gentleman. "'What do you mean?' said he. "'You have no right to ask me what I mean,' was the quiet reply. "'Get your horse at once, and remember what I tell you.' After a short pause he promised to do so, and actually got into the saddle. But, being still intoxicated, he began calling aloud to one after another of his friends, and at last seemed to have forgotten the warning he had received, and became again uproarious, shouting the name of a well-known courtesan in company with those of two men whom he considered heads of the committee, as a sort of challenge, perhaps, however, as a simple act of bravado. It seems probable that the intimation of personal danger he had received had not been forgotten entirely. Though fatally for him he took a foolish way of showing his remembrance of it, he sought out Alexander Davis, the judge of the court, and, drawing a cocked derringer, he presented it at his head, and told him that he should hold him as a hostage for his own safety. As the judge stood perfectly quiet, and offered no resistance to his captor, no further outrage followed on this score. Previous to this, on account of the critical state of affairs, the committee had met, and at last resolved to arrest him. His execution had not been agreed upon, and, at that time, would have been negative most assuredly. A messenger rode down to Nevada to inform the leading men of what was on hand, as it was desirable to show that there was a feeling of unanimity on the subject, all along the gulch. The miners turned out almost en masse, leaving their work, and forming in solid column about six hundred strong, armed to the teeth, they marched up to Virginia. The leader of the body well knew the temper of his men on the subject. He spurred on ahead of them, and hastily calling a meeting of the executive, he told them plainly that the miners meant business, and that if they came up, they would not stand in the street to be shot down by Slade's friends, but that they would take him and hang him. The meeting was small, as the Virginia men were loath to act at all. This momentous announcement of the feeling of the lower town was made to a cluster of men who were deliberating behind a wagon, at the rear of a store on Main Street. The committee were most unwilling to proceed to extremities. All the duty they had ever performed seemed as nothing to the task before them. But they had to decide, and that quickly. It was finally agreed that if the whole body of the miners were of the opinion that he should be hanged, that the committee left it in their hands to deal with him. 
off at hot speed rode the leader of the Nevada men to join his command. Slade had found out what was intended, and the news sobered him instantly. He went into P. S. Fope's store, where Davis was, and apologized for his conduct, saying that he would take it all back. The head of the column now wheeled into Wallace Street, and marched up at quick time. Halting in front of the store, the executive officer of the committee stepped forward and arrested Slade, who was at once informed of his doom, and inquiry was made as to whether he had any business to settle. Several parties spoke to him on the subject, but to all such inquiries he turned a deaf ear, being entirely absorbed in the terrifying reflection on his own awful position. He never ceased his entreaties for life, and to see his dear wife. The unfortunate lady referred to, between whom and Slade there existed a warm affection, was at this time living at their ranch on the Madison. She was possessed of considerable personal attractions, tall, well-formed, of graceful carriage, pleasing manners, and was withal an accomplished horsewoman. A messenger from Slade rode at full speed to inform her of her husband's arrest. In an instant she was in the saddle, and with all the energy that love and despair could lend to an ardent temperament and a strong physique, she urged her fleet charger over the twelve miles of rough and rocky ground that intervened between her and the object of her passionate devotion. Meanwhile a party of volunteers had made the necessary preparations for the execution in the valley traversed by the branch. Beneath the site of Pfotz and Russell's stone building, there was a corral, the gate-posts of which were strong and high. Across the top was laid a beam, to which the rope was fastened, and a dry-goods box served for the platform. To this place Slade was marched, surrounded by a guard, composing the best armed and most numerous force that has ever appeared in Montana territory. The doomed man had so exhausted himself by tears, prayers, and lamentations, that he had scarcely strength left to stand under the fatal beam. He repeatedly exclaimed, "'My God! My God! Must I die? Oh, my dear wife!' On the return of the fatigue party they encountered some friends of Slade, staunch and reliable citizens and members of the committee, but who were personally attached to the condemned. On hearing of his sentence one of them, a stout-hearted man, pulled out his handkerchief and walked away weeping like a child. Slade still begged to see his wife most piteously and it seemed hard to deny his request. But the bloody consequences that were sure to follow the inevitable attempt at a rescue, that her presence and entreaties would have certainly incited, forbade the granting of his request. Several gentlemen were sent for to see him in his last moments, one of whom, Judge Davis, made a short address to the people, but in such low tones as to be inaudible, save to a few in his immediate vicinity. One of his friends, after exhausting his powers of entreaty, threw off his coat and declared that the prisoner could not be hanged until he himself was killed. A hundred guns were instantly leveled at him, whereupon he turned and fled. But, being brought back, he was compelled to resume his coat and to give a promise of future peaceable demeanor. Scarcely a leading man in Virginia could be found, though numbers of the citizens joined the ranks of the guard when the arrest was made. All lamented the stern necessity which dictated the execution. Everything being ready, the command was given, "'Men, do your duty!' And the box being instantly slipped from beneath his feet, he died almost instantaneously. The body was cut down and carried to the Virginia Hotel, where, in a darkened room, it was scarcely laid out, when the unfortunate and bereaved companion of the deceased arrived, at headlong speed, to find that all was over, and that she was a widow." Her grief and heart-piercing cries were terrible evidences of the depth of her attachment for her lost husband, and a considerable period elapsed before she could regain the command of her excited feelings. There is something about the desperado nature that is wholly unaccountable, at least it looks unaccountable. It is this. The true desperado is gifted with splendid courage and yet he will take the most infamous advantage of his enemy. Armed and free, he will stand up before a host, and fight until he is shot all to pieces, and yet when he is under the gallows and helpless, he will cry and plead like a child. Words are cheap, and it is easy to call Slade a coward. All executed men who do not die game 
are promptly called cowards by unreflecting people, and when we read of Slade that he had so exhausted himself by tears, prayers, and lamentations that he had scarcely strength left to stand under the fatal beam, the disgraceful word suggests itself in a moment. Yet, in frequently defying and inviting the vengeance of banded Rocky Mountain cutthroats by shooting down their comrades and leaders, and never offering to hide or fly, Slade showed that he was a man of peerless bravery. No coward would dare that. Many a notorious coward, many a chicken-livered poltroon, coarse, brutal, degraded, has made his dying speech without a quaver in his voice, and been swung into eternity with what looked like the calmest fortitude, and so we are justified in believing, from the low intellect of such a creature, that it was not moral courage that enabled him to do it. Then, if moral courage is not the requisite quality, what could it have been that this stout-hearted Slade lacked, this bloody, desperate, kindly-mannered, urbane gentleman, who never hesitated to warn his most ruffianly enemies that he would kill them whenever or wherever he came across them next? I think it is a conundrum worth investigating. End of chapter 11 This is chapter 12 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain Chapter 12 Just beyond the breakfast station, we overtook a Mormon emigrant train of thirty-three wagons, and, tramping wearily along and driving their herd of loose cows, were dozens of coarse-clad and sad-looking men, women, and children, who had walked, as they were walking now, day after day, for eight lingering weeks, and in that time had compassed the distance our stage had come in eight days and three hours, seven hundred and ninety-eight miles. They were dusty and uncombed, hatless, bonnetless, and ragged, and they did look so tired. After breakfast we bathed in Horse Creek, a previously limpid sparkling stream, an appreciated luxury, for it was very seldom that our furious coach halted long enough for an indulgence of that kind. We changed horses ten or twelve times in every twenty-four hours, changed mules, rather, six mules, and did it nearly every time in four minutes. It was lively work. As our coach rattled up to each station, six harnessed mules stepped gaily from the stable, and in the twinkling of an eye, almost, the old team was out, the new one in and we off and away again. During the afternoon we passed Sweetwater Creek, Independence Rock, Devil's Gate, and the Devil's Gap. The latter were wild specimens of rugged scenery and full of interest. We were in the heart of the Rocky Mountains now. And we also passed by Alkali, or Soda Lake, and we woke up to the fact that our journey had stretched a long way across the world when the driver said that the Mormons often came here from Great Salt Lake City to haul away saleratus. He said that a few days gone by they had shoveled up enough pure saleratus from the ground—it was a dry lake—to load two wagons, and that when they got these two wagon loads of a drug that cost them nothing to Salt Lake, they could sell it for twenty-five cents a pound. In the night we sailed by a most notable curiosity and one we had been hearing a good deal about for a day or two, and were suffering to see. This was what might be called a natural ice-house. It was August now, and sweltering weather in the daytime, yet at one of the stations the men could scrape the soil on the hillside under the lee of a range of boulders, and at a depth of six inches cut out pure blocks of ice, hard, compactly frozen, and clear as crystal. Toward dawn we got under way again, and presently, as we sat with raised curtains enjoying our early morning smoke, and contemplating the first splendor of the rising sun as it swept down the long array of mountain peaks, flushing and gilding crag after crag, and summit after summit, as if the invisible Creator reviewed his gray veterans, and they saluted with a smile, we hove in sight of South Pass City. The hotel-keeper, the postmaster, the blacksmith, the mayor, the constable, the city marshal, and the principal citizen and property-holder all came out and greeted us cheerily, and we gave him good day. 
he gave us a little Indian news and a little Rocky Mountain news, and we gave him some Plains information in return. He then retired to his lonely grandeur, and we climbed on up amongst the bristling peaks and the ragged clouds. South Pass City consisted of four log cabins, one of which was unfinished, and the gentleman with all those offices and titles was the chiefest of the ten citizens of the place. Think of hotel-keeper, postmaster, blacksmith, mayor, constable, city marshal, and principal citizen all condensed into one person, and crammed into one skin. Bemis said he was a perfect Allen's revolver of dignities. And he said that if he were to die as postmaster or as blacksmith, or as postmaster and blacksmith both, the people might stand it, but if he were to die all over, it would be a frightful loss to the community. Two miles beyond South Pass City, we saw for the first time that mysterious marvel which all western untraveled boys have heard of, and fully believe in, but are sure to be astounded at when they see it with their own eyes, nevertheless. Banks of snow in dead summer time. We were now far up toward the sky, and knew all the time that we must presently encounter lofty summits clad in the eternal snow, which was so commonplace a matter of mention in books, and yet when I did see it glittering in the sun on stately domes in the distance, and knew the month was August, and that my coat was hanging up because it was too warm to wear it, I was full as much amazed as if I had never heard of snow in August before. Truly, seeing is believing, and many a man lives a long life through thinking he believes certain universally received and well-established things, and yet never suspects that if he were confronted by those things once, he would discover that he did not really believe them before, but only thought he believed them. In a little while quite a number of peaks swung into view, with long claws of glittering snow clasping them, and with here and there, in the shade, down the mountainside, a little solitary patch of snow, looking no larger than the lady's pocket-handkerchief, but being in reality as large as a public square. And now, at last, we were fairly in the renowned South Pass, and whirling gaily along high above the common world. We were perched upon the extreme summit of the great range of the Rocky Mountains, toward which we had been climbing, patiently climbing, ceaselessly climbing, for days and nights together. And about us was gathered a convention of nature's kings that stood ten, twelve, and even thirteen thousand feet high, grand old fellows who would have to stoop to see Mount Washington in the twilight. We were in such an airy elevation above the creeping populations of the earth that now and then, when the obstructing crags stood out of the way, it seemed that we could look around and abroad and contemplate the whole great globe, with its dissolving views of mountains, seas, and continents, stretching away through the mystery of the summer haze. As a general thing, the pass was more suggestive of a valley than a suspension bridge in the clouds, but it strongly suggested the latter at one spot. At that place the upper third of one or two majestic purple domes projected above our level on either hand, and gave us a sense of a hidden great deep of mountains and plains, and valleys down about their bases, which we fancied we might see if we could step to the edge and look over. These sultans of the fastnesses were turbaned with tumbled volumes of cloud, which shredded away from time to time, and drifted off, fringed and torn, trailing their continents of shadow after them, and, catching presently on an intercepting peak, wrapped it about and brooded there then shredded away again, and left the purple peak, as they had left the purple domes, downy and white with new-laid snow. In passing these monstrous rags of cloud hung low, and swept along right over the spectator's head, swinging their tatters so nearly in his face that his impulse was to shrink when they came close. In the one place I speak of, one could look below him upon a world of diminishing crags and canyons leading down, down, and away to a vague plain with a thread in it which was a road, and bunches of feathers in it which were trees, a pretty picture sleeping in the sunlight, but with a darkness stealing over it and glooming its features deeper and deeper under the frown of a coming storm. And then, while no film or shadow marred the noon brightness of his high perch, he could watch the tempest break forth down there, and see the lightnings leap from crag to crag, and the sheeted rain drive along the canyon sides, 
and hear the thunders peal and crash and roar. We had this spectacle, a familiar one to many, but to us a novelty. We bowled along cheerily, and presently, at the very summit, though it had been all summit to us, and all equally level for half an hour or more, we came to a spring which spent its water through two outlets and sent it in opposite directions. The conductor said that one of those streams which we were looking at was just starting on a journey westward to the Gulf of California and the Pacific Ocean, through hundreds and even thousands of miles of desert solitudes. He said that the other was just leaving its home among the snow peaks on a similar journey eastward, and we knew that long after we should have forgotten the simple rivulet, it would still be plodding its patient way down the mountain sides and canyon beds, and between the banks of the Yellowstone, and by and by would join the broad Missouri, and flow through unknown plains and deserts and unvisited wildernesses, and add a long and troubled pilgrimage among snags and wrecks and sandbars, and enter the Mississippi, touch the wharves of St. Louis, and still drift on, traversing shoals and rocky channels, then endless chains of bottomless and ample bends, walled with unbroken forests, then mysterious byways and secret passages among woody islands, then the chained bends again, bordered with wide levels of shining sugar-cane in place of the somber forests, then by New Orleans, and still other chains of bends, and finally, after two long months of daily and nightly harassment, excitement, enjoyment, adventure, and awful peril of parched throats, pumps, and evaporation, pass the gulf and enter into its rest upon the bosom of the tropic sea, never to look upon its snow-peaks again, or regret them. I freighted a leaf with a mental passage for the friends at home, and dropped it in the stream, but I put no stamp on it, and it was held for postage somewhere. On the summit we overtook an emigrant train of many wagons, many tired men and women, and many a disgusted sheep and cow. In the woefully dusty horseman in charge of the expedition I recognized John— <coughs> Of all persons in the world to meet on top of the Rocky Mountains, thousands of miles from home, he was the last one I should have looked for. We were schoolboys together, and warm friends for years. But a boyish prank of mine had disrupted this friendship, and it had never been renewed. The act of which I speak was this. I had been accustomed to visit occasionally an editor whose room was in the third story of a building, and overlooked the street. One day this editor gave me a watermelon which I made preparations to devour on the spot. But, chancing to look out of the window, I saw John standing directly under it, and an irresistible desire came upon me to drop the melon on his head, which I immediately did. I was the loser, for it spoiled the melon, and John never forgave me, and we dropped all intercourse and parted, but now met again under these circumstances. We recognized each other simultaneously, and hands were grasped as warmly as if no coldness had ever existed between us, and no allusion was made to any. All animosities were buried, and the simple fact of meeting a familiar face in that isolated spot so far from home was sufficient to make us forget all things but pleasant ones, and we parted again with sincere good-bye, and God bless you from both. We had been climbing up the long shoulders of the Rocky Mountains for many tedious hours. We started down them now, and we went spinning away at a round rate, too. We left the snowy Wind River Mountains and Uinta Mountains behind, and sped away, always through splendid scenery, but occasionally through long ranks of white skeletons of mules and oxen, monuments of huge emigration of other days and here and there were upended boards or small piles of stones which the driver said marked the resting-place of more precious remains. It was the loneliest land for a grave, a land given over to the coyote and the raven, which is but another name for desolation and utter solitude. On damp, murky nights these scattered skeletons gave forth a soft, hideous glow, like very faint spots of moonlight staring the vague desert. It was because of the phosphorus in the bones, but no scientific explanation could keep a body from shivering when he drifted by one of those ghostly lights, and knew that a skull held it. 
At midnight it began to rain, and I never saw anything like it. Indeed, I did not even see this, for it was too dark. We fastened down the curtains, and even caulked them with clothing, but the rain streamed in in twenty places notwithstanding. There was no escape. If one moved his feet out of a stream, he brought his body under one, and if he moved his body, he caught one somewhere else. If he struggled out of the drenched blankets and sat up, he was bound to get one down the back of his neck. Meantime the stage was wandering about a plain with gaping gullies in it, for the driver could not see an inch before his face nor keep the road, and the storm pelted so pitilessly that there was no keeping the horses still. With the first abatement the conductor turned out with lanterns to look for the road, and the first dash he made was into a chasm about fourteen feet deep, his lantern following like a meteor. As soon as he touched bottom he sang out frantically, "'Don't come here!' to which the driver, who was looking over the precipice where he had disappeared, replied with an injured air, "'Think I'm a damn fool?' The conductor was more than an hour finding the road, a matter which showed us how far we had wandered and what chances we had been taking. He traced our wheel-tracks to the imminent verge of danger in two places. I have always been glad that we were not killed that night. I do not know any particular reason, but I have always been glad. In the morning, the tenth day out, we crossed Green River, a fine, large, limpid stream, stuck in it with the water just up to the top of our mail-bed, and waited till extra teams were put on to haul us up the steep bank. But it was nice cool water, and besides, it could not find any fresh place on us to wet. At the Green River station we had breakfast, hot biscuits, fresh antelope steaks, and coffee. The only decent meal we tasted between the United States and Great Salt Lake City, and the only one we were ever really thankful for. Think of the monotonous execrableness of the thirty that went before it, to leave this one simple breakfast looming up in my memory, like a shot-tower, after all these years have gone by. At five p.m. we reached Fort Bridger, one hundred and seventeen miles from the South Pass, and one thousand twenty-five miles from St. Joseph. Fifty-two miles further on, near the head of Echo Canyon, we met sixty United States soldiers from Camp Floyd. The day before they had fired upon three hundred or four hundred Indians, whom they supposed gathered together for no good purpose. In the fight that had ensued, four Indians were captured, and the main body chased four miles, but nobody killed. This looked like business. We had a notion to get out and join the sixty soldiers, but upon reflecting that there were four hundred of the Indians, we concluded to go on and join the Indians. Echo Canyon is twenty miles long. It was like a long, smooth, narrow street, with a gradual descending grade, and shut in by enormous perpendicular walls of coarse conglomerate, four hundred feet high in many places, and turreted like medieval castles. This was the most faultless piece of road in the mountains, and the driver said he would let his team out. He did, and if the Pacific Express trains whizzed through there now any faster than we did then in the stagecoach, I envy the passengers the exhilaration of it. We fairly seemed to pick up our wheels and fly, and the mail matter was lifted up free from everything and held in solution. I am not given to exaggeration, and when I say a thing I mean it. However, time presses. At four in the afternoon we arrived on the summit of Big Mountain, fifteen miles from Salt Lake City, when all the world was glorified with the setting sun, and the most stupendous panorama of mountain peaks yet encountered burst on our sight. We looked out upon this sublime spectacle from under the arch of a brilliant rainbow. Even the overland stage-driver stopped his horses and gazed. Half an hour or an hour later we changed horses and took supper with a Mormon destroying angel. Destroying angels, as I understand it, are latter-day saints who are set apart by the church to conduct permanent disappearances of obnoxious citizens. I had heard a deal about these Mormon destroying angels and the dark and bloody deeds they had done, and when I entered this one's house I had my shudder all ready. But alas for all our romances! He was nothing but a loud, profane, offensive old blackguard. He was murderous enough, possibly, to fill the bill of a destroyer. But would you have any kind of an angel devoid of dignity? Could you abide an angel in an unclean shirt and no suspenders? 
Could you respect an angel with a horse laugh and a swagger like a buccaneer? There were other blackguards present, comrades of this one, and there was one person that looked like a gentleman, Heber C. Kimball's son, tall and well-made and thirty years old, perhaps. A lot of slatternly women flitted hither and thither in a hurry with coffee-pots, plates of bread, and other appurtenances to supper, and these were said to be the wives of the angel, or some of them at least. And of course they were, for if they had been hired help, they would not have let an angel from above storm and swear at them as he did, let alone one from the place this one hailed from. This was our first experience of the Western peculiar institution, and it was not very prepossessing. We did not tarry long to observe it, but hurried on to the home of the Latter-day Saints, the stronghold of the prophets, the capital of the only absolute monarch in America, Great Salt Lake City. As the night closed in, we took sanctuary in the Salt Lake House and unpacked our baggage. End of chapter 12 this is chapter thirteen of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain. Chapter thirteen. We had a fine supper of the freshest meats and fowls and vegetables, a great variety and as great abundance. We walked about the streets some afterward and glanced in at shops and stores, and there was fascination in surreptitiously staring at every creature we took to be a Mormon. This was fairyland to us, to all intents and purposes, a land of enchantment and goblins and awful mystery. We felt a curiosity to ask every child how many mothers it had, and if it could tell them apart, and we experienced a thrill every time a dwelling-house door opened and shut as we passed, disclosing a glimpse of human heads and backs and shoulders. For we so longed to have a good satisfying look at a Mormon family in all its comprehensive ampleness, disposed in the customary concentric rings of its home circle. By and by the acting governor of the territory introduced us to other Gentiles, and we spent a sociable hour with them. Gentiles are people who are not Mormons. Our fellow-passenger Bemis took care of himself, during this part of the evening, and did not make an overpowering success of it either, for he came into our room in the hotel about eleven o'clock, full of cheerfulness, and talking loosely, disjointedly, and indiscriminately, and every now and then tugging out a ragged word by the roots that had more hiccups than syllables in it. This, together with his hanging his coat on the floor on one side of a chair, and his vest on the floor on the other side, and piling his pants on the floor just in front of the same chair, and then contemplating the general result with superstitious awe, and finally pronouncing it too many for him, and going to bed with his boots on, led us to fear that something he had eaten had not agreed with him. But we knew afterward that it was something he had been drinking. It was the exclusively Mormon refresher Valley Tan. Valley Tan, or at least one form of Valley Tan, is a kind of whiskey, or first cousin to it, is of Mormon invention, and manufactured only in Utah. Tradition says it is made of imported fire and brimstone. If I remember rightly, no public drinking saloons were allowed in the kingdom by Brigham Young, and no private drinking permitted among the faithful, except they confined themselves to Valley Tan. Next day we strolled about everywhere through the broad, straight, level streets, and enjoyed the pleasant strangeness of a city of fifteen thousand inhabitants, with no loafers perceptible in it, and no visible drunkards or noisy people. A limpid stream, rippling and dancing through every street in place of a filthy gutter. Block after block of trim dwellings, built of frame and sunburned brick, a great thriving orchard and garden behind every one of them, apparently, branches from the street streaming, winding, and sparkling among the garden beds and fruit trees, and a grand general air of neatness, repair, thrift, and comfort, around and about and over the whole. And everywhere were workshops, factories, and all manner of industries, 
and intent faces and busy hands were to be seen wherever one looked, and in one's ears was the ceaseless clink of hammers, the buzz of trade, and the contented hum of drums and flywheels. The armorial crest of my own state consisted of two dissolute bears holding up the head of a dead-and-gone cask between them, and making the pertinent remark, United we stand, hick, divided we fall. It was always too figurative for the author of this book. But the Mormon crest was easy, and it was simple, unostentatious, and fitted like a glove. It was a representation of a golden beehive, with the bees all at work. The city lies in the edge of a level plain as broad as the state of Connecticut, and crouches close down to the ground under a curving wall of mighty mountains, whose heads are hidden in the clouds, and whose shoulders bear relics of the snows of winter all the summer long. Seen from one of these dizzy heights, twelve or fifteen miles off, Great Salt Lake City is toned down and diminished till it is suggestive of a child's toy village reposing under the majestic protection of the Chinese wall. On some of those mountains to the southwest it had been raining every day for two weeks, but not a drop had fallen in the city, and on hot days in late spring and early autumn the citizens could quit fanning and growling and go out and cool off by looking at the luxury of a glorious snowstorm going on in the mountains. They could enjoy it at a distance in those seasons every day, though no snow would fall in their streets or anywhere near them. Salt Lake City was healthy, an extremely healthy city. They declared there was only one physician in the place, and he was arrested every week regularly, and held to answer under the Vagrant Act for having no visible means of support. They always give you a good substantial article of truth in Salt Lake, and good measure and good weight, too. Very often, if you wished to weigh one of their airiest little commonplace statements, you would want the hay scales. We desired to visit the famous Inland Sea, the American Dead Sea, the great Salt Lake, seventeen miles horseback from the city, for we had dreamed about it, and thought about it, and talked about it, and yearned to see it all the first part of our trip, but now, when it was only arm's length away, it had suddenly lost nearly every bit of its interest, and so we put it off, in a sort of general way, till next day, and that was the last we ever thought of it. We dined with some hospitable Gentiles, and visited the foundation of the prodigious temple, and talked long with that shrewd Connecticut Yankee, Heber C. Kimball, since deceased, a saint of high degree, and a mighty man of commerce. We saw the Tithing House, and the Lion House, and I do not know or remember how many more church and government buildings of various kinds and curious names. We flitted hither and thither, and enjoyed every hour and picked up a great deal of useful information and entertaining nonsense, and went to bed at night satisfied. The second day we made the acquaintance of Mr. Street, since deceased, and put on white shirts and went and paid a state visit to the King. He seemed a quiet, kindly, easy-mannered, dignified, self-possessed old gentleman of fifty-five or sixty, and had a gentle craft in his eye that probably belonged there. He was very simply dressed, and was just taking off a straw hat as we entered. He talked about Utah, and the Indians, and Nevada, and general American matters and questions with our secretary, and certain government officials who came with us. But he never paid any attention to me, notwithstanding I made several attempts to draw him out on federal politics and his high-handed attitude toward Congress. I thought some of the things I said were rather fine. but. He merely looked around at me, at distant intervals, something as I have seen a benignant old cat look around to see which kitten was meddling with her tail. By and by I subsided into an indignant silence, and so sat until the end, hot and flushed, and execrating him in my heart for an ignorant savage. But he was calm. His conversation with those gentlemen flowed on as sweetly and peacefully and musically as any summer brook. When the audience was ended, and we were retiring from the presence, he put his hand on my head, beamed down on me in an admiring way, and said to my brother, "'Ah, your child, I presume, boy or girl?' End of chapter 13 This is chapter 14 of Roughing It.
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain. Chapter 14. Mr. Street was very busy with his telegraphic matters, and considering that he had eight or nine hundred miles of rugged, snowy, uninhabited mountains and waterless, treeless, melancholy deserts to traverse with his wire, it was natural and needful that he should be as busy as possible. He could not go comfortably along and cut his poles by the roadside either, but they had to be hauled by ox teams across those exhausting deserts and it was two days' journey from water to water, in one or two of them. Mr. Street's contract was a vast work, every way one looked at it. And yet, to comprehend what the vague words, eight hundred miles of rugged mountains and dismal deserts, mean, one must go over the ground in person. Pen and ink descriptions cannot convey the dreary reality to the reader. And after all, Mr. S.'s mightiest difficulty turned out to be one which he had never taken into account at all. Unto Mormons he had sublet the hardest and heaviest half of his great undertaking, and all of a sudden they concluded that they were going to make little or nothing, and so they tranquilly threw their poles overboard in mountain or desert, just as it happened when they took the notion, and drove home and went about their customary business. They were under written contract to Mr. Street, but they did not care anything for that. They said they would admire to see a Gentile force a Mormon to fulfill a losing contract in Utah, and they made themselves very merry over the matter. Street said, for it was he that told us these things, I was in dismay. I was under heavy bonds to complete my contract in a given time, and this disaster looked very much like ruin. It was an astounding thing. It was such a wholly unlooked-for difficulty that I was entirely nonplussed. I am a business man, have always been a business man, do not know anything but business, and so you can imagine how like being struck by lightning it was to find myself in a country where written contracts were worthless. That main security, that sheet-anchor and absolute necessity of business. My confidence left me. There was no use in making new contracts, that was plain. I talked with first one prominent citizen, and then another. They all sympathized with me, first-rate, but they did not know how to help me. But at last a Gentile said, Go to Brigham Young. These small fry cannot do you any good. I did not think much of the idea, for if the law could not help me, what could an individual do who had not even anything to do with either making the laws or executing them? He might be a very good patriarch of a church and preacher in its tabernacle, but something sterner than religion and moral suasion was needed to handle a hundred refractory half-civilized subcontractors. But what was a man to do? I thought if Mr. Young could not do anything else, he might probably be able to give me some advice and a valuable hint or two, and so I went straight to him and laid the whole case before him. He said very little, but he showed strong interest all the way through. He examined all the papers in detail and whenever there seemed anything like a hitch, either in the papers or my statement, he would go back and take up the thread and follow it patiently out to an intelligent and satisfactory result. Then he made a list of the contractor's names. Finally he said, Mr. Street, this is all perfectly plain. These contracts are strictly and legally drawn, and are duly signed and certified. These men manifestly entered into them with their eyes open. I see no fault or flaw anywhere. Then Mr. Young turned to a man waiting at the other end of the room and said, Take this list of names to so-and-so, and tell him to have these men here at such and such an hour. They were there to the minute. So was I. Mr. Young asked them a number of questions, and their answers made my statement good. Then he said to them, You signed these contracts, and assumed these obligations of your own free will and accord? Yes. Then carry them out to the letter, if it makes paupers of you. Go. And they did go, too. They are strung across the deserts now, working like bees, and I never hear a word out of them. There is a batch of governors and judges and other officials here, shipped from Washington, and they maintain the semblance of a republican form of government, but the petrified truth is that Utah is an absolute monarchy, and Brigham Young is king. 
Mr. Street was a fine man, and I believe his story. I knew him well during several years afterward in San Francisco. Our stay in Salt Lake City amounted to only two days, and therefore we had no time to make the customary inquisition into the workings of polygamy, and get up the usual statistics and deductions preparatory to calling the attention of the nation at large once more to the matter. I had the will to do it. With the gushing self-sufficiency of youth I was feverish to plunge in headlong and achieve a great reform here, until I saw the Mormon women. Then I was touched. My heart was wiser than my head. It warmed toward these poor ungainly and pathetically homely creatures, and as I turned to hide the generous moisture in my eyes, I said, No, the man that marries one of them has done an act of Christian charity which entitles him to the kindly applause of mankind, not their harsh censure, and the man that marries sixty of them has done a deed of open-handed generosity so sublime that the nations should stand uncovered in his presence and worship in silence. For a brief sketch of Mormon history and the noted Mountain Meadow Massacre, see Appendices A and B. End of chapter 14 This is chapter 15 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain Chapter 15 it is a luscious country for thrilling evening stories about assassinations of intractable Gentiles. I cannot easily conceive of anything more cozy than the night in Salt Lake which we spent in a Gentile den, smoking pipes and listening to tales of how Burton galloped in among the pleading and defenseless Morrisites and shot them down, men and women, like so many dogs and how Bill Hickman, a destroying angel, shot Drown and Arnold dead, for bringing suit against him for a debt, and how Porter Rockwell did this and that dreadful thing, and how heedless people often come to Utah and make remarks about Brigham, or polygamy, or some other sacred matter, and the very next morning at daylight such parties are sure to be found lying up some back alley, contentedly waiting for the hearse. And the next most interesting thing is to sit and listen to these Gentiles talk about polygamy, and how some portly old frog of an elder or a bishop marries a girl, likes her, marries her sister, likes her, marries another sister, likes her, takes another, likes her, marries her mother, likes her, marries her father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and then comes back hungry and asks for more and how the pert young thing of eleven will chance to be the favorite wife and her own venerable grandmother have to rank away down toward D4 in their mutual husband's esteem, and have to sleep in the kitchen as like as not, and how this dreadful sort of thing, this hiving together in one foul nest of mother and daughters, and the making a young daughter superior to her own mother in rank and authority, are things which Mormon women submit to because their religion teaches them that the more wives a man has on earth, and the more children he rears, the higher place they will all have in the world to come, and the warmer, maybe, though they do not seem to say anything about that. According to these Gentile friends of ours, Brigham Young's harem contains twenty or thirty wives, they said that some of them had grown old and gone out of active service, but were comfortably housed and cared for in the Henry, or the Lion House, as it is strangely named. Along with each wife were her children, fifty altogether. The house was perfectly quiet and orderly when the children were still. They all took their meals in one room, and a happy and homelike sight it was pronounced to be. None of our party got an opportunity to take dinner with Mr. Young, but a Gentile by the name of Johnson professed to have enjoyed a sociable breakfast in the Lion House. He gave a preposterous account of the calling of the roll, and other preliminaries, and the carnage that ensued when the buckwheat cakes came in, but he embellished rather too much. He said that Mr. Young told him several smart sayings of certain of his two-year-olds, observing with some pride that for many years he had been the heaviest contributor in that line to one of the Eastern magazines and then he wanted to show Mr. Johnson one of the pets that had said the last good thing, but he could not find the child. 
He searched the faces of the children in detail, but could not decide which one it was. Finally he gave it up with a sigh, and said, I thought I would know the little cub again, but I don't. Mr. Johnson said further that Mr. Young observed that life was a sad, sad thing, because the joy of every new marriage a man contracted was so apt to be blighted by the inopportune funeral of a less recent bride. And, Mr. Johnson said, that while he and Mr. Young were pleasantly conversing in private, one of the Mrs. Youngs came in and demanded a breastpin, remarking that she had found out that he had been giving a breastpin to number six, and she, for one, did not propose to let this partiality go on without making a satisfactory amount of trouble about it. Mr. Young reminded her that there was a stranger present. Mrs. Young said that if the state of things inside the house was not agreeable to the stranger, he could find room outside. Mr. Young promised the breastpin, and she went away. But in a minute or two another Mrs. Young came in and demanded a breastpin. Mr. Young began a remonstrance, but Mrs. Young cut him short. She said number six had got one, and number eleven was promised one, and it was no use for him to try to impose on her. She hoped she knew her rights. He gave his promise, and she went. And presently three Mrs. Youngs entered in a body, and opened on their husband a tempest of tears, abuse, and entreaty. They had heard all about number six, number eleven, and number fourteen. Three more breastpins were promised. They were hardly gone when nine more Mrs. Youngs filed into the presence, and a new tempest burst forth, and raged round about the prophet and his guest. Nine breastpins were promised, and the weird sisters filed out again. And in came eleven more, weeping, and wailing, and gnashing their teeth. Eleven promised breastpins purchased peace once more. "'That is a specimen,' said Mr. Young. "'You see how it is. You see what a life I lead. A man can't be wise all the time. In a heedless moment I gave my darling number six, excuse my calling her thus, as her other name has escaped me for the moment, a breastpin. It was only worth twenty-five dollars, that is, apparently that was its whole cost, but its ultimate cost was inevitably bound to be a good deal more. You yourself have seen it climb up to six hundred and fifty dollars, and, alas, even that is not the end, for I have wives all over this territory of Utah. I have dozens of wives whose numbers, even, I do not know without looking in the family Bible. They are scattered far and wide among the mountains and valleys of my realm. And, mark you, every solitary one of them will hear of this wretched breastpin, and every last one of them will have one or die. Number six's breastpin will cost me twenty-five hundred dollars before I see the end of it, and these creatures will compare these pins together, and if one is a shade finer than the rest, they will all be thrown on my hands, and I will have to order a new lot to keep peace in the family. Sir, you probably did not know it, but all the time you were present with my children, your every movement was watched by vigilant servitors of mine. If you had offered to give a child a dime, or a stick of candy, or any trifle of the kind, you would have been snatched out of the house instantly, provided it could be done before your gift left your hand. Otherwise it would be absolutely necessary for you to make an exactly similar gift to all my children and knowing by experience the importance of the thing, I would have stood by and seen to it myself that you did it, and did it thoroughly. Once a gentleman gave one of my children a tin whistle, a veritable invention of Satan, sir, and one which I have an unspeakable horror of, and so would you if you had eighty or ninety children in your house. But the deed was done, the man escaped. I knew what the result was going to be, and I thirsted for vengeance. I ordered out a flock of destroying angels, and they hunted the man far into the fastnesses of the Nevada mountains. But they never caught him. I am not cruel, sir. I am not vindictive, except when sorely outraged. But if I had caught him, sir, so help me Joseph Smith, I would have locked him into the nursery till the brats whistled him to death. By the slaughtered body of St. Parley Pratt, whom God assail, there was never anything on this earth like it. I knew who gave the whistle to the child, but I could not make those jealous mothers believe me. They believed I did it, and the result was just what any man of reflection could have foreseen. I had to order a hundred and ten whistles. I think we had a hundred and ten children in the house then, but some of them are off at college now. 
I had to order a hundred and ten of those shrieking things, and I wish I may never speak another word if we didn't have to talk on our fingers entirely, from that time forth until the children got tired of the whistles. And if ever another man gives a whistle to a child of mine, and I get my hands on him, I will hang him higher than Haman. That is the word with the bark on it. Shade of Nephi. You don't know anything about married life. I am rich, and everybody knows it. I am benevolent, and everybody takes advantage of it. I have a strong fatherly instinct, and all the foundlings are foisted on me. Every time a woman wants to do well by her darling, she puzzles her brain to cipher out some scheme for getting it into my hands. Why, sir, a woman came here once, with a child of a curious, lifeless sort of complexion, and so had the woman, and swore that the child was mine and she my wife, that I had married her at such and such a time, in such and such a place, but she had forgotten her number, and of course I could not remember her name. Well, sir, she called my attention to the fact that the child looked like me, and really it did seem to resemble me, a common thing in the territory, and, to cut the story short, I put it in my nursery, and she left. And by the ghost of Orson Hyde, when they came to wash the paint off that child, it was an injun. Bless my soul, you don't know anything about married life. It is a perfect dog's life, sir, a perfect dog's life. You can't economize. It isn't possible. I have tried keeping one set of bridal attire for all occasions, but it is of no use. First you'll marry a combination of calico and consumption that's as thin as a rail, and next you'll get a creature that's nothing more than a dropsy in disguise, and then you've got to eke out that bridal dress with an old balloon. That is the way it goes. And think of the wash-bill, excuse these tears, nine hundred and eighty-four pieces a week. No, sir, there is no such a thing as economy in a family like mine. Why, just the one item of cradles, think of it and vermifuge, soothing syrup, teething rings, and papa's watches for the babies to play with, and things to scratch the furniture with, and lucifer matches for them to eat, and pieces of glass to cut themselves with. The item of glass alone would support your family, I venture to say, sir. Let me scrimp and squeeze all I can. I still can't get ahead as fast as I feel I ought to, with my opportunities. Bless you, sir, at a time when I had seventy-two wives in this house, I groaned under the pressure of keeping thousands of dollars tied up in seventy-two bedsteads when the money ought to have been out at interest. And I just sold out the whole stock, sir, at a sacrifice, and built a bedstead seven feet long and ninety-six feet wide. But it was a failure, sir. I could not sleep. It appeared to me that the whole seventy-two women snored at once, the roar was deafening. And then the danger of it. That was what I was looking at. They would all draw in their breath at once, and you could actually see the walls of the house suck in. And then they would all exhale their breath at once, and you could see the walls swell out and strain, and hear the rafters crack and the shingles grind together. My friend, take an old man's advice, and don't encumber yourself with a large family. Mind, I tell you, don't do it. In a small family, and in a small family only, you will find that comfort and that peace of mind which are the best at last of the blessings this world is able to afford us, and for the lack of which no accumulation of wealth and no acquisition of fame, power, and greatness can ever compensate us. Take my word for it, ten or eleven wives is all you need. Never go over it. Some instinct or other made me set this Johnson down as being unreliable and yet he was a very entertaining person, and I doubt if some of the information he gave us could have been acquired from any other source. He was a pleasant contrast to those reticent Mormons. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of Roughing It This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain Chapter 16 All men have heard of the Mormon Bible, but few except the elect have seen it, or at least taken the trouble to read it. I brought away a copy from Salt Lake. The book is a curiosity to me. It is such a pretentious affair, and yet so slow, so sleepy, 
such an insipid mess of inspiration. It is chloroform in print. If Joseph Smith composed this book, the act was a miracle. Keeping awake while he did it was, at any rate. If he, according to tradition, merely translated it from certain ancient and mysteriously engraved plates of copper, which he declares he found under a stone, in an out-of-the-way locality, the work of translating was equally a miracle for the same reason. The book seems to be merely a prosy detail of imaginary history with the Old Testament for a model, followed by a tedious plagiarism of the New Testament. The author labored to give his words and phrases the quaint, old-fashioned sound and structure of our King James translation of the Scriptures, and the result is a mongrel, half-modern glibness, and half-ancient simplicity and gravity. The latter is awkward and constrained, the former natural, but grotesque by the contrast. Whenever he found his speech growing too modern, which was about every sentence or two, he ladled in a few such scriptural phrases as exceeding sore, and it came to pass, etc., and made things satisfactory again. And it came to pass was his pet. If he had left that out, his Bible would have been only a pamphlet. The title page reads as follows. The Book of Mormon, an account written by the hand of Mormon, upon plates taken from the plates of Nephi. Wherefore it is an abridgment of the record of the people of Nephi, and also of Lamanites, written to the Lamanites who are remnant of the house of Israel, and also to Jew and Gentile, written by way of commandment, and also by the spirit of prophecy and of revelation, written and sealed up and hid up unto the Lord, that they might not be destroyed, to come forth by the gift and power of God unto the interpretation thereof, sealed by the hand of Moroni, and hid up unto the Lord, to come forth in due time by the way of Gentile, the interpretation thereof by the gift of God, an abridgment taken from the book of Ether also, which is a record of the people of Jared, who were scattered at the time the Lord confounded the language of the people when they were building a tower to get to heaven. Hid up is good, and so is wherefore, though why wherefore? Any other word would have answered as well, though in truth it would not have sounded so scriptural. Next comes the testimony of three witnesses. Be it known unto all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people unto whom this work shall come, that we, through the grace of God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, have seen the plates which contain this record, which is a record of the people of Nephi, and also of the Lamanites, their brethren, and also of the people of Jared, who came from the tower of which hath been spoken. And we also know that they have been translated by the gift and power of God, for His voice hath declared it unto us. Wherefore we know of a surety that the work is true. And we also testify that we have seen the engravings which are upon the plates, and they have been shown unto us by the power of God, and not of man. And we declare with words of soberness that an angel of God came down from heaven, and he brought and laid it before our eyes, that we beheld and saw the plates, and the engravings thereon. And we know that it is by the grace of God the Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, that we beheld and bear record that these things are true, and it is marvellous in our eyes. Nevertheless the voice of the Lord commanded us that we should bear record of it. Wherefore, to be obedient unto the commandments of God, we bear testimony of these things. And we know that if we are faithful in Christ, we shall rid our garments of the blood of all men, and be found spotless before the judgment seat of Christ, and shall dwell with Him eternally in the heavens. And the honour be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, which is one God. Amen. Oliver Cowdery David Whitmer, Martin Harris. Some people have to have a world of evidence before they can come anywhere in the neighborhood of believing anything. But for me, when a man tells me that he has seen the engravings which are upon the plates, and not only that, but an angel was there at the time, and saw him see them, and probably took his receipt for it, I am very far on the road to conviction, no matter whether I ever heard of that man before or not and even if I do not know the name of the angel, or his nationality either. Next is this. And also the testimony of eight witnesses, 
be it known unto all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people unto whom this work shall come, that Joseph Smith, Jr., the translator of this work, has shown unto us the plates of which hath been spoken, which hath the appearance of gold. And as many of the leaves as the said Smith has translated, we did handle with our hands, and we also saw the engravings thereon, all of which has the appearance of ancient work, and of curious workmanship. And this we bear record with words of soberness, that the said Smith has shown unto us, for we have seen and hefted, and know of a surety that the said Smith has got the plates of which we have spoken. And we give our names unto the world, to witness unto the world that which we have seen, and we lie not, God bearing witness of it. Christian Whitmer, Jacob Whitmer, Peter Whitmer, Jr., John Whitmer, Hiram Page, Joseph Smith, Sr., Hiram Smith, Samuel H. Smith. And when I am far on the road to conviction, and eight men, be they grammatical or otherwise, come forward and tell me that they have seen the plates too, and not only seen those plates, but hefted them, I am convinced. I could not feel more satisfied and at rest if the entire Whitmer family had testified. The Mormon Bible consists of fifteen books, being the books of Jacob, Enos, Jerom, Omni, Mosiah, Zenith. Alma, Helaman, Ether, Moroni, two books of Mormon, and three of Nephi. In the first book of Nephi is a plagiarism of the Old Testament, which gives an account of the exodus from Jerusalem of the children of Lehi, and it goes on to tell of their wanderings in the wilderness during eight years, and their supernatural protection by one of their number, a party by the name of Nephi. They finally reached the land of Bountiful and camped by the sea. After they had remained there, for the space of many days, which is more scriptural than definite, Nephi was commanded from on high to build a ship wherein to carry the people across the waters. He travestied Noah's ark, but he obeyed orders in the matter of the plan. He finished the ship in a single day, while his brethren stood by and made fun of it, and of him too saying, Our brother is a fool, for he thinketh that he can build a ship. They did not wait for the timbers to dry, but the whole tribe or nation sailed the next day. Then a bit of genuine nature cropped up, and is revealed by outspoken Nephi with scriptural frankness. They all got on a spree. They, and also their wives, began to make themselves merry, insomuch that they began to dance, and to sing, and to speak with much rudeness. Yea, they were lifted up unto exceeding rudeness. Nephi tried to stop these scandalous proceedings, but they tied him neck and heels, and went on with their lark. But observe how Nephi the prophet circumvented them by the aid of the invisible powers. And it came to pass that after they had bound me in so much that I could not move, the compass which had been prepared of the Lord did cease to work, wherefore they knew not whither they should steer the ship, insomuch that there arose a great storm, yea, a great and terrible tempest, and we were driven back unto the waters for the space of three days, and they began to be frightened exceedingly, lest they should be drowned in the sea. Nevertheless they did not loose me. And on the fourth day, which we had been driven back, the tempest began to be exceeding sore and it came to pass that we were about to be swallowed up in the depths of the sea. Then they untied him. And it came to pass, after they had loosed me, behold, I took the compass, and it did work whither I desired it. And it came to pass that I prayed unto the Lord, and after I had prayed, the winds did cease, and the storm did cease, and there was a great calm. Equipped with their compass, these ancients appeared to have had the advantage of Noah, their voyage was toward a promised land, the only name they give it. They reached it in safety. Polygamy is a recent feature in the Mormon religion, and was added by Brigham Young after Joseph Smith's death. Before that it was regarded as an abomination. This verse from the Mormon Bible occurs in chapter 2 of the book of Jacob. For behold, thus saith the Lord, this people begin to wax in iniquity. They understand not the scripture for they seek to excuse themselves in committing whoredoms, because of the things which were written concerning David and Solomon his son. Behold, David and Solomon truly had many wives and concubines, 
which thing was abominable before me, saith the Lord. Wherefore, thus saith the Lord, I have led this people forth out of the land of Jerusalem by the power of mine arm, that I might raise up unto me a righteous branch from the fruit of the loins of Joseph. Wherefore I, the Lord God, will no suffer that this people shall do like unto them of old. However, the project failed, or at least the modern Mormon end of it, for Brigham suffers it. This verse is from the same chapter. Behold, the Lamanites, your brethren, whom ye hate, because of their filthiness, and the cursings which hath come upon their skins, are more righteous than you, for they have not forgotten the commandment of the Lord, which was given unto our fathers, that they should have, save it were one wife, and concubines they should have none. The following verse, from chapter 9 of the book of Nephi, appears to contain information not familiar to everybody. And now it came to pass that when Jesus had ascended into heaven, the multitude did disperse, and every man did take his wife and his children, and did return to his own home. And it came to pass that on the morrow, when the multitude was gathered together, behold, Nephi and his brother, whom he had raised from the dead, whose name was Timothy, and also his son, whose name was Jonas, and also Methoni, and Methoniha, his brother, and Cuman, and Cumanenhi, and Jeremiah, and Shamnon, and Jonas, and Zedekiah, and Isaiah. Now these were the names of the disciples whom Jesus had chosen. In order that the reader may observe how much more grandeur and picturesqueness, as seen by these Mormon twelve, accompanied on of the tenderest episodes in the life of our Saviour than other eyes seem to have been aware of, I quote the following from the same book, Nephi. And it came to pass that Jesus spake unto them, and bade them arise, and they arose from the earth, and he said unto them, Blessed are ye because of your faith, and now, behold, my joy is full. And when he had said these words, he wept, and the multitude bare record of it. And he took their little children, one by one, and blessed them, and prayed unto the Father for them. And when he had done this, he wept again, and he spake unto the multitude, and saith unto them, Behold your little ones! And as they looked to behold, they cast their eyes toward heaven, and they saw the heavens open, and they saw angels descending out of heaven, as it were, in the midst of fire. And they came down, and encircled those little ones about, and they were encircled about with fire. And the angels did minister unto them, and the multitude did see, and hear, and bear record. And they know that their record is true, for they all of them did see, and hear, every man for himself. And they were in number about two thousand and five hundred souls, and they did consist of men, women, and children. And what else would they be likely to consist of? The Book of Ether is an incomprehensible medley of its history, much of it relating to battles and sieges among peoples whom the reader has possibly never heard of, and who inhabited a country which is not set down in the geography. There was a king with the remarkable name of Coriantumr, and he warred with Sharad, and Lib, and Shiz, and others, in the plains of Heshlan, and the valley of Gilgal, and the wilderness of Akish and the land of Moron, and the plains of Agosh, and Ogath, and Ramah, and the land of Korihor, and the hill of Comnor, by the waters of Ripliancum, etc., etc., etc. And it came to pass, after a deal of fighting, that Coriumtmer, upon making calculation of his losses, found that there had been slain two millions of mighty men, and also their wives and their children, say five million or six million in all, and he began to sorrow in his heart. Unquestionably it was time. So he wrote to Shiz, asking a cessation of hostilities, and offering to give up his kingdom to save his people. Shiz declined, except upon condition that Coriumtumer would come and let him cut his head off first, a thing which Coriumtumer would not do. Then there was more fighting for a season, then four years were devoted to gathering the forces for a final struggle after which ensued a battle, which, I take it, is the most remarkable set forth in history, except, perhaps, that of the Kilkenny Cats, which it resembles in some respects. This is the account of the gathering and the battle. 7. And it came to pass that they did gather together all the people upon all the face of the land, who had not been slain, save it was Ether. And it came to pass that Ether did behold all the doings of the people, 
and he beheld that the people who were from Coriumtumer were gathered together to the army of Coriumtumer, and the people who were for Shiz were gathered together to the army of Shiz, wherefore there were for the space of four years gathering together the people, that they might get all who were upon the face of the land, and that they might receive all the strength which it was possible that they could receive. And it came to pass that when they were all gathered together, every one to the army which he would, with their wives and their children, both men, women, and children being armed with weapons of war, having shields and breastplates and headplates, and being clothed after the manner of war, they did march forth one against the other to battle, and they fought all that day, and conquered not. And it came to pass that when it was night they were weary, and retired to their camps, and after they had retired to their camps they took up a howling and a lamentation for the loss of the slain of their people, and so great were their cries, their howlings and lamentations, that it did rend the air exceedingly. And it came to pass that on the morrow they did go again to battle, and great and terrible was that day. Nevertheless they conquered not, and when the night came again, they did rend the air with their cries, and their howlings, and their mournings, for the loss of the slain of their people. 8. And it came to pass that Coriumptmer wrote again an epistle unto Shiz, desiring that he would not come again to battle, but that he would take the kingdom, and spare the lives of the people. But behold! The Spirit of the Lord had ceased striving with them, and Satan had full power over the hearts of the people, for they were given up unto the hardness of their hearts, and the blindness of their minds, that they might be destroyed. Wherefore they went again to battle. And it came to pass that they fought all that day, and when the night came, they slept upon their swords. And on the morrow they fought even until the night came, and when the night came, they were drunken with anger, even as a man who is drunken with wine. And they slept again upon their swords, and on the morrow they fought again. And when the night came, they had all fallen by the sword, save it were fifty and two of the people of Coriumter, and sixty and nine of the people of Shiz. And it came to pass that they slept upon their swords that night, and on the morrow they fought again, and they contended in their mights with their swords, and with their shields, all that day. And when the night came, there were thirty and two of the people of Shiz, and twenty and seven of the people of Coriumter. 9. And it came to pass that they ate and slept, and prepared for death on the morrow. And they were large and mighty men, as to the strength of the men. And it came to pass that they fought for the space of three hours, and they fainted with the loss of blood. And it came to pass that when the men of Coriumter had received sufficient strength that they could walk, they were about to flee for their lives. But behold, Shiz arose, and also his men, and he swore in his wrath that he would slay Coriumter, or he would perish by the sword. Wherefore he did pursue them, and on the morrow he did overtake them, and they fought again with the sword. And it came to pass that when they had all fallen by the sword, save it were Coriumter and Shiz, behold, Shiz had fainted with loss of blood. And it came to pass that when Coriumter had leaned upon his sword, that he rested a little, he smote off the head of Shiz, and it came to pass that after he had smote off the head of Shiz, that Shiz raised upon his hands, and fell. And after that he had struggled for breath, he died. And it came to pass that Coriumter fell to the earth, and became as if he had no life. And the Lord spake unto Ether, and said unto him, Go forth. And he went forth, and beheld that the words of the Lord had all been fulfilled, and he finished his record and the hundredth part I have not written. It seems a pity he did not finish, for after all his dreary former chapters of commonplace, he stopped just as he was in danger of becoming interesting. The Mormon Bible is rather stupid and tiresome to read, but there is nothing vicious in its teachings. Its code of morals is unobjectionable. It is smooched, Milton, from the New Testament, and no credit given. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of Roughing It This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain Chapter 17 At the end of our two days' sojourn, we left Great Salt Lake City hearty and well-fed and happy, physically superb, but not so very much wiser. 
as regards the Mormon question, than we were when we arrived, perhaps. We had a deal more information than we had before, of course, but we did not know what portion of it was reliable and what was not, for it all came from acquaintances of a day, strangers, strictly speaking. We were told, for instance, that the dreadful Mountain Meadows Massacre was the work of the Indians entirely, and that the Gentiles had meanly tried to fasten it upon the Mormons. We were told, likewise, that the Indians were to blame partly, and partly the Mormons. And we were told, likewise, and just as positively, that the Mormons were almost, if not wholly, and completely responsible for that most treacherous and pitiless butchery. We got the story in all these different shapes, but it was not till several years afterward that Mrs. Waite's book, The Mormon Prophet, came out with Judge Cradlebaugh's trial of the accused parties in it, and revealed the truth, that the latter version was the correct one, and that the Mormons were the assassins. All our information had three sides to it, and so I gave up the idea that I could settle the Mormon question in two days. Still, I have seen newspaper correspondents do it in one. I left Great Salt Lake a good deal confused as to what state of things existed there, and sometimes even questioning in my own mind whether a state of things existed there at all or not. But presently I remembered, with a lightening sense of relief, that we had learned two or three trivial things there which we could be certain of, and so the two days were not wholly lost. For instance, we had learned that we were at last in a pioneer land, in absolute and tangible reality. The high prices charged for trifles were eloquent of high freights and bewildering distances of freightage. In the East, in those days, the smallest money denomination was a penny, and it represented the smallest purchasable quantity of any commodity. West of Cincinnati, the smallest coin in use was the silver five-cent piece, and no smaller quantity of an article could be bought than five cents worth. In Overland City the lowest coin appeared to be the ten-cent piece, but in Salt Lake there did not seem to be any money in circulation smaller than a quarter, or any smaller quantity purchasable of any commodity than twenty-five cents worth. We had always been used to half-dimes and five cents worth, as the minimum of financial negotiations, but in Salt Lake, if one wanted a cigar, it was a quarter. If he wanted a chalk pipe, it was a quarter. If he wanted a peach, or a candle, or a newspaper, or a shave, or a little Gentile whiskey to rub on his corns to arrest indigestion and keep him from having the toothache, twenty-five cents was the price, every time. When we looked at the shot-bag of silver now and then, we seemed to be wasting our substance in riotous living. But if we referred to the expense account, we could see that we had not been doing anything of the kind. But people easily get reconciled to big money and big prices, and fond and vain of both. It is a descent to little coins and cheap prices that is hardest to bear and slowest to take hold upon one's toleration. After a month's acquaintance with the twenty-five-cent minimum, the average human being is ready to blush every time he thinks of his despicable five-cent days. How sunburnt with blushes I used to get in gaudy Nevada every time I thought of my first financial experience in Salt Lake. It was on this wise, which is a favorite expression of great authors, and a very neat one, too, but I never hear anybody say on this wise when they are talking. A young half-breed, with a complexion like a yellow jacket, asked me if I would have my shoes blacked. It was at the Salt Lake House the morning after we arrived. I said yes, and he blacked them. Then I handed him a silver five-cent piece, with a benevolent air of a person who is conferring wealth and blessedness upon poverty and suffering. The yellow jacket took it with what I judged to be suppressed emotion, and laid it reverently down in the middle of his broad palm. Then he began to contemplate it, much as a philosopher contemplates a gnat's ear in the ample field of his microscope. Several mountaineers, teamsters, stage-drivers, etc., drew near and dropped into the tableau, and fell to surveying the money with that attractive indifference to formality which is noticeable in the hardy pioneer. Presently the yellow jacket handed the half-dime back to me, and told me I ought to keep my money in my pocket-book instead of in my soul, 
and then I wouldn't get it cramped and shriveled up so. What a roar of vulgar laughter there was! I destroyed the mongrel reptile on the spot, but I smiled, and smiled all the time I was detaching his scalp, for the remark he made was good for an injun. Yes, we had learned in Salt Lake to be charged great prices without letting the inward shudder appear on the surface, for even already we had overheard and noted the tenor of conversations among drivers, conductors, and hostlers, and finally among citizens of Salt Lake, until we were well aware that these superior beings despised emigrants. We permitted no tell-tale shudders and winces in our countenances, for we wanted to seem pioneers, or Mormons, half-breeds, teamsters, stage-drivers, mountain-meadow assassins, anything in the world that the Plains and Utah respected and admired. But we were wretchedly ashamed of being emigrants, and sorry enough that we had white shirts and could not swear in the presence of ladies without looking the other way. And many a time in Nevada afterwards we had occasion to remember with humiliation that we were emigrants, and consequently a low and inferior sort of creatures. Perhaps the reader has visited Utah, Nevada, or California, even in these latter days, and while communing with himself upon the sorrowful banishment of these countries from what he considers the world, has had his wings clipped by finding that he is the one to be pitied, and that there are entire populations around him ready and willing to do it for him, yea, who are complacently doing it for him already, wherever he steps his foot. Poor thing they are making fun of his hat, and the cut of his New York coat, and his conscientiousness about his grammar and his feeble profanity, and his consumingly ludicrous ignorance of oars, shafts, tunnels, and other things which he never saw before, and never felt enough interest in to read about, and all the time that he is thinking what a sad fate it is to be exiled to that far country, that lonely land, the citizens around him are looking down on him with a blighting compassion because he is an emigrant, instead of that proudest and blessedest creature that exists on all the earth, a forty-niner. The accustomed coach-life began again now, and by midnight it almost seemed as if we never had been out of our snuggery among the mail-sacks at all. We had made one alteration, however. We had provided enough bread, boiled ham, and hard-boiled eggs to last double the six hundred miles of staging we had still to do and it was comfort in those succeeding days to sit up and contemplate the majestic panorama of mountains and valleys spread out below us, and eat ham and hard-boiled eggs, while our spiritual natures reveled alternately in rainbows, thunderstorms, and peerless sunsets. Nothing helps scenery like ham and eggs. Ham and eggs, and after these a pipe, an old, rank, delicious pipe. Ham and eggs and scenery a downgrade, a flying coach, a fragrant pipe, and a contented heart. These make happiness. It is what all the ages have struggled for. End of chapter 17 This is chapter 18 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain Chapter 18 At eight in the morning we reached the remnant and ruin of what had been the important military station of Camp Floyd, some forty-five or fifty miles from Salt Lake City. At four p.m. we had doubled our distance, and were ninety or a hundred miles from Salt Lake. And now we entered upon one of that species of deserts whose concentrated hideousness shames the diffused and diluted horrors of Sahara an alkali desert. For sixty-eight miles there was but one break in it. I do not remember that this was really a break. Indeed, it seems to me that it was nothing but a watering depot in the midst of the stretch of sixty-eight miles. If my memory serves me, there was no well or spring at this place, but the water was hauled there by mule and ox teams from the further side of the desert. There was a stage station there, it was forty-five miles from the beginning of the desert, and twenty-three from the end of it. We ploughed and dragged and groped along the whole livelong night, 
and at the end of this uncomfortable twelve hours we finished the forty-five-mile part of the desert, and got to the stage station where the imported water was. The sun was just rising. It was easy enough to cross the desert in the night while we were asleep, and it was pleasant to reflect in the morning that we in actual person had encountered an absolute desert, and could always speak knowingly of deserts in presence of the ignorant thenceforth. And it was pleasant also to reflect that this was not an obscure back-country desert, but a very celebrated one, the metropolis itself, as you may say. All this was very well and very comfortable and satisfactory, but now we were to cross a desert in daylight. This was fine, novel, romantic, dramatically adventurous. This, indeed, was worth living for, worth traveling for. We would write home all about it. This enthusiasm, this stern thirst for adventure, wilted under the sultry August sun, and did not last above one hour. One poor little hour. And then we were ashamed that we had gushed so. The poetry was all in the anticipation. There is none in the reality. Imagine a vast, waveless ocean stricken dead and turned to ashes. Imagine this solemn waste tufted with ash-dusted sage-bushes. Imagine the lifeless silence and solitude that belong to such a place. Imagine a coach creeping like a bug through the midst of this shoreless level, and sending up tumbled volumes of dust, as if it were a bug that went by steam. Imagine this aching monotony of toiling and ploughing kept up hour after hour, and the shore still as far away as ever, apparently. Imagine team, driver, coach, and passengers so deeply coated with ashes that they are all one colorless color. Imagine aft-drifts, roosting above mustaches and eyebrows, like snow accumulations on boughs and bushes. This is the reality of it. The sun beats down with dead, blistering, relentless malignity. The perspiration is welling from every pore in man and beast, but scarcely a sign of it finds its way to the surface. It is absorbed before it gets there. There is not the faintest breath of air stirring. There is not a merciful shred of cloud in all the brilliant firmament. There is not a living creature visible in any direction whither one searches the blank level that stretches its monotonous miles on every hand. There is not a sound, not a sigh, not a whisper not a buzz, or a whir of wings, or distant pipe of bird, not even a sob from the lost souls that doubtless people that dead air. And so the occasional sneezing of the resting mules, and the champing of the bits, grate harshly on the grim stillness, not dissipating the spell, but accenting it, and making one feel more lonesome and forsaken than before. The mules, under violent swearing, coaxing, and whip-cracking, would make, at stated intervals, a spurt, and drag the coach a hundred or maybe two hundred yards, stirring up a billowy cloud of dust that rolled back, enveloping the vehicle to the wheel-tops or higher, and making it seem afloat in fog. Then a rest followed, with the usual sneezing and bit-champing. Then another spurt of a hundred yards, and another rest at the end of it. All day long we kept this up, without water for the mules, and without ever changing the team. At least we kept it up ten hours, which I take it is a day, and a pretty honest one, in an alkali desert. It was from four in the morning till two in the afternoon. And it was so hot, and so close. And our water canteens went dry in the middle of the day, and we got so thirsty. It was so stupid and tiresome and dull and the tedious hours did lag and drag and limp along with such a cruel deliberation. It was so trying to give one's watch a good long undisturbed spell, and then take it out, and find that it had been fooling away the time, and not trying to get ahead any. The alkali dust cut through our lips. It persecuted our eyes. It ate through the delicate membranes, and made our noses bleed, and kept them bleeding. And truly, and seriously, the romance all faded far away and disappeared, and left the desert trip nothing but a harsh reality, a thirst, sweltering, longing, hateful reality. Two miles and a quarter an hour, for ten hours, that was what we accomplished. It was hard to bring the comprehension away down to such a snail pace as that, when we had been used to making eight and ten miles an hour. 
When we reached the station on the farther verge of the desert, we were glad for the first time that the dictionary was along, because we never could have found language to tell how glad we were in any sort of dictionary but an unabridged one with pictures in it. But there could not have been found in a whole library of dictionaries language sufficient to tell how tired those mules were after their twenty-three mile pull. To try to give the reader an idea of how thirsty they were would be to gild refined gold or paint lily. Somehow, now that it is there, the quotation does not seem to fit. But no matter. Let it stay anyhow. I think it is a graceful and attractive thing and therefore have tried time and time again to work it in where it would fit, but could not succeed. These efforts have kept my mind distracted and ill at ease, and made my narrative seem broken and disjointed in places. Under these circumstances it seems to me best to leave it in, as above, since this will afford at least a temporary respite from the wear and tear of trying to lead up to this really apt and beautiful quotation. End of chapter 18 This is chapter 19 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain Chapter 19 On the morning of the sixteenth day out from St. Joseph, we arrived at the entrance of Rocky Canyon, two hundred and fifty miles from Salt Lake. It was along in this wild country somewhere, and far from any habitation of white men except the stage stations, that we came across the wretchedest type of mankind I have ever seen up to this writing. I refer to the Goshute Indians. From what we could see, and all we could learn, they are very considerably inferior to even the despised Digger Indians of California inferior to all races of savages on our continent, inferior to even the Terra del Fuegans, inferior to the Hottentots, and actually inferior in some respects to the Kitschis of Africa. Indeed, I have been obliged to look the bulky volumes of Wood's uncivilized races of men clear through in order to find a savage tribe degraded enough to take rank with the Goshutes. I find but one people fairly open to that shameful verdict. It is the Bojesmen, or Bushmen, of South Africa. Such of the Goshutes, as we saw, along the road and hanging about the stations, were small, lean, scrawny creatures, in complexion a dull black like the ordinary American negro, their faces and hands bearing dirt which they had been hoarding and accumulating for months, years, and even generations, according to the age of the proprietor a silent, sneaking, treacherous-looking race, taking note of everything, covertly, like all the other noble red men that we do not read about, and betraying no sign in their countenances, indolent, everlastingly patient and tireless, like all other Indians, prideless beggars, for if the beggar instinct were left out of an Indian he would not go any more than a clock without a pendulum, hungry, always hungry, and yet never refusing anything that a hog would eat, though often eating what a hog would decline. Hunters, but having no higher ambition than to kill and eat jackass rabbits, crickets, and grasshoppers, and embezzle carrion from the buzzards and coyotes. Savages who, when asked if they have the common Indian belief in a great spirit, show a something which almost amounts to emotion, thinking whiskey is referred to. A thin, scattering race of almost naked black children, these Goshutes are, who produce nothing at all, and have no villages, and no gatherings together into strictly defined tribal communities, a people whose only shelter is a rag cast on a bush to keep off a proportion of the snow, and yet who inhabit one of the most rocky, wintry, repulsive wastes that our country or any other can exhibit. The Bushmen, and our Goshutes, are manifestly descended from the self-same gorilla, or kangaroo, or Norway rat, whichever animal Adam the Darwinians trace them to. One would as soon expect the rabbits to fight as the Goshutes, and yet they used to live off the offal and refuse of the stations a few months, and then come some dark night when no mischief was expected, and burn down the buildings and kill the men from ambush as they rushed out and once in the night they attacked the stagecoach when a district judge of nevada territory was the only passenger 
and with their first volley of arrows and a bullet or two, they riddled the stage curtains, wounded a horse or two, and mortally wounded the driver. The latter was full of pluck, and so was his passenger. At the driver's call, Judge Mott swung himself out, clambered to the box, and seized the reins of the team, and away they plunged, through the racing mob of skeletons, and under a hurtling storm of missiles. The stricken driver had sunk down on the boot as soon as he was wounded, but had held on to the reins, and said he would manage to keep hold of them until relieved. And, after they were taken from his relaxing grasp, he lay with his head between Judge Mott's feet, and tranquilly gave directions about the road. He said he believed he could live till the miscreants were outrun and left behind, and that if he managed that, the main difficulty would be at an end, and then, if the judge drove so and so, giving directions about bad places in the road and general course, he would reach the next station without trouble. The judge distanced the enemy, and at last rattled up to the station, and knew that the night's perils were done. But there was no comrade in arms for him to rejoice with, for the soldierly driver was dead. Let us forget that we have been saying harsh things about the overland drivers now. The disgust which the Goshutes gave me, a disciple of Cooper and a worshipper of the Red Man, even of the scholarly savages in the last of the Mohicans who are fittingly associated with backwoodsmen who divide each sentence into two equal parts, one part critically grammatical, refined, and choice of language, and the other part just such an attempt to talk like a hunter or a mountaineer, as a Broadway clerk might make after eating an edition of Emerson Bennett's works, and studying frontier life at the Bowery Theatre a couple of weeks. I say that the nausea which the Goshutes gave me, an Indian worshipper, set me to examining authorities, to see if perchance I had been overestimating the red man while viewing him through the mellow moonshine of romance. The revelations that came were disenchanting. It was curious to see how quickly the paint and tinsel fell away from him, and left him treacherous, filthy, and repulsive, and how quickly the evidences accumulated that, wherever one finds an Indian tribe, he has only found Goshutes more or less modified by circumstances and surroundings, but Goshutes after all. They deserve pity, poor creatures, and they can have mine at this distance. Nearer by, they never get anybody's. There is an impression abroad that the Baltimore and Washington Railroad Company, and many of its employees, are Goshutes. But it is an error. There is only a plausible resemblance, which, while it is apt enough to mislead the ignorant, cannot deceive parties who have contemplated both tribes. But seriously, it was not only poor wit, but very wrong to start the report referred to above, for, however innocent the motive may have been, the necessary effect was to injure the reputation of a class who have had a hard enough time of it in the pitiless deserts of the Rocky Mountains. Heaven knows! If we cannot find it in our hearts to give those poor naked creatures our Christian sympathy and compassion, in God's name let us at least not throw mud at them. End of chapter 19 this is chapter 20 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain. Chapter 20 On the seventeenth day we passed the highest mountain peaks we had yet seen, and although the day was very warm, the night that followed upon its heel was wintry cold, and blankets were next to useless. On the eighteenth day we encountered the eastward-bound telegraph constructors at Reese River Station, and sent a message to His Excellency Governor Nye at Carson City, distant one hundred and fifty-six miles. On the nineteenth day we crossed the great American desert, forty memorable miles of bottomless sand, into which the coach wheels sunk from six inches to a foot. We worked our passage most of the way across. That is to say, we got out and walked. It was a dreary pull, and a long and thirsty one, for we had no water. From one extremity of this desert to the other, the road was white with the bones of oxen and horses. It would hardly be an exaggeration to say that we could have walked the forty miles, and set our feet on a bone at every step. The desert was one prodigious graveyard. 
and the log-chains, wagon-tires, and rotting wrecks of vehicles were almost as thick as the bones. I think we saw log-chains enough rusting there in the desert to reach across any state in the Union. Do not these relics suggest something of an idea of the fearful suffering and privation the early emigrants to California endured? At the border of the desert lies Carson Lake, or the Sink of the Carson, a shallow, melancholy sheet of water some eighty or a hundred miles in circumference. Carson River empties into it, and is lost, sinks mysteriously into the earth, and never appears in the light of the sun again, for the lake has no outlet whatever. There are several rivers in Nevada, and they all have this mysterious fate. They end in various lakes, or sinks, and that is the last of them. Carson Lake, Humboldt Lake, Walker Lake, Mono Lake, all are great sheets of water without any visible outlet. Water is always flowing into them, none is ever seen to flow out of them, and yet they remain always level full, neither receding nor overflowing. What they do with their surplus is only known to the Creator. On the western verge of the desert we halted a moment at Ragtown. It consisted of one log house, and is not set down on the map. It reminds me of a circumstance. Just after we left Julesburg on the Platte, I was sitting with the driver, and he said, I can tell you a most laughable thing indeed, if you would like to listen to it. Horace Greeley went over this road once. When he was leaving Carson City, he told the driver, Hank Monk, that he had an engagement to lecture at Placerville, and was very anxious to go through quick. Hank Monk cracked his whip and started off at an awful pace. The coach bounced up and down in such a terrific way that it jolted the buttons all off of Horace's coat, and finally shot his head clean through the roof of the stage, and then he yelled at Hank Monk and begged him to go easier, said he weren't in as much of a hurry as he was a while ago. But Hank Monk said, "'Keep your seat, Horace, and I'll get you there on time.' And you bet you he did, too, what was left of him. A day or two after that we picked up a Denver man at the crossroads, and he told us a good deal about the country and the Gregory Diggins. He seemed a very entertaining person, and a man well posted in the affairs of Colorado. By and by he remarked, I can tell you a most laughable thing indeed, if you would like to listen to it. Horace Greeley went over this road once. When he was leaving Carson City he told the driver, Hank Monk, that he had an engagement to lecture at Placerville, and was very anxious to go through quick. Hank Monk cracked his whip and started off at an awful pace. The coach bounced up and down in such a terrific way that it jolted the buttons all off of Horace's coat, and finally shot his head clean through the roof of the stage, and then he yelled at Hank Monk and begged him to go easier. Said he weren't in as much of a hurry as he was a while ago, but Hank Monk said, Keep your seat, Horace, and I'll get you there on time. And you bet you he did, too, what was left of him. At Fort Bridger, some days after this, we took on board a cavalry sergeant, a very proper and soldierly person indeed. From no other man during the whole journey did we gather such a store of concise and well-arranged military information. It was surprising to find in the desolate wilds of our country a man so thoroughly acquainted with everything useful to know in his line of life, and yet of such inferior rank and unpretentious bearing. For as much as three hours we listened to him with unabated interest. Finally he got upon the subject of transcontinental travel, and presently he said, I can tell you a very laughable thing indeed, if you would like to listen to it. Horace Greeley went over this road once. When he was leaving Carson City he told the driver, Hank Monk, that he had an engagement to lecture at Placerville, and was very anxious to go through quick. Hank Monk cracked his whip and started off at an awful pace. The coach bounced up and down in such a terrific way that it jolted the buttons all off of Horace's coat, and finally shot his head clean through the roof of the stage. And then he yelled at Hank Monk, and begged him to go easier, said he weren't in as much of a hurry as he was a while ago. But Hank Monk said, Keep your seat, Horace, and I'll get you there on time. And you bet you he did, too, what was left of him. When we were eight hours out from Salt Lake City, a Mormon preacher got in with us at a way station, a gentle, soft-spoken, kindly man, and one whom any stranger would warm to at first sight. I can never forget the pathos that was in his voice, as he told, in simple language, the story of his people's wanderings and unpitied sufferings. 
No pulpit eloquence was ever so moving and so beautiful as this outcast picture of the first Mormon pilgrimage across the plains, struggling sorrowfully onward to the land of its banishment, and marking its desolate way with graves and watering it with tears. His words so wrought upon us that it was a relief to us all, when the conversation drifted into a more cheerful channel, and the natural features of the curious country we were in came under treatment. One matter after another was pleasantly discussed, and at length the stranger said, "'I can tell you a most laughable thing, indeed, if you would like to listen to it. Horace Greeley went over this road once. When he was leaving Carson City he told the driver, Hank Monk, that he had an engagement to lecture in Placerville, and was very anxious to go through quick. Hank Monk cracked his whip and started off at an awful pace. The coach bounced up and down in such a terrific way that it jolted the buttons all off of Horace's coat, and finally shot his head clean through the roof of the stage, and then he yelled at Hank Monk and begged him to go easier, said he weren't in as much of a hurry as he was a while ago. But Hank Monk said, "'Keep your seat, Horace, and I'll get you there on time.' And you bet you, you bet you he did, too, what was left of him. Ten miles out of Ragtown we found a poor wanderer who had lain down to die. He had walked as long as he could, but his limbs had failed him at last. Hunger and fatigue had conquered him. It would have been inhuman to leave him there. We paid his fare to Carson, and lifted him into the coach. It was some little time before he showed any very decided signs of life, but by dint of chafing him and pouring brandy between his lips we finally brought him to a languid consciousness. Then we fed him a little and by and by he seemed to comprehend the situation, and a grateful light softened his eye. We made his mail-sack bed as comfortable as possible, and constructed a pillow for him with our coats. He seemed very thankful. Then he looked up in our faces, and said in a feeble voice that had a tremble of honest emotion in it, "'Gentlemen, I know not who you are, but you have saved my life, and although I can never be able to repay you for it, I feel that I can at least make one hour of your long journey lighter. I take it you are strangers to this great thoroughfare, but I am entirely familiar with it. In this connection I can tell you a most laughable thing indeed, if you would like to listen to it. Horace Greeley, I said impressively, suffering stranger, proceed at your peril. You see in me the melancholy wreck of a once stalwart and magnificent manhood. What has brought me to this? that thing which you are about to tell. Gradually, but surely, that tiresome old anecdote has sapped my strength, undermined my constitution, withered my life. Pity my helplessness. Spare me only just this once, and tell me about young George Washington and his little hatchet for a change. We were saved. But not so the invalid. In trying to retain the anecdote in his system, he strained himself, and died in our arms. I am aware now that I ought not to have asked of the sturdiest citizen of all that region what I asked of that mere shadow of a man, for after seven years' residence on the Pacific coast, I know that no passenger or driver on the overland ever corked that anecdote in when a stranger was by, and survived. Within a period of six years I crossed and recrossed the Sierras between Nevada and California thirteen times by stage and listened to that deathless incident four hundred and eighty-one or eighty-two times. I have the list somewhere. Drivers always told it. Conductors told it. Landlords told it. Chance passengers told it. The very Chinamen and vagrant Indians recounted it. I have had the same driver tell it to me two or three times in the same afternoon. It has come to me in all multitude of tongues that babble bequeathed to earth and flavored with whiskey, brandy, beer, cologne, sozodont, tobacco, garlic, onions, grasshoppers, everything that has a fragrance to it through all the long list of things that are gorged or guzzled by the sons of men. I never have smelt any anecdote as often as I have smelt that one. Never have smelt any anecdote that smelt so variegated as that one. And you never could learn to know it by its smell, because every time you thought you had learned the smell of it, it would turn up with a different smell. Bayard Taylor has written about this hoary anecdote. Richardson has published it. So have Jones, Smith, Johnson, Ross Brown, and every other correspondence indicting being that ever set his foot upon the great overland road anywhere between Julesburg and San Francisco. And I have heard that it is in the Talmud. 
I have seen it in print in nine different foreign languages, and I have been told that it is employed in the Inquisition in Rome, and I now learn with regret that it is going to be set to music. I do not think that such things are right. Stage-coaching on the overland is no more, and stage-drivers are a race defunct. I wonder if they bequeath that bald-headed anecdote to their successors, the railroad brakemen and conductors and if these latter still persecute the helpless passenger with it until he concludes, as did many a tourist of other days, that the real grandeurs of the Pacific coast are not Yosemite and the big trees, but Hank Monk and his adventure with Horace Greeley. And, what makes that worn anecdote the more aggravating, is that the adventure it celebrates never occurred. If it were a good anecdote, that seeming demerit would be its chiefest virtue, for creative power belongs to greatness. But what ought to be done to a man who would wantonly contrive so flat a one as this? If I were to suggest what ought to be done to him, I should be called extravagant. But what does the sixteenth chapter of Daniel say? Aha! End of chapter 20 this is chapter 21 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain. Chapter 21 We were approaching the end of our long journey. It was the morning of the twentieth day. At noon, we would reach Carson City, the capital of Nevada Territory. We were not glad, but sorry. It has been a fine pleasure trip. We had fed fat on wonders every day. We were now well accustomed to stage life, and very fond of it. So the idea of coming to a standstill and settling down to a humdrum existence in a village was not agreeable, but on the contrary depressing. Visibly our new home was a desert, walled in by barren snow-clad mountains. There was not a tree in sight. There was no vegetation but the endless sagebrush and greasewood. All nature was gray with it. We were plowing through great deeps of powdery alkali dust that rose in thick clouds and floated across the plain like smoke from a burning house. We were coated with it like millers. So were the coach, the mules, the mail-bags, the driver. We and the sagebrush and the other scenery were all one monotonous color long trains of freight wagons in the distance envelope in ascending masses of dust suggested pictures of prairies on fire these teams and their masters were the only life we saw otherwise we moved in the midst of solitude silence and desolation every twenty steps we passed the skeleton of some dead beast of burthen with its dust-coated skin stretched tightly over its empty ribs Frequently a solemn raven sat upon the skull or the hips, and contemplated the passing coach with its meditative serenity. By and by Carson City was pointed out to us. It nestled in the edge of a great plain, and was a sufficient number of miles away to look like an assemblage of mere white spots in the shadow of a grim range of mountains overlooking it, whose summits seemed lifted clear out of companionship and consciousness of earthly things. We arrived disembarked, and the stage went on. It was a wooden town, its population two thousand souls. The main street consisted of four or five blocks of little white frame stores, which were too high to sit down on, but not too high for various other purposes. In fact, hardly high enough. They were packed close together, side by side, as if room were scarce in that mighty plain. The sidewalk was of boards that were more or less loose and inclined to rattle when walked upon. In the middle of the town, opposite the stores, was the plaza, which is native to all towns beyond the Rocky Mountains, a large, unfenced, level vacancy with a liberty pole in it, and very useful as a place for public auctions, horse trades, and mass meetings, and likewise for teamsters to camp in. Two other sides of the plaza were faced by stores, offices, and stables. The rest of Carson City was pretty scattering. We were introduced to several citizens, at the stage office and on the way up to the governor's from the hotel, among others, to a Mr. Harris, who was on horseback. He began to say something, but interrupted himself with the remark, "'I'll have to get you to excuse me a minute. Yonder is the witness that swore I helped to rob the California coach. A piece of impertinent intermeddling, sir, for I am not even acquainted with the man. 
Then he rode over and began to rebuke the stranger with a six-shooter, and the stranger began to explain with another. When the pistols were emptied, the stranger resumed his work, mending a whiplash, and Mr. Harris rode by with a polite nod, homeward bound, with a bullet through one of his lungs, and several in his hips, and from them issued little rivulets of blood that coursed down the horse's sides and made the animal look quite picturesque. I never saw Harris shoot a man after that, but it recalled to mind that first day in Carson. This was all we saw that day, for it was two o'clock now, and according to custom the daily Washoe Zephyr set in. A soaring dust-drift about the size of the United States set up edgewise came with it, and the capital of Nevada Territory disappeared from view. Still, there were sights to be seen which were not wholly uninteresting to newcomers, for the vast dust-cloud was thickly freckled with things strange to the upper air, things living and dead, that flitted hither and thither, coming and going, appearing and disappearing among the rolling billows of dust. Hats, chickens, and parasols sailing in the remote heavens, blankets, tin signs, sagebrush, and shingles a shade lower, doormats and buffalo robes lower still, shovels and coal scuttles on the next grade, glass doors, cats and little children on the next, disrupted lumber yards, light buggies and wheelbarrows on the next, and down only thirty or forty feet above ground was a scurrying storm of emigrating roofs and vacant lots. It was something to see that much. I could have seen more if I could have kept the dust out of my eyes. But seriously, a washoe wind is by no means a trifling matter. It blows flimsy houses down, lifts shingle roofs occasionally, rolls up tin ones like sheet music, now and then blows a stagecoach over and spills the passengers. And tradition says the reason there are so many bald people there is that the wind blows the hair off their heads while they are looking skyward after their hats. Carson streets seldom look inactive on summer afternoons, because there are so many citizens skipping around their escaping hats like chambermaids trying to head off a spider. The Washoe Zephyr, Washoe is a pet nickname for Nevada, is a peculiar scriptural wind, in that no man knoweth whence it cometh, that is to say, where it originates. It comes right over the mountains from the west, but when one crosses the ridge he does not find any of it on the other side. It probably is manufactured on the mountain top for the occasion, and starts from there. It is a pretty regular wind in the summer time. Its office hours are from two in the afternoon till two the next morning, and anybody venturing abroad during those twelve hours needs to allow for the wind, or he will bring up a mile or two to leeward of the point he is aiming at. And yet the first complaint a Washoe visitor to San Francisco makes is that the sea winds blow so there. There is a good deal of human nature in that. We found the State Palace of the Governor of Nevada Territory to consist of a white-frame one-story house with two small rooms in it and a stanchion-supported shed in front for grandeur. It compelled the respect of the citizen and inspired the Indians with awe. The newly arrived chief and associate justices of the territory and other machinery of the government were domiciled with less splendor. They were boarding around privately and had their offices in their bedrooms. The secretary and I took quarters in the ranch of a worthy French lady by the name of Bridget O'Flanagan, a camp follower of His Excellency the Governor. She had known him in his prosperity as commander-in-chief of the Metropolitan Police of New York, and she would not desert him in his adversity as Governor of Nevada. Our room was on the lower floor, facing the plaza, and when we had got our bed, a small table, two chairs, the government fireproof safe, and the unabridged dictionary into it, there was still room enough left for a visitor, maybe two, but not without straining the walls. But the walls could stand it, at least the partitions could, for they consisted simply of one thickness of white cotton domestic stretched from corner to corner of the room. This was the rule in Carson. Any other kind of partition was the rare exception. And if you stood in a dark corner and your neighbors in the next had lights, the shadows on your canvas told queer secrets sometimes. Very often these partitions were made of old flour sacks basted together, and then the difference between the common herd and the aristocracy was that the common herd had unornamented sacks, while the walls of the aristocrat were overpowering with rudimental fresco, i.e., red and blue mill brands on the flour sacks. Occasionally, also, the better classes embellished their canvas by pasting pictures from Harper's Weekly on them. 
In many cases, too, the wealthy and the cultured rose to spittoons and other evidences of a sumptuous and luxurious taste. Washoe people take a joke so hard that I must explain that the above description was only the rule. There were many honorable exceptions in Carson, plastered ceilings and houses that had considerable furniture in them. M. T. We had a carpet and a genuine Queensware washbowl. Consequently, we were hated without reserve by the other tenants of the O'Flanagan Ranch. When we added a painted oilcloth window curtain, we simply took our lives into our own hands. To prevent bloodshed, I removed upstairs and took quarters with the untitled plebeians in one of the fourteen white pine cot bedsteads that stood in two long ranks in the one sole room of which the second story consisted. It was a jolly company, the fourteen. They were principally voluntary camp followers of the governor, who had joined his retinue by their own election at New York and San Francisco, and came along feeling that in the scuffle for little territorial crumbs and offices they could not make their condition more precarious than it was, and might reasonably expect to make it better. They were popularly known as the Irish Brigade, though there were only four or five Irishmen among all the governor's retainers. His good-natured excellency was much annoyed at the gossip his henchmen created, especially when there arose a rumor that they were paid assassins of his, brought along to quietly reduce the democratic vote when desirable. Mrs. O'Flanagan was boarding and lodging them at ten dollars a week apiece, and they were cheerfully giving their notes for it. They were perfectly satisfied, but Bridget presently found that notes that could not be discounted were but a feeble constitution for a Carson boarding-house, so she began to harry the governor to find employment for the brigade. Her importunities and theirs together drove him to a gentle desperation at last, and he finally summoned the brigade to the presence. Then he said, "'Gentlemen, I have planned a lucrative and useful service for you.' a service which will provide you with recreation amid noble landscapes, and afford you never-ceasing opportunities for enriching your minds by observation and study. I want you to survey a railroad from Carson City westward to a certain point. When the legislature meets, I will have the necessary bill passed, and the remuneration arranged. What, a railroad over the Sierra Nevada mountains? Well, then, survey it eastward to a certain point." He converted them into surveyors, chain-bearers, and so on, and turned them loose in the desert. It was recreation with a vengeance. Recreation on foot, lugging chains through sand and sagebrush, under a sultry sun, and among cattle-bones, coyotes, and tarantulas. Romantic adventure could go no further. They surveyed very slowly, very deliberately, very carefully. They returned every night during the first week, dusty, footsore, tired, and hungry, but very jolly. They brought in great store of prodigious hairy spiders, tarantulas, and imprisoned them in covered tumblers upstairs in the ranch. After the first week they had to camp on the field, for they were getting well eastward. They made a good many inquiries as to the location of that indefinite certain point, but got no information. At last, to a peculiarly urgent inquiry of how far eastward, Governor Nye telegraphed back, "'To the Atlantic Ocean, blast you! And then bridge it and go on!' This brought back the dusty toilers, who sent in a report and ceased from their labors. The governor was always comfortable about it. He said Mrs. O'Flanagan would hold him for the brigade's board anyhow, and he intended to get what entertainment he could out of the boys. He said with his old-time pleasant twinkle that he meant to survey them into Utah and then telegraph Brigham to hang them for trespass. The surveyors brought back more tarantulas with them, and so we had quite a menagerie arranged along the shelves of the room. Some of these spiders could straddle over a common saucer with their hairy, muscular legs, and when their feelings were hurt, or their dignity offended, they were the wickedest-looking desperadoes the animal world can furnish. If their glass prison-houses were touched ever so lightly, they were up and spoiling for a fight in a minute. Starchy? Proud? Indeed, they would take up a straw and pick their teeth like a member of Congress. There was, as usual, a furious zephyr blowing the first night of the brigade's return, and about midnight the roof of an adjoining stable blew off, and a corner of it came crashing through the side of our ranch. There was a simultaneous awakening, and a tumultuous muster of the brigade in the dark, 
and a general tumbling and sprawling over each other in the narrow aisle between the bedrows. In the midst of the turmoil, Bob H. sprung up out of a sound sleep, and knocked down a shelf with his head. Instantly he shouted, "'Turn out, boys! The tarantulas is loose!' No warning ever sounded so dreadful. Nobody tried any longer to leave the room, lest he might step on a tarantula. Every man groped for a trunk or a bed, and jumped on it. Then followed the strangest silence. A silence of grisly suspense it was, too. Waiting, expectancy, fear. It was as dark as pitch, and one had to imagine the spectacle of those fourteen scant-clad men roosting gingerly on trunks and beds, for not a thing could be seen. Then came occasional little interruptions of the silence, and one could recognize a man, and tell his locality by his voice, or locate any other sound a sufferer made by his gropings or changes of position. The occasional voices were not given to much speaking. You simply heard a gentle ejaculation of OW, followed by a solid thump, and you knew the gentleman had felt a hairy blanket, or something touch his bare skin, and had skipped from a bed to the floor. Another silence. Presently you would hear a gasping voice say, S -s something's crawling up the back of my neck. Every now and then you could hear a little subdued scramble and a sorrowful, Oh, Lord! And then you knew that somebody was getting away from something he took for a tarantula, and not losing any time about it, either. Directly a voice in the corner rang out, wild and clear, I've got him! I've got him! Pause, and probable change of circumstances. No! No, he's got me! Oh, ain't they never going to fetch a lantern? The lantern came at that moment in the hands of Mrs. O'Flanagan, whose anxiety to know the amount of damage done by the assaulting roof had not prevented her waiting a judicious interval, after getting out of bed and lighting up, to see if the wind was done, now, upstairs, or had a larger contract. The landscape presented when the lantern flashed into the room was picturesque, and might have been funny to some people, but was not to us. Although we were perched so strangely upon boxes, trunks, and beds, and so strangely attired, too, we were too earnestly distressed and too genuinely miserable to see any fun about it, and there was not the semblance of a smile anywhere visible. I know I am not capable of suffering more than I did during those few minutes of suspense in the dark, surrounded by those creeping, bloody-minded tarantulas. I had skipped from bed to bed and from box to box in a cold agony and every time I touched anything that was furzy, I fancied I felt the fangs. I had rather go to war than live that episode over again. Nobody was hurt. The man who thought a tarantula had got him was mistaken. Only a crack in a box had caught his finger. Not one of those escaped tarantulas was ever seen again. There were ten or twelve of them. We took candles and hunted the place high and low for them, but with no success. Did we go back to bed, then? We did nothing of the kind. Money could not have persuaded us to do it. We sat up the rest of the night playing cribbage and keeping a sharp lookout for the enemy. End of chapter 22 This is chapter 22 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain. Chapter 22 It was the end of August, and the skies were cloudless, and the weather superb. In two or three weeks I had grown wonderfully fascinated with the curious new country, and concluded to put off my return to the States a while. I had grown well accustomed to wearing a damaged slouch hat, blue woolen shirt, and pants crammed into boot tops, and gloried in the absence of coat, vest, and braces. I felt rowdyish and bully, as the historian Josephus phrases it, in his fine chapter upon the destruction of the temple. It seemed to me that nothing could be so fine and so romantic. I had become an officer of the government, but that was for mere sublimity. The office was a unique sinecure. I had nothing to do, and no salary. I was private secretary to His Majesty the Secretary, and there was not yet writing enough for two of us. So Johnny K. and I devoted our time to amusement. He was the young son of an Ohio nabob, and was out there for recreation. He got it. We had heard a world of talk about the marvelous beauty of Lake Tahoe, and finally curiosity drove us thither to see it. 
Three or four members of the brigade had been there and located some timber lands on its shores and stored up a quantity of provisions in their camp. We strapped a couple of blankets on our shoulders and took an axe apiece and started, for we intended to take up a wood ranch or so ourselves and become wealthy. We were on foot. The reader will find it advantageous to go horseback. We were told that the distance was eleven miles. We tramped a long time on level ground, and then toiled laboriously up a mountain about a thousand miles high and looked over. No lake there. We descended on the other side, crossed the valley, and toiled up another mountain three or four thousand miles high, apparently, and looked over again. No lake yet. We sat down tired and perspiring, and hired a couple of Chinamen to curse those people who had beguiled us. Thus refreshed, we presently resumed the march with renewed vigor and determination. We plodded on two or three hours longer, and at last the lake burst upon us. A noble sheet of blue water lifted six thousand three hundred feet above the level of the sea, and walled in by a rim of snow-clad mountain peaks that towered aloft full three thousand feet higher still. It was a vast oval, and one would have to use up eighty or a hundred good miles in traveling around it. As it lay there, with the shadows of the mountains brilliantly photographed upon its still surface, I thought it must surely be the fairest picture the whole earth affords. We found the small skiff belonging to the brigade boys, and without loss of time set out across a deep bend of the lake toward the landmarks that signified the locality of the camp. I got Johnny to row, not because I mind exertion myself, but because it makes me sick to ride backwards when I am at work. But I steered. A three-mile pull brought us to the camp just as the night fell, and we stepped ashore very tired and wolfishly hungry. In a cache among the rocks we found the provisions and the cooking utensils, and then, all fatigued as I was, I sat down on a boulder and superintended while Johnny gathered wood and cooked supper. Many a man who had gone through what I had would have wanted to rest. It was a delicious supper, hot bread, fried bacon, and black coffee. It was a delicious solitude we were in, too. Three miles away was a sawmill and some workmen, but there were not fifteen other human beings throughout the wide circumference of the lake. As the darkness closed down and the stars came out and spangled the great mirror with jewels, we smoked meditatively in the solemn hush and forgot our troubles and our pains. In due time we spread our blankets in the warm sand between two large boulders and soon fell asleep careless of the procession of ants that passed in through rents in our clothing and explored our persons. Nothing could disturb the sleep that fettered us, for it had been fairly earned, and if our consciences had any sins on them, they had to adjourn court for that night, anyway. The wind rose just as we were losing consciousness, and we were lulled to sleep by the beating of the surf upon the shore. It is always very cold on that lake shore in the night, but we had plenty of blankets and were warm enough. We never moved a muscle all night, but waked at early dawn in the original positions, and got up at once thoroughly refreshed, free from soreness, and brimful of friskiness. There is no end of wholesome medicine in such an experience. That morning we could have whipped ten such people as we were the day before, sick ones at any rate, but the world is slow, and people will go to water-cures and movement-cures and to foreign lands for health. Three months of camp life on Lake Tahoe would restore an Egyptian mummy to his pristine vigor and give him an appetite like an alligator. I do not mean the oldest and driest mummies, of course, but the fresher ones. The air up there in the clouds is very pure and fine, bracing and delicious. But why shouldn't it be? It is the same the angels breathe. I think that hardly any amount of fatigue can be gathered together that a man cannot sleep off in one night on the sand by its side not under a roof, but under the sky. It seldom or never rains there in the summer-time. I know a man who went there to die. But he made a failure of it. He was a skeleton when he came, and could barely stand. He had no appetite, and did nothing but read tracts and reflect on the future. Three months later he was sleeping out of doors regularly, eating all he could hold three times a day, and chasing game over mountains three thousand feet high for recreation and he was a skeleton no longer, but weighed part of a ton. This is no fancy sketch, but the truth. His disease was consumption. I confidently commend his experience to other skeletons. 
I superintended again, and as soon as we had eaten breakfast we got in the boat and skirted along the lake shore about three miles and disembarked. We liked the appearance of the place, and so we claimed some three hundred acres of it and stuck our notices on a tree. It was yellow pine timberland, a dense forest of trees a hundred feet high and from one to five feet through at the butt. It was necessary to fence our property or we could not hold it. That is to say, it was necessary to cut down trees here and there and make them fall in such a way as to form a sort of enclosure with pretty wide gaps in it. We cut down three trees apiece and found it such heart-breaking work that we decided to rest our case on those. If they held the property, well and good. If they didn't, let the property spill out through the gaps and go. It was no use to work ourselves to death merely to save a few acres of land. Next day we came back to build a house, for a house was also necessary in order to hold the property. We decided to build a substantial log house and excite the envy of the brigade boys, but by the time we had cut and trimmed the first log it seemed unnecessary to be so elaborate, and so we concluded to build it of saplings. However, two saplings, duly cut and trimmed, compelled the recognition of the fact that a still modester architecture would satisfy the law, and so we concluded to build a brush house. We devoted the next day to this work, but we did so much sitting around and discussing that by the middle of the afternoon we had achieved only a half-way sort of affair, which one of us had to watch while the other cut brush, lest, if both turned our backs, we might not be able to find it again. It had such a strong family resemblance to the surrounding vegetation. But we were satisfied with it. We were landowners now, duly seized and possessed, and within the protection of the law. Therefore we decided to take up our residence on our own domain, and enjoy that large sense of independence which only such an experience can bring. Late the next afternoon, after a good long rest, we sailed away from the brigade camp with all the provisions and cooking utensils we could carry off. Borrow is the more accurate word, and just as the night was falling we beached the boat at our own landing. End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 of Roughing It This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain Chapter 23 If there is any life that is happier than the life we led on our timber ranch for the next two or three weeks, it must be some sort of life which I have not read of in books or experienced in person. We did not see a human being but ourselves during the time, or hear any sounds but those that were made by the wind and the waves, the sighing of the pines, and now and then the far-off thunder of an avalanche. The forest about us was dense and cool. The sky above us was cloudless and brilliant with sunshine. The broad lake before us was glassy and clear, or rippled and breezy, or black and storm-tossed, according to nature's mood and its circling border of mountain domes, clothed with forests, scarred with landslides, cloven with canyons and valleys, and helmeted with glittering snow, fitly framed and finished the noble picture. The view was always fascinating, bewitching, entrancing. The eye was never tired of gazing, night or day, in calm or storm. It suffered but one grief, and that was that it could not look always, but must close sometimes in sleep. We slept in the sand, close to the water's edge, between two protecting boulders, which took care of the stormy night winds for us. We never took any paragoric to make us sleep. At the first break of dawn we were always up and running foot-races, to tone down excess of physical vigor and exuberance of spirits. That is, Johnny was, but I held his hat. While smoking the pipe of peace after breakfast we watched the sentinel peaks put on the glory of the sun, and followed the conquering light as it swept down among the shadows and set the captive crags and forests free. We watched the tinted pictures grow and brighten upon the water till every little detail of forest, precipice, and pinnacle was wrought in and finished, and the miracle of the enchanter complete. Then to business, that is, drifting around in the boat. We were on the north shore. There the rocks on the bottom are sometimes gray, sometimes white. This gives the marvelous transparency of the water a fuller advantage than it has elsewhere on the lake. 
we usually pushed out a hundred yards or so from shore, and then lay down on the thwarts in the sun, and let the boat drift by the hour whither it would. We seldom talked. It interrupted the Sabbath stillness, and marred the dreams the luxurious rest and indolence brought. The shore all along was indented with deep, curved bays and coves, bordered by narrow sand-beaches, and where the sand ended the steep mountain-sides rose right up aloft into space, rose up like a vast wall a little out of perpendicular, and thickly wooded with tall pines. So singularly clear was the water, that where it was only twenty or thirty feet deep the bottom was so perfectly distinct that the boat seemed floating in the air. Yes, where it was even eighty feet deep. Every little pebble was distinct, every speckled trout, every hand's breadth of sand. Often, as we lay on our faces, a granite boulder as large as a village church would start out of the bottom, apparently, and seem climbing up rapidly to the surface, till presently it threatened to touch our faces, and we could not resist the impulse to seize an oar and avert the danger. But the boat would float on, and the boulder descend again, and then we could see that when we had been exactly above it, it must still have been twenty or thirty feet below the surface. Down through the transparency of these great depths the water was not merely transparent, but dazzlingly, brilliantly so. All objects seen through it had a bright, strong vividness, not only of outline, but of every minute detail, which they would not have had when seen simply through the same depths of atmosphere. So empty and airy did all spaces seem below us, and so strong was the sense of floating high aloft in mid-nothingness, that we called these boat excursions balloon voyages. We fished a good deal, but we did not average one fish a week. We could see trout by the thousand winging about in the emptiness under us, or sleeping in shoals on the bottom, but they would not bite. They could see the line too plainly, perhaps. We frequently selected the trout we wanted, and rested the bait patiently and persistently on the end of his nose at a depth of eighty feet, but he would only shake it off with an annoying manner and shift his position. We bathed occasionally, but the water was rather chilly, for it all looked so sunny. Sometimes we rowed out to the blue water a mile or two from shore. It was as dead blue as indigo there, because of the immense depth. By official measurement the lake in its center is 1,525 feet deep. Sometimes, on lazy afternoons, we lolled on the sand in camp, and smoked pipes, and read some old well-worn novels. At night, by the campfire, we played euchre and seven-up to strengthen the mind, and played them with cards so greasy and defaced that only a whole summer's acquaintance with them could enable the student to tell the ace of clubs from the jack of diamonds. We never slept in our house, it never recurred to us, for one thing, and, besides, it was built to hold the ground, and that was enough. We did not wish to strain it. By and by our provisions began to run short, and we went back to the old camp and laid in a new supply. We were gone all day, and reached home again about nightfall, pretty tired and hungry. While Johnny was carrying the main bulk of the provisions up to our house, for future use, I took the loaf of bread, some slices of bacon, and the coffee-pot ashore, set them down by a tree, lit a fire, and went back to the boat to get the frying-pan. While I was at this, I heard a shout from Johnny, and looking up I saw that my fire was galloping all over the premises. Johnny was on the other side of it. He had to run through the flames to get to the lake shore, and then we stood helpless and watched the devastation. The ground was deeply carpeted with dry pine-needles, and the fire touched them off as if they were gunpowder. It was wonderful to see with what fierce speed the tall sheet of flame traveled. My coffee-pot was gone, and everything with it. In a minute and a half the fire seized upon a dense growth of dry manzanita chaparral six or eight feet high, and then the roaring and popping and crackling was something terrific. We were driven to the boat by the intense heat and there we remained, spellbound. Within half an hour all before us was a tossing, blinding tempest of flame. It went surging up adjacent ridges, surmounted them, and disappeared in the cannons beyond, burst into view upon higher and farther ridges presently, shed a grander illumination abroad, and dove again, flamed out again, directly, higher and still higher up the mountainside, threw out skirmishing parties of fire here and there, 
and then sent them trailing their crimson spirals away among remote ramparts and ribs and gorges, till as far as the eye could reach the lofty mountain fronts were webbed, as it were, with a tangled network of red lava streams. Away across the water the crags and domes were lit with a ruddy glare, and the firmament above was a reflected hell. Every feature of the spectacle was repeated in the glowing mirror of the lake. Both pictures were sublime, both were beautiful, but that in the lake had a bewildering richness about it that enchanted the eye and held it with a stronger fascination. We sat absorbed and motionless through four long hours. We never thought of supper, and never felt fatigue. But at eleven o'clock the conflagration had traveled beyond our range of vision, and then darkness stole down upon the landscape again. Hunger asserted itself now, but there was nothing to eat. The provisions were all cooked, no doubt, but we did not go to sea. We were homeless wanderers again, without any property. Our fence was gone, our house burned down, no insurance. Our pine forest was well scorched, the dead trees all burned up, and our broad acres of manzanita swept away. Our blankets were on our usual sand-bed, however, and so we lay down and went to sleep. The next morning we started back to the old camp, but while out a long way from shore, so great a storm came up that we dared not try to land. So I bailed out the seas we shipped, and Johnny pulled heavily through the billows till we had reached a point three or four miles beyond the camp. The storm was increasing, and it became evident that it was better to take the hazard of beaching the boat than go down in a hundred fathoms of water. So we ran in, with tall white caps following, and I sat down in the stern sheets and pointed her head on to the shore. The instant the bow struck, a wave came over the stern that washed crew and cargo ashore and saved a deal of trouble. We shivered in the lee of a boulder all the rest of the day and froze all the night through. In the morning the tempest had gone down and we paddled down to the camp without any unnecessary delay. We were so starved that we ate up the rest of the brigade's provisions, and then set out to Carson to tell them about it and ask their forgiveness. It was accorded upon payment of damages. We made many trips to the lake after that, and had many a hair-breadth escape and blood-curdling adventure which will never be recorded in any history. End of chapter 23 This is chapter 24 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain Chapter 24 I resolved to have a horse to ride. I had never seen such wild, free, magnificent horsemanship outside of a circus as these picturesquely clad Mexicans, Californians, and Mexicanized Americans displayed in Carson streets every day. How they rode! Leaning just gently forward out of the perpendicular, easy and nonchalant, with broad slouch hat brim blown square up in front, and long riata swinging above the head, they swept through the town like the wind. The next minute they were only a sailing puff of dust on a far desert. If they trotted, they sat up gallantly and gracefully, and seemed part of the horse. Did not go jiggering up and down after the silly Miss Nancy fashion of the riding schools. I had quickly learned to tell a horse from a cow, and was full of anxiety to learn more. I was resolved to buy a horse. While the thought was rankling in my mind, the auctioneer came scurrying through the plaza on a black beast that had as many humps and corners on him as a dromedary, and was necessarily uncomely. But he was going, going at twenty-two, horse, saddle, and bridle at twenty-two dollars, gentlemen, and I could hardly resist. A man whom I did not know, he turned out to be the auctioneer's brother, noticed the wistful look in my eye, and observed that that was a very remarkable horse to be going at such a price and added that the saddle alone was worth the money. It was a Spanish saddle, with ponderous tapidaros, and furnished with the ungainly sole-leather covering with the unspellable name. I said I had half a notion to bid. Then this keen-eyed person appeared to me to be taking my measure, but I dismissed the suspicion when he spoke, for his manner was full of guileless candor and truthfulness. Said he, "'I know that horse. Know him well. You are a stranger, I take it.' and so you might think he was an American horse, maybe. But I assure you he is not. He is nothing of the kind. But 
excuse my speaking in a low voice, other people being near, he is, without the shadow of a doubt, a genuine Mexican plug. I did not know what a genuine Mexican plug was, but there was something about this man's way of saying it that made me swear inwardly that I would own a genuine Mexican plug or die. Has he any other um, advantages? I inquired, suppressing what eagerness I could. He hooked his forefinger in the pocket of my army shirt, led me to one side, and breathed in my ear impressively these words. He can outbuck anything in America. Going, going, going at twenty t four dollars and a half gen twenty seven, I shouted in a frenzy. And sold, said the auctioneer, and passed over the genuine Mexican plug to me. I could scarcely contain my exultation. I paid the money, and put the animal in a neighboring livery stable to dine and rest himself. In the afternoon I brought the creature into the plaza, and certain citizens held him by the head and others by the tail, while I mounted him. As soon as they let go, he placed all his feet in a bunch together, lowered his back, and then suddenly arched it upward, and shot me straight into the air a matter of three or four feet. I came as straight down again, lit in the saddle, went instantly up again, came down almost on the high pommel, shot up again, and came down on the horse's neck all in the space of three or four seconds. Then he rose and stood almost straight up on his hind feet, and I, clasping his lean neck desperately, slid back into the saddle and held on. He came down, and immediately hoisted his heels into the air, delivering a vicious kick at the sky, and stood on his forefeet. Then down he came once more, and began the original exercise of shooting me straight up again. The third time I went up I heard a stranger say, "'Whoa! Don't he buck, though!' While I was up, somebody struck the horse a sounding thwack with a leathern strap, and when I arrived again, the genuine Mexican plug was not there. A California youth chased him up and caught him, and asked if he might have a ride. I granted him that luxury. He mounted the genuine, got lifted into the air once, but sent his spurs home as he descended, and the horse darted away like a telegram. He soared over three fences like a bird, and disappeared down the road toward the Washoe Valley. I sat down on a stone with a sigh, and by a natural impulse one of my hands sought my forehead, and the other the base of my stomach. I believe I never appreciated till then the poverty of the human machinery, for I still needed a hand or two to place elsewhere. Pen cannot describe how I was jolted up. Imagination cannot conceive how disjointed I was, how internally, externally, and universally I was unsettled, mixed up, and ruptured. There was a sympathetic crowd around me, though. One elderly-looking comforter said, "'Stranger, you've been taken in. Everybody in this camp knows that horse. Any child, any Injun, could have told you that he'd buck. He is the very worst devil to buck on the continent of America. You hear me? I'm Curry, old Curry, old Abe Curry. And, moreover, he is a Simon-pure, out-and-out, genuine, damned Mexican plug, and an uncommon mean one at that, too. Why, you turnip, if you had laid low and kept dark, there's chances to buy an American horse for mighty little more than you paid for that bloody old foreign relic. I gave no sign, but I made up my mind that if the auctioneer's brother's funeral took place while I was in the territory, I would postpone all other recreations and attend it. After a gallop of sixteen miles, the Californian youth and the genuine Mexican plug came tearing into town again, shedding foam flakes like the spume spray that dries before a typhoon, and, with one final skip over a wheelbarrow and a Chinaman, cast anchor in front of the ranch. Such panting and blowing, such spreading and contracting of the red equine nostrils, and glaring of the wild equine eye! But was the imperial beast subjugated? Indeed he was not. His lordship, the Speaker of the House, thought he was, and mounted him to go down to the capital. But the first dash the creature made was over a pile of telegraph poles half as high as a church, and his time to the capital, one mile and three-quarters, remains unbeaten to this day. But then he took an advantage, he left out the mile, and only did the three-quarters. That is to say, he made a straight cut across lots, preferring fences and ditches to a crooked road, and when the speaker got to the capital, he said he had been in the air so much he felt as if he had made the trip on a comet. 
In the evening the speaker came home afoot for exercise, and got the genuine towed back behind a quartz wagon. The next day I loaned the animal to the clerk of the house to go down to the Dana Silver Mine six miles, and he walked back for exercise, and got the horse towed. Everybody I loaned him to always walked back. They never could get enough exercise any other way. Still, I continued to loan him to anybody who was willing to borrow him, my idea being to get him crippled, and throw him on the borrower's hands, or killed, and make the borrower pay for him. But somehow nothing ever happened to him. He took chances that no other horse ever took and survived, but he always came out safe. It was his daily habit to try experiments that had always before been considered impossible, but he always got through. Sometimes he miscalculated a little, and did not get his rider through intact, but he always got through himself. Of course, I had tried to sell him, but that was a stretch of simplicity which met with little sympathy. The auctioneer stormed up and down the streets on him for four days, dispersing the populace, interrupting business, and destroying children, and never got a bid. At least never any but the eighteen-dollar one he hired a notoriously substanceless bummer to make. The people only smiled pleasantly, and restrained their desire to buy, if they had any. Then the auctioneer brought in his bill, and I withdrew the horse from the market. We tried to trade him off at private vendue next, offering him at a sacrifice for second-hand tombstones, old iron, temperance tracts, any kind of property. But holders were stiff, and we retired from the market again. I never tried to ride the horse any more. Walking was good enough exercise for a man like me that had nothing the matter with him except ruptures, internal injuries, and such things. Finally I tried to give him away, but it was a failure. Parties said earthquakes were handy enough on the Pacific coast. They did not wish to own one. As a last resort I offered him to the governor for the use of the brigade. His face lit up eagerly at first, but toned down again, and he said the thing would be too palpable. Just then the livery stable man brought in his bill for six weeks' keeping. Stall room for the horse, fifteen dollars. Hay for the horse, two hundred and fifty. The genuine Mexican plug had eaten a ton of the article, and the man said he would have eaten a hundred if he had let him. I will remark here, in all seriousness, that the regular price of hay during that year and a part of the next was really two hundred and fifty dollars a ton. During a part of the previous year it had sold at five hundred a ton, in gold, and during the winter before that there was a scarcity of the article that in several instances small quantities had brought eight hundred dollars a ton in coin. The consequence might be guessed without my telling it. People turned their stock loose to starve, and before the spring arrived Carson and Eagle Valleys were almost literally carpeted with their carcasses. Any old settler there will verify these statements. I managed to pay the livery bill, and that same day I gave the genuine Mexican plug to a passing Arkansas emigrant whom fortune delivered into my hand. If this ever meets his eye, he will doubtless remember the donation. Now, whoever has had the luck to ride a real Mexican plug will recognize the animal depicted in this chapter, and hardly consider him exaggerated. But the uninitiated will feel justified in regarding his portrait as a fancy sketch, perhaps. End of chapter 24 This is chapter 25 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain Chapter 25 Originally, Nevada was a part of Utah, and was called Carson County. And a pretty large county it was, too. Certain of its valleys produced no end of hay, and this attracted small colonies of Mormon stock-raisers and farmers to them. A few Orthodox Americans straggled in from California, but no love was lost between the two classes of colonists. There was little or no friendly intercourse. Each party stayed to itself. The Mormons were largely in the majority, and had the additional advantage of being peculiarly under the protection of the Mormon government of the territory. Therefore, they could afford to be distant, and even peremptory, toward their neighbors. One of the traditions of Carson Valley illustrates the condition of things that prevailed at the time I speak of. The hired girl of one of the American families was Irish, and a Catholic. 
yet it was noted with surprise that she was the only person outside of the Mormon ring who could get favors from the Mormons. She asked kindnesses of them often, and always got them. It was a mystery to everybody. But one day, as she was passing out at the door, a large bowie knife dropped from under her apron, and when her mistress asked for an explanation, she observed that she was going out to bury a wash-tub from the Mormons. In 1858, silver lodes were discovered in Carson County, and then the aspect of things changed. Californians began to flock in, and the American element was soon in the majority. Allegiance to Brigham Young and Utah was renounced, and a temporary territorial government for Washu was instituted by the citizens. Governor Roop was the first and only chief magistrate of it. In due course of time Congress passed a bill to organize Nevada Territory, and President Lincoln sent out Governor Nye to supplant Roop. At this time the population of the territory was about twelve or fifteen thousand, and rapidly increasing. Silver mines were being vigorously developed, and silver mills erected. Business of all kinds was active and prosperous, and growing more so day by day. The people were glad to have a legitimately constituted government, but did not particularly enjoy having strangers from distant states put in authority over them, a sentiment that was natural enough. They thought the officials should have been chosen from among themselves, from among prominent citizens who had earned a right to such promotion, and who would be in sympathy with the populace, and likewise thoroughly acquainted with the needs of the territory. They were right in viewing the matter thus, without doubt. The new officers were emigrants, and that was no title to anybody's affection or admiration either. The new government was received with considerable coolness. It was not only a foreign intruder, but a poor one. It was not even worth plucking, except by the smallest of small fry office-seekers and such. Everybody knew that Congress had appropriated only twenty thousand dollars a year in greenbacks for its support, about money enough to run a quartz mill a month. And everybody knew, also, that the first year's money was still in Washington, and that the getting hold of it would be a tedious and difficult process. Carson City was too wary and too wise to open up a credit account with the imported bantling with anything like indecent haste. There is something solemnly funny about the struggles of a new-born territorial government to get a start in this world. Ours had a trying time of it. The Organic Act and the instructions from the State Department commanded that a legislature should be elected at such and such a time, and its sittings inaugurated at such and such a date. It was easy to get legislators, even at three dollars a day, although board was four dollars and fifty cents, for distinction has its charms in Nevada as well as elsewhere, and there were plenty of patriotic souls out of employment, but to get a legislative hall for them to meet in was another matter altogether. Carson blandly declined to give a room rent free, or let one to the government on credit. But when Curry heard of the difficulty, he came forward, solitary and alone, and shouldered the ship of state over the bar, and got her afloat again. I refer to Curry, old Curry, old Abe Curry. But for him the legislature would have been obliged to sit in the desert. He offered his large stone building just outside the capital limits, rent-free, and it was gladly accepted. Then he built a horse railroad from town to the capital, and carried the legislators gratis. He also furnished pine benches and chairs for the legislature, and covered the floors with clean sawdust, by way of carpet and spittoon combined. But for Curry the government would have died in its tender infancy. A canvas partition to separate the Senate from the House of Representatives was put up by the Secretary at a cost of three dollars and forty cents, but the United States declined to pay for it. Upon being reminded that the instructions permitted the payment of a liberal rent for a legislative hall, and that that money was saved to the country by Mr. Curry's generosity, the United States said that it did not alter the matter, and the three dollars and forty cents would be subtracted from the Secretary's eighteen hundred dollar salary, and it was. The matter of printing was from the beginning an interesting feature of the new government's difficulties. The Secretary was sworn to obey his volume of written instructions, and these commanded him to do two certain things without fail, viz. one get the House and Senate journals printed, and two, for this work pay one dollar and fifty cents per thousand for composition, and one dollar and fifty cents per token for press work, in greenbacks. 
It was easy to swear to do these two things, but it was entirely impossible to do more than one of them. When greenbacks had gone down to forty cents on the dollar, the prices regularly charged everybody by printing establishments were one dollar and fifty cents per thousand, and one dollar and fifty cents per token, in gold. The instructions commanded that the secretary regard a paper dollar issued by the government as equal to any other dollar issued by the government. Hence, the printing of the journals was discontinued. Then the United States sternly rebuked the secretary for disregarding the instructions, and warned him to correct his ways. Wherefore he got some printing done, forwarded the bill to Washington with full exhibits of the high prices of things in the territory, and called attention to a printed market report wherein it would be observed that even hay was two hundred and fifty dollars a ton. The United States responded by subtracting the printing bill from the Secretary's suffering salary, and moreover remarked with dense gravity that he would find nothing in his instructions requiring him to purchase hay. Nothing in this world is palled in such impenetrable obscurity as a U.S. Treasury Comptroller's understanding. The very fires of the hereafter could get up nothing more than a fitful glimmer in it. In the days I speak of, he never could be made to comprehend why it was that twenty thousand dollars would not go as far in Nevada, where all commodities ranged at enormous figure, as it would in the other territories, where exceeding cheapness was the rule. He was an officer who looked out for the little expenses all the time. The Secretary of the Territory kept his office in his bedroom, as I before remarked, and he charged the United States no rent, although his instructions provided for that item, and he could have justly taken advantage of it, a thing which I would have done with more than lightning promptness if I had been Secretary myself. But the United States never applauded this devotion. Indeed, I think my country was ashamed to have so improvident a person in its employ. Those instructions, we used to read a chapter from them every morning, as intellectual gymnastics, and a couple of chapters in Sunday school every Sabbath, for they treated of all subjects under the sun, and had much valuable religious matter in them, along with the other statistics. Those instructions commanded that pen-knives, envelopes, pens, and writing-paper be furnished the members of the legislature. So the secretary made the purchase and the distribution. The knives cost three dollars apiece. There was one too many, and the secretary gave it to the clerk of the House of Representatives. The United States said the clerk of the House was not a member of the legislature, and took that three dollars out of the secretary's salary, as usual. White men charged three or four dollars a load for sawing up stove wood. The secretary was sagacious enough to know that the United States would never pay any such price as that. So he got an Indian to saw up a load of office wood at one dollar and a half. He made out the usual voucher, but signed no name to it, simply appended a note explaining that an Indian had done the work, and had done it in a very capable and satisfactory way, but could not sign the voucher, owing to lack of ability in the necessary direction. The secretary had to pay that dollar and a half. He thought the United States would admire both his economy and his honesty in getting the work done at half price, and not putting a pretended Indian signature to the voucher, but the United States did not see it in that light. The United States was too much accustomed to employing dollar-and-a-half thieves in all manner of official capacities to regard his explanation of the voucher as having any foundation in fact. But the next time the Indian sawed wood for us I taught him to make a cross at the bottom of the voucher. It looked like a cross that had been drunk a year, and then I witnessed it, and it went through all right. The United States never said a word. I was sorry I had not made the voucher for a thousand loads of wood instead of one. The government of my country snubs honest simplicity, but fondles artistic villainy, and I think I might have developed into a very capable pickpocket if I had remained in the public service a year or two. That was a fine collection of sovereigns, that first Nevada legislature. They levied taxes to the amount of thirty or forty thousand dollars, and ordered expenditures to the extent of about a million. Yet they had their little periodical explosions of economy, like all other bodies of the kind. A member proposed to save three dollars a day to the nation by dispensing with a chaplain. And yet that short-sighted man needed the chaplain more than any other member, perhaps, for he generally sat with his feet on his desk, eating raw turnips during that morning prayer. The legislature sat sixty days, and passed private toll-road franchises all the time. When they adjourned it was estimated that every citizen owned about three franchises 
and it was believed that unless Congress gave the territory another degree of longitude, there would not be room enough to accommodate the toll roads. The ends of them were hanging over the boundary lines everywhere like a fringe. The fact is, the freighting business had grown to such important proportions that there was nearly as much excitement over suddenly acquired toll road fortunes as over the wonderful silver mines. End of chapter 25. This is chapter 26 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain. Chapter 26. By and by I was smitten with the silver fever. Prospecting parties were leaving for the mountains every day, and discovering and taking possession of rich, silver-bearing loads and ledges of quartz. Plainly this was the road to fortune. The great Gould and Curry mine was held at three or four hundred dollars a foot when we arrived, but in two months it had sprung up to eight hundred. The Ophir had been worth only a mere trifle a year gone by, and now it was selling at nearly four thousand dollars a foot. Not a mine could be named that had not experienced an astonishing advance in value within a short time. Everybody was talking about these marvels. Go where you would, you heard nothing else, from morning till far into the night. Tom so-and-so had sold out of the Amanda Smith for forty thousand dollars, hadn't a cent when he took up the ledge six months ago. John Jones had sold half his interest in the Bald Eagle and Mary Ann for sixty-five thousand gold coin, and gone to the States for his family. The widow Brewster had struck it rich in the Golden Fleece, and sold ten feet for eighteen thousand dollars, hadn't money enough to buy a crape bonnet when Sing Sing Tommy killed her husband at Baldy Johnson's wake last spring. The last chance had found a clay casing, and knew they were right on the ledge. Consequence, feet that went begging yesterday were worth a brick house apiece to-day, and seedy owners who could not get trusted for a drink at any bar in the country yesterday were roaring drunk on champagne to-day, and hosts of warm personal friends in a town where they had forgotten how to bow or shake hands from long-continued want of practice. Johnny Morgan, a common loafer, had gone to sleep in the gutter and waked up worth a hundred thousand dollars, in consequence of the decision in the Lady Franklin and Rough and Ready lawsuit. And so on, day in and day out, the talk pelted our ears, and the excitement waxed hotter and hotter around us. I would have been more or less than human if I had not gone mad like the rest. Cartloads of solid silver bricks, as large as pigs of lead, were arriving from the mills every day, and such sights as that gave substance to the wild talk about me. I succumbed, and grew as frenzied as the craziest. Every few days' news would come of the discovery of a brand-new mining region. Immediately the papers would teem with accounts of its richness, and away the surplus population would scamper to take possession. By the time I was fairly inoculated with the disease, Esmeralda had just had a run, and Humboldt was beginning to shriek for attention. Humboldt! Humboldt! was the new cry, and straightaway Humboldt, the newest of the new, the richest of the rich, the most marvellous of the marvellous discoveries in Silverland, was occupying two columns of the public prints to Esmeralda's one. I was just on the point of starting to Esmeralda, but turned with the tide and got ready for Humboldt that the reader may see what moved me, and what would as surely have moved him had he been there, I insert here one of the newspaper letters of the day. It, and several other letters from the same calm hand, were the main means of converting me. I shall not garble the extract, but put it in just as it appeared in the daily territorial enterprise. What about our minds? I shall be candid with you. I shall express an honest opinion based upon a thorough examination. Humboldt County is the richest mineral region upon God's footstool. Each mountain range is gorged with the precious ores. Humboldt is the true Golgonda. The other day an assay of mere croppings yielded exceeding four thousand dollars to the ton. 
a week or two ago an assay of just such surface developments made returns of seven thousand dollars to the ton our mountains are full of rambling prospectors each day and almost every hour reveals new and more startling evidences of the profuse and intensified wealth of our favored county the metal is not silver alone there are distinct ledges of auriferous ore a late discovery plainly evinces cinnabar the coarser metals are in gross abundance lately evidences of bituminous coal have been detected my theory has ever been that coal is a ligneous formation i told colonel whitman in times past that the neighborhood of dayton nevada betrayed no present or previous manifestations of a ligneous foundation and that hence i had no confidence in his lauded coal mines i repeated the same doctrine to the exultant coal discoverers of humboldt i talked with my friend captain birch on the subject my pyrrhonism vanished upon his statement that in the very region referred to he had seen petrified trees of the length of two hundred feet then is the fact established that huge forests once cast their grim shadows over this remote section i am firm in the coal faith have no fears of the mineral resources of humboldt county they are immense incalculable let me state one or two things which will help the reader to better comprehend certain items in the above at this time our near neighbor gold hill was the most successful silver mining locality in nevada it was from there that more than half the daily shipments of silver bricks came very rich and scarce gold hill ore yielded from one hundred to four hundred dollars to the ton but the usual yield was only twenty to forty dollars per ton that is to say each hundred pounds of ore yielded from one dollar to two dollars but the reader will perceive by the above extract that in humboldt from one-fourth to nearly half the mass was silver that is to say every one hundred pounds of the ore had from two hundred dollars up to three hundred and fifty in it some days later this same correspondent wrote i have spoken of the vast and almost fabulous wealth of this region it is incredible the intestines of our mountains are gorged with precious ore to plethora i have said that nature has so shaped our mountains as to furnish most excellent facilities for the working of our mines i have also told you that the country about here is pregnant with the finest mill sites in the world but what is the mining history of humboldt the sheba mine is in the hands of energetic san francisco capitalists it would seem that the ore is combined with metals that render it difficult of reduction with our imperfect mountain machinery the proprietors have combined the capital and labor hinted at in my exordium they are toiling and probing their tunnel has reached the length of one hundred feet from primal assays alone coupled with the development of the mine and public confidence in the continuance of effort the stock had reared itself to eight hundred dollars market value i do not know that one ton of the ore has been converted into current metal i do know that there are many lodes in this section that surpass the sheba in primal assay value listen a moment to the calculations of the sheba operators they propose transporting the ore concentrated to europe the conveyance from star city its locality to virginia city will cost seventy dollars per ton from virginia to san francisco forty dollars per ton from thence to liverpool its destination ten dollars per ton their idea is that its conglomerate metals will reimburse them their cost of original extraction the price of transportation and the expense of reduction and that then a ton of the raw ore will net them twelve hundred dollars the estimate may be extravagant cut it in twain and the product is enormous far transcending any previous developments of our racy territory a very common calculation is that many of our mines will yield five hundred dollars to the ton such fecundity throws the gould and curry the ophir and the mexican of our neighborhood in the darkest shadow i have given you the estimate of the value of a single developed mine its richness is indexed by its market valuation the people of Humboldt County are feet-crazy. As I write, our towns are near deserted. 
they look as languid as a consumptive girl. What has become of our sinewy and athletic fellow-citizens? They are coursing through ravines and over mountain-tops. Their tracks are visible in every direction. Occasionally a horseman will dash among us. His steed betrays hard usage. He alights before his adobe dwelling, hastily exchanges courtesies with his townsmen, hurries to an assay office, and from thence to the district recorders. In the morning, having renewed his provisional supplies, he is off again on his wild and unbeaten route. Why, the fellow numbers already his feet by the thousands. He is the horse leech. He has the craving stomach of the shark or anaconda. He would conquer metallic worlds. This is enough. The instant we had finished reading the above article, four of us decided to go to Humboldt. We commenced getting ready at once, and we also commenced upbraiding ourselves for not deciding sooner, for we were in terror lest all the rich mines would be found and secured before we got there, and we might have to put up with ledges that would not yield more than two or three hundred dollars a ton, maybe. An hour before I would have felt opulent if I had owned ten feet in a gold hill mine whose ore produced twenty-five dollars to the ton. Now I was already annoyed at the prospect of having to put up with mines, the poorest of which would be a marvel in Gold Hill. End of chapter 26 This is chapter 27 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain Chapter 27 Hurry was the word. We wasted no time. Our party consisted of four persons, a blacksmith, sixty years of age, two young lawyers, and myself. We bought a wagon and two miserable old horses. We put eighteen hundred pounds of provisions and mining tools in the wagon, and drove out of Carson on a chilly December afternoon. The horses were so weak and old that we soon found that it would be better if one or two of us got out and walked. It was an improvement. Next we found that it would be better if a third man got out. That was an improvement also. It was at this time that I volunteered to drive. Although I had never driven a harnessed horse before, and many a man in such a position would have felt fairly excused from such a responsibility. But in a little while it was found that it would be a fine thing if the driver got out and walked also. It was at this time that I resigned the position of driver, and never resumed it again. Within the hour we found that it would not only be better, but was absolutely necessary that we four, taking turns, two at a time, should put our hands against the end of the wagon, and push it through the sand, leaving the feeble horses little to do but keep out of the way and hold up the tongue. Perhaps it is well for one to know his fate at first, and get reconciled to it. We had learned ours in one afternoon. It was plain that we had to walk through the sand and shove that wagon and those horses two hundred miles. So we accepted the situation, and from that time forth we never rode. More than that, we stood regular and nearly constant watches pushing up behind. We made seven miles, and camped in the desert. Young Claggett, now member of Congress from Montana, unharnessed and fed and watered the horses. Oliphant and I cut sagebrush, built the fire, and brought water to cook with, and old Mr. Ballou, the blacksmith, did the cooking. This division of labor and this appointment was adhered to throughout the journey. We had no tent, and so we slept under our blankets in the open plain. We were so tired that we slept soundly. We were fifteen days making the trip, two hundred miles. Thirteen, rather, for we lay by a couple of days in one place to let the horses rest. We could really have accomplished the journey in ten days if we had towed the horses behind the wagon, but we did not think of that until it was too late, and so went on shoving the horses and the wagon, too, when we might have saved half the labor. Parties who met us occasionally advised us to put the horses in the wagon, but Mr. Ballou, through whose iron-clad earnestness no sarcasm could pierce, said that that would not do, because the provisions were exposed and would suffer, the horses being bituminous from long deprivation. The reader will excuse me from translating. 
What Mr. Ballou customarily meant when he used a long word was a secret between himself and his Maker. He was one of the best and kindest-hearted men that ever graced a humble sphere of life. He was gentleness and simplicity itself, and unselfishness, too. Although he was more than twice as old as the eldest of us, he never gave himself any airs, privileges, or exemptions on that account. He did a young man's share of the work, and did his share of conversing and entertaining from the general standpoint of any age, not from the arrogant, overawing summit height of sixty years. His one striking peculiarity was his Partingtonian fashion of loving and using big words for their own sakes, and independent of any bearing they might have upon the thought he was proposing to convey. He always let his ponderous syllables fall with an easy unconsciousness that left them wholly without offensiveness. In truth, his air was so natural and so simple that one was always catching himself accepting his stately sentences as meaning something when they really meant nothing in the world. If a word was long and grand and resonant, that was sufficient to win the old man's love, and he would drop that word into the most out-of-the-way place in a sentence or a subject, and be as pleased with it as if it were perfectly luminous with meaning. We four always spread our common stock of blankets together on the frozen ground, and slept side by side and, finding that our foolish long-legged hound pup had a deal of animal heat in him, Oliphant got to admitting him to the bed, between himself and Mr. Ballou, hugging the dog's warm back to his breast, and finding great comfort in it. But in the night the pup would get stretchy, and brace his feet against the old man's back and shove, grunting complacently the while, and now and then, being warm and snug, grateful and happy, he would paw the old man's back simply in excess of comfort, and at yet other times he would dream of the chase, and in his sleep tug at the old man's back hair and bark in his ear. The old gentleman complained mildly about these familiarities at last, and when he got through with his statement he said that such a dog as that was not a proper animal to admit to bed with tired men, because he was so meretricious in his movements and so organic in his emotions we turned the dog out. It was a hard, wearing, toilsome journey, but it had its bright side, for after each day was done and our wolfish hunger appeased with a hot supper of fried bacon, bread, molasses, and black coffee, the pipe-smoking, song-singing, and yarn-spinning around the evening campfire in the still solitudes of the desert was a happy, carefree sort of recreation that seemed the very summit and culmination of earthly luxury. It is a kind of life that has a potent charm for all men, whether city or country-bred. We are descended from desert-lounging Arabs, and countless ages of growth toward perfect civilization have failed to root out of us the nomadic instinct. We all confess to a gratified thrill at the thought of camping out. Once we made twenty-five miles in a day, and once we made forty miles through the great American desert and ten miles beyond, fifty in all, in twenty-three hours, without halting to eat, drink, or rest, to stretch out and go to sleep even on stony and frozen ground, after pushing a wagon and two horses fifty miles, is a delight so supreme that for the moment it almost seems cheap at the price. We camped two days in the neighborhood of the sink of the Humboldt. We tried to use the strong alkaline water of the sink, but it would not answer. It was like drinking lye, and not weak lye, either. It left a taste in the mouth, bitter, and every way execrable, and a burning in the stomach that was very uncomfortable. We put molasses in it, but that helped it very little. We added a pickle, yet the alkali was the prominent taste, and so it was unfit for drinking. The coffee we made of this water was the meanest compound man has yet invented. It was really viler to the taste than the unameliorated water itself. Mr. Blue, being in the architect and builder of the beverage, felt constrained to endorse and uphold it, and so drank half a cup, by little sips, making shift to praise it faintly the while, but finally threw out the remainder and said frankly it was too technical for him. But presently we found a spring of fresh water convenient and then, with nothing to mar our enjoyment, and no stragglers to interrupt it, we entered into our rest. End of chapter 27 
This is Chapter Twenty Eight of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain. Chapter Twenty Eight. After leaving the sink, we traveled along the Humboldt River a little way. People accustomed to the monster mile-wide Mississippi grow accustomed to associating the term river with a high degree of watery grandeur. Consequently, such people feel rather disappointed when they stand on the shores of the Humboldt or the Carson and find that a river in Nevada is a sickly rivulet which is just the counterpart of the Erie Canal in all respects save that the canal is twice as long and four times as deep. One of the pleasantest and most invigorating exercises one can contrive is to run and jump across the Humboldt River till he is overheated, and then drink it dry. On the fifteenth day we completed our march of two hundred miles and entered Unionville, Humboldt County, in the midst of a driving snowstorm. Unionville consisted of eleven cabins and a liberty pole. Six of the cabins were strung along one side of a deep canyon and the other five faced them. The rest of the landscape was made up of bleak mountain walls that rose so high into the sky from both sides of the canyon that the village was left, as it were, far down in the bottom of a crevice. It was always daylight on the mountain tops a long time before the darkness lifted and revealed Unionville. We built a small rude cabin in the side of the crevice and roofed it with canvas, leaving a corner open to serve as a chimney through which the cattle used to tumble occasionally, at night, and mash our furniture and interrupt our sleep. It was very cold weather, and fuel was scarce. Indians brought brush and bushes several miles on their backs, and when we could catch a laden Indian it was well, and when we could not, which was the rule, not the exception, we shivered and bore it. I confess, without shame, that I expected to find masses of silver lying all about the ground. I expected to see it glittering in the sun on the mountain summits. I said nothing about this, for some instinct told me that I might possibly have an exaggerated idea about it, and so if I betrayed my thought I might bring derision upon myself. Yet I was as perfectly satisfied in my own mind as I could be of anything that I was going to gather up, in a day or two, or at furthest a week or two, silver enough to make me satisfactorily wealthy, and so my fancy was already busy with plans for spending this money. The first opportunity that offered, I sauntered carelessly away from the cabin, keeping an eye on the other boys, and stopping and contemplating the sky when they seemed to be observing me. But as soon as the coast was manifestly clear, I fled away as guiltily as a thief might have done, and never halted till I was far beyond sight and call. Then I began my search with a feverish excitement that was brimful of expectation, almost of certainty. I crawled about the ground, seizing and examining bits of stone, blowing the dust from them or rubbing them on my clothes, and then peering at them with anxious hope. Presently I found a bright fragment, and my heart bounded. I hid behind a boulder and polished it and scrutinized it with a nervous eagerness and a delight that was more pronounced than absolute certainty itself could have afforded. The more I examined the fragment, the more I was convinced that I had found the door to fortune. I marked the spot and carried away my specimen. Up and down the rugged mountainside I searched with always increasing interest and always augmenting gratitude that I had come to Humboldt and come in time. Of all the experiences of my life, this secret search among the hidden treasures of Silverland was the nearest to unmarred ecstasy. It was a delirious revel. By and by, in the bed of a shallow rivulet, I found a deposit of shining yellow scales, and my breath almost forsook me. A gold mine, and in my simplicity I had been content with vulgar silver. I was so excited that I half believed my overwrought imagination was deceiving me. Then a fear came upon me that people might be observing me and would guess my secret. Moved by this thought, I made a circuit of the place and ascended a knoll to reconnoiter. Solitude! No creature was near. Then I returned to my mine, fortifying myself against possible disappointment, but my fears were groundless. The shining scales were still there. I set about scooping them out, and for an hour I toiled down the windings of the stream and robbed its bed, 
but at last the descending sun warned me to give up the quest, and I turned homeward, laden with wealth. As I walked along I could not help smiling at the thought of my being so excited over my fragment of silver when a nobler metal was almost under my nose. In this little time the former had so fallen in my estimation that once or twice I was on the point of throwing it away. The boys were as hungry as usual, but I could eat nothing. Neither could I talk. I was full of dreams and far away. Their conversation interrupted the flow of my fancy somewhat, and annoyed me a little, too. I despised the sordid and commonplace things they talked about, but as they proceeded it began to amuse me. It grew to be rare fun to hear them planning their poor little economies, and sighing over possible privations and distresses, when a gold-mine all our own lay within sight of the cabin, and I could point it out at any moment. Smothered hilarity began to oppress me presently. It was hard to resist the impulse to burst out with exultation and reveal everything. But I did resist. I said within myself that I would filter the great news through my lips calmly, and be serene as a summer morning, while I watched its effect in their faces. I said, "'Where have you all been?' "'Prospecting.' "'What did you find?' "'Nothing.' "'Nothing? What do you think of the country?' "'Can't tell yet,' said Mr. Ballou, who was an old gold-miner, and had likewise had considerable experience among the silver mines. "'Well, haven't you formed any sort of opinion?' "'Yes, a sort of a one. It's fair enough here, maybe, but overrated. Seven thousand dollar ledges are scarce, though. That Sheba may be rich enough, but we don't own it. And besides, the rock is so full of base metals that all the science in the world can't work it. We'll not starve here but we'll not get rich, I'm afraid. So you think the prospect is pretty poor? No name for it. Well, we'd better go back, hadn't we? Oh, not yet. Of course not. We'll try it a riffle first. Suppose now, this is merely a supposition, you know, suppose you could find a ledge that would yield, say, a hundred and fifty dollars a ton. Would that satisfy you? Try us once, from the whole party. Or suppose, merely a supposition, of course, Suppose you were to find a ledge that would yield two thousand dollars a ton. Would that satisfy you? Here, what do you mean? What are you coming at? Is there some mystery behind all this? Never mind. I am not saying anything. You know perfectly well there are no rich mines here. Of course you do. Because you have been around and examined for yourselves. Anybody would know that that has been around. But just for the sake of argument, suppose, in a kind of a general way, suppose some person were to tell you that two thousand dollar ledges were simply contemptible contemptible understand and that right yonder in sight of this very cabin there were piles of pure gold and pure silver oceans of it enough to make you all rich in twenty-four hours come i should say he was as crazy as a loon said old balloon but wild with excitement nevertheless gentlemen said i i don't say anything i haven't been around you know and of course don't know anything but all I ask of you is to cast your eye on that, for instance, and tell me what you think of it." And I tossed my treasure before them. There was an eager scramble for it, and a closing of heads together over it under the candlelight. Then Old Blue said, "'Think of it? I think it is nothing but a lot of granite rubbish and nasty glittering mica that isn't worth ten cents an acre.' So vanished my dream. So melted my wealth away so toppled my airy castle to the earth, and left me stricken and forlorn. Moralizing, I observed, then, that all that glitters is not gold. Mr. Ballou said I could go further than that, and lay it up among my treasures of knowledge, that nothing that glitters is gold. So I learned then, once for all, that gold in its native state is but dull, unornamental stuff and that only low-brow metals excite the admiration of the ignorant with an ostentatious glitter. However, like the rest of the world, I still go on underrating men of gold and glorifying men of mica. Commonplace human nature cannot rise above that. End of chapter 28 This is chapter 29 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain. 
Chapter Twenty Nine. True knowledge of the nature of silver mining came fast enough. We went out prospecting with Mr. Ballou. We climbed the mountain sides and clambered among sagebrush, rocks, and snow till we were ready to drop with exhaustion, but found no silver, nor yet any gold. Day after day we did this. Now and then we came upon holes burrowed a few feet into the declivities and apparently abandoned, and now and then we found one or two listless men still burrowing, but there was no appearance of silver. These holes were the beginnings of tunnels, and the purpose was to drive them hundreds of feet into the mountain and some day tap the hidden ledge where the silver was. Some day. It seemed far enough away and very hopeless and dreary. Day after day we toiled and climbed and searched, and we younger partners grew sicker and still sicker of the promiseless toil. At last we halted under a beetling rampart of rock which projected from the earth high upon the mountain. Mr. Ballou broke off some fragments with a hammer and examined them long and attentively with a small eye glass, threw them away and broke off more, said this rock was quartz, and quartz was the sort of rock that contained silver. Contained it. I had thought that at least it would be caked on the outside of it like a kind of veneering. He still broke off pieces and critically examined them, now and then wetting the piece with his tongue and applying the glass. At last he exclaimed, We've got it! We were full of anxiety in a moment. The rock was clean and white, where it was broken, and across it ran a ragged thread of blue. He said that that little thread had silver in it, mixed with base metal, such as lead and antimony, and other rubbish, and that there was a speck or two of gold visible. After a great deal of effort we managed to discern some little fine yellow specks, and judged that a couple of tons of them massed together might make a gold dollar, possibly. We were not jubilant, but Mr. Ballou said there were worse ledges in the world than that. He saved what he called the richest piece of the rock, in order to determine its value by the process called the fire assay. Then we named the mine Monarch of the Mountains. Modesty of nomenclature is not a prominent feature in the mines, and Mr. Ballou wrote out and stuck up the following notice, preserving a copy to be entered upon the books in the mining recorder's office in the town. Notice. We, the undersigned, claim three claims, of three hundred feet each, and one for discovery, on this silver-bearing quartz lead or load, extending north and south from this notice, with all its dips, spurs, and angles, variations, and sinuosities, together with fifty feet of ground on either side, for working the same. We put our names to it, and tried to feel that our fortunes were made, but when we talked the matter all over with Mr. Ballou, we felt depressed and dubious. He said that this surface quartz was not all there was of our mine, but that the wall or ledge of rock called the Monarch of the Mountains extended down hundreds and hundreds of feet into the earth. He illustrated by saying it was like a curbstone, and maintained a nearly uniform thickness, say, twenty feet, away down into the bowels of the earth, and was perfectly distinct from the casing rock on each side of it and that it kept to itself, and maintained its distinctive character always, no matter how deep it extended into the earth, or how far it stretched itself through and across the hills and valleys. He said it might be a mile deep and ten miles long, for all we knew, and that wherever we bored into it, above ground or below, we would find gold and silver in it, but no gold or silver in the meaner rock it was cased between. And he said that down in the great depths of the ledge was its richness, and the deeper it went, the richer it grew. Therefore, instead of working here on the surface, we must either bore down into the rock with a shaft till we came to where it was rich, say a hundred feet or so, or else we must go down into the valley and bore a long tunnel into the mountainside and tap the ledge far under the earth. To do either was plainly the labor of months, for we could blast and bore only a few feet a day, some five or six. But this was not all. He said that after we got the ore out, it must be hauled in wagons to a distant silver mill, ground up, and the silver extracted by a tedious and costly process. Our fortune seemed a century away. But we went to work. We decided to sink a shaft, so for a week we climbed the mountain, laden with picks, drills, gads, crowbars, shovels, cans of blasting powder, and coils of fuse, 
and strove with might and main. At first the rock was broken and loosed, and we dug it up with picks and threw it out with shovels, and the hole progressed very well. But the rock became more compact presently, and gads and crowbars came into play. But shortly nothing could make an impression but blasting powder. That was the weariest work. One of us held the iron drill in its place, and another would strike it with an eight-pound sledge. It was like driving nails on a large scale. In the course of an hour or two the drill would reach a depth of two or three feet, making a hole a couple of inches in diameter. We would put in a charge of powder, insert a half a yard of fuse, pour in sand and gravel, and ram it down, then light the fuse and run. When the explosion came and the rocks and smoke shot into the air, we would go back and find about a bushel of that hard, rebellious quartz jolted out. Nothing more. One week of this satisfied me. I resigned. Claggett and Oliphant followed. Our shaft was only twelve feet deep. We decided that a tunnel was the thing we wanted. So we went down the mountainside and worked a week, at the end of which time we had blasted a tunnel about it deep enough to hide a hog's head in, and judged that about nine hundred feet more of it would reach the ledge. I resigned again, and the other boys only held out one day longer. We decided that a tunnel was not what we wanted. We wanted a ledge that was already developed. There were none in the camp. We dropped the monarch for the time being. Meantime the camp was filling up with people, and there was a constantly growing excitement about our Humboldt mines. We fell victims to the epidemic and strained every nerve to acquire more feet. We prospected and took up new claims, put notices on them, and gave them grandiloquent names. We traded some of our feet for feet in other people's claims. In a little while we owned largely in the Gray Eagle, the Columbiana, the Branch Mint, the Maria Jane, the Universe, the Root Hog or Die, the Samson and Delilah, the Treasure Trove, the Golconda, the Sultana, the Boomerang, the Great Republic, the Grand Mogul, and fifty other mines that had never been molested by a shovel or scratched with a pick. We had not less than thirty thousand feet apiece in the richest mines on earth, as the frenzied cant phrased it, and we were in debt to the butcher. We were stark mad with excitement, drunk with happiness, smothered under mountains of prospective wealth, arrogantly compassionate toward the plodding millions who knew not our marvelous canyon. But our credit was not good at the grocer's. It was the strangest phase of life one can imagine. It was a beggar's revel. There was nothing doing in the district, no mining, no milling, no productive effort, no income, and not enough money in the entire camp to buy a corner lot in an eastern village hardly. And yet a stranger would have supposed he was walking among bloated millionaires. Prospecting parties swarmed out of town with the first flush of dawn, and swarmed in again at nightfall laden with spoil. Rocks! Nothing but rocks. Every man's pockets were full of them. The floor of his cabin was littered with them. They were disposed in labeled rows on his shelves. End of chapter 29 This is chapter 30 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain Chapter 30 I met men at every turn who owned from one thousand to thirty thousand feet in undeveloped silver mines, every single foot of which they believed would shortly be worth from fifty to a thousand dollars, and as often as any other way they were men who had not twenty-five dollars in the world. Every man you met had his new mine to boast of, and his specimens ready, and if the opportunity offered, he would infallibly back you into a corner and offer as a favor to you, not to him, to part with just a few feet in the Golden Age, or the Sarah Jane, or some other unknown stack of croppings, for money enough to get a square meal with, as the phrase went. And you were never to reveal that he made you the offer at such a ruinous price, for it was only out of friendship for you that he was willing to make the sacrifice. Then he would fish a piece of rock out of his pocket and after looking mysteriously around, as if he feared he might be waylaid and robbed if caught with such wealth in his possession, he would dab the rock against his tongue, clap an eyeglass to it, and exclaim, "'Look at that! Right there in that red dirt! See it? 
See the specks of gold? And the streak of silver? That's from the Uncle Abe. There's a hundred thousand tons like that in sight. Right in sight, mind you. And when we get down on it, and the ledge comes in solid, it will be the richest thing in the world. Look at the assay. I don't want you to believe me. Look at the assay. Then he would get out a greasy sheet of paper which showed that the portion of rock assayed had given evidence of containing silver and gold in the proportion of so many hundreds or thousands of dollars to the ton. I little knew then that the custom was to hunt out the richest piece of rock and get it assayed. Very often that piece, the size of a filbert, was the only fragment in a ton that had a particle of metal in it, and yet the assay made it pretend to represent the average value of the ton of rubbish it came from. On such a system of assaying as that, the Humboldt world had gone crazy. On the authority of such assays, its newspaper correspondents were frothing about rock worth four and seven thousand dollars a ton. And, does the reader remember, a few pages back, the calculations of a quoted correspondent whereby the ore is to be mined and shipped all the way to England, the metals extracted, and the gold and silver contents received back by the miners as clear profit? the copper, antimony, and other things in the ore being sufficient to pay all the expenses incurred. Everybody's head was full of such calculations as those, such raving insanity, rather. Few people took work into their calculations, or outlay of money, either, except the work and expenditures of other people. We never touched our tunnel or shaft again. Why? because we judged that we had learned the real secret of success in silver mining, which was not to mine the silver ourselves by the sweat of our brows and the labor of our hands, but to sell the ledges to the dull slaves of toil and let them do the mining. Before leaving Carson, the secretary and I had purchased feet from various Esmeralda stragglers. We had expected immediate returns of bullion, but were only afflicted with regular and constant assessments instead demands for money wherewith to develop the said mines. These assessments had grown so oppressive that it seemed necessary to look into the matter personally. Therefore, I projected a pilgrimage to Carson and thence to Esmeralda. I bought a horse and started, in company with Mr. Ballou and a gentleman named Ollendorf, a Prussian, not the party who has inflicted so much suffering on the world with his wretched foreign grammars, with their interminable repetitions of questions which never have occurred and are never likely to occur in any conversation among human beings. We rode through a snowstorm for two or three days, and arrived at Honey Lake Smith's, a sort of isolated inn on the Carson River. It was a two-story log house situated on a small knoll in the midst of the vast basin or desert through which the sickly Carson winds its melancholy way. Close to the house were the overland stage stables, built of sun-dried bricks. There was not another building within several leagues of the place. Toward sunset about twenty hay-wagons arrived and camped out around the house, and all the teamsters came in to supper. A very, very rough set. There were one or two overland stage-drivers there also, and a half-dozen vagabonds and stragglers. Consequently the house was well crowded. We walked out, after supper, and visited a small Indian camp in the vicinity. The Indians were in a great hurry about something, and were packing up and getting away as fast as they could. In their broken English they said, by and by heap water, and by the help of signs made us understand that in their opinion a flood was coming. The weather was perfectly clear, and this was not the rainy season. There was about a foot of water in the insignificant river, or maybe two feet. The stream was not wider than a back alley in a village, and its banks were scarcely higher than a man's head. So where was the flood to come from? We canvassed the subject a while, and then concluded it was a ruse, and that the Indians had some better reason for leaving in a hurry than fears of a flood in such an exceedingly dry time. At seven in the evening we went to bed in the second story, with our clothes on, as usual, and all three in the same bed, for every available space on the floors, chairs, etc., was in request, and even then there was barely room for the housing of the inn's guests. An hour later we were awakened by a great turmoil, and springing out of bed we picked our way nimbly among the ranks of snoring teamsters on the floor, and got to the front windows of the long room. A glance revealed a strange spectacle under the moonlight. 
the crooked Carson was full to the brim, and its waters were raging and foaming in the wildest way, sweeping around the sharp bends at a furious speed, and bearing on their surface a chaos of logs, brush, and all sorts of rubbish. A depression where its bed had once been in other times was already filling, and in one or two places the water was beginning to wash over the main bank. Men were flying hither and thither, bringing cattle and wagons close up to the house, for the spot of high ground on which it stood extended only some thirty feet in front, and about a hundred in the rear. Close to the old river bed just spoken of stood a little log stable, and in this our horses were lodged. While we looked, the waters increased so fast in this place that in a few minutes a torrent was roaring by the little stable, and its margin encroaching steadily on the logs. We suddenly realized that this flood was not a mere holiday spectacle, but meant damage, and not only to the small log stable, but to the overland buildings close to the main river, for the waves had now come ashore, and were creeping about the foundations, and invading the great hay corral adjoining. We ran down and joined the crowd of excited men and frightened animals. We waded knee-deep into the log stable, unfastened the horses, and waded out almost waist-deep, so fast the water increased. Then the crowd rushed in a body to the hay corral, and began to tumble down the huge stacks of baled hay, and roll the bales up on high ground by the house. Meantime it was discovered that Owens, an overland driver, was missing, and a man ran to the large stable, and, wading in, boot-top deep, discovered him asleep in his bed, awoke him, and waded out again. But Owens was drowsy, and resumed his nap, but only for a minute or two, for presently he turned in his bed, his hand dropped over the side, and came in contact with the cold water. It was up level with a mattress. He waded out, breast-deep almost, and the next moment the sunburned bricks melted down like sugar, and the big building crumbled to a ruin, and was washed away in a twinkling. At eleven o'clock only the roof of the little log stable was out of water, and our inn was on an island in mid-ocean. As far as the eye could reach in the moonlight there was no desert visible, but only a level waste of shining water. The Indians were true prophets, but how did they get their information? I am not able to answer the question. We remained cooped up eight days and nights with that curious crew. Swearing, drinking, and card-playing were the order of the day, and occasionally a fight was thrown in for variety. Dirt and vermin, but let us forget those features. Their profusion is simply inconceivable. It is better that they remain so. There were two men. Uh, however, uh, this chapter is long enough. End of chapter 30 This is chapter 31 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain Chapter 31 There were two men in the company who caused me particular discomfort. One was a little Swede, about twenty-five years old, who knew only one song, and he was forever singing it. By day we were all crowded into one small stifling bar-room, and so there was no escaping this person's music. Through all the profanity, whiskey-guzzling, old sledge, and quarrelling, his monotonous song meandered with never a variation in its tiresome sameness, and it seemed to me, at last, that I would be content to die, in order to be rid of the torture. The other man was a stalwart ruffian called Arkansas, who carried two revolvers in his belt, and a bowie knife projecting from his boot, and who was always drunk, and always suffering for a fight. But he was so feared that nobody would accommodate him. He would try all manner of little wary ruses to entrap somebody into an offensive remark, and his face would light up now and then when he fancied he was fairly on the scent of a fight, but invariably his victim would elude his toils, and then he would show a disappointment that was almost pathetic. The landlord, Johnson, was a meek, well-meaning fellow, and Arkansas fastened on him early as a promising subject, and gave him no rest day or night for a while. On the fourth morning Arkansas got drunk and sat himself down to wait for an opportunity. Presently Johnson came in, just comfortably sociable, with whiskey, and said, "'I reckon the Pennsylvania election—' Arkansas raised his finger impressively, and Johnson stopped. Arkansas rose unsteadily and confronted him. Said he, "'Why, what do you know, uh, uh about Pennsylvania? Answer me that. Why, 
What do you know about Pennsylvania? Well, I was only going to say. You was only going to say. You was. You was only going to say. What was you going to say? That's it. That's what I want to know. I want to know what. What you <coughs> what you know about Pennsylvania, since you're making yourself so damn <coughs> free. Answer me that. Mr. Arkansas, if you'd only let me. Who's a hander you? Don't you insinuate nothing again me. Don't you do it. Don't you come in here bullying around and cussing and going on like a lunatic. Don't you do it. Cause I won't stand it. If fight's what you want, out with it. I'm your man. Out with it. Said Johnson, backing into a corner, Arkansas following menacingly. Why, I, I never said nothing, Mr. Arkansas. You don't give a man no chance. I, I was only going to say that Pennsylvania was going to have an election next week. That was all. That was everything I was. Wish I may never stir. Going to say. I, I wish I may never stir if it wasn't. Well then, why didn't you say it? Why'd you come swelling around that way for trying to raise trouble? Why, well, I, I, I didn't come swelling around, Mr. Arkansas. I just. I am a liar, am I? Great Caesar's ghost! Oh. Please, Mr. Arkansas, I never meant such a thing as that. I wish I may die if I did. All the boys would tell you that I've always spoke well of you, and respected you more than any man in the house. Ask Smith. Ain't it so, Smith? Didn't I say no longer ago than last night that for a man that was a gentleman all the time and every way you took him, give me Arkansas? I'll leave it to any gentleman here, if them weren't the very words I used. Come now, Mr. Arkansas, let's take a drink. Uh, let's, let's shake hands and take a drink. Come on, everybody, it's it's my treat. Come on, Bill, Tom, Bob, Scotty, come up. I want you all to take a drink with me in Arkansas. Old Arkansas, old Arkansas. Give me your hand again. Look at him, boys. Just take a look at him. There stands the whitest man in America. And the man that denies it has got to fight me, that's all. Give me that old flipper again. They embraced with drunken affection on the landlord's part, and unresponsive toleration on the part of Arkansas, who, bribed by a drink, was disappointed of his prey once more. But the foolish landlord was so happy to have escaped butchery that he went on talking when he ought to have marched himself out of danger. The consequence was that Arkansas shortly began to glower upon him dangerously, and presently said, "'Landlord, will you p please make that remark over again, if you please?' But I, I was saying to Scotty that my father was uppers of eighty years old when he died. Was that all that you said? Yes, uh, that was all. Didn't say nothing but that? No, nothing. Then an uncomfortable silence. Arkansas played with his glass a moment, lolling on his elbows on the counter. Then he meditatively scratched his left shin with his right boot while the awkward silence continued. But presently he loafed away toward the stove, looking dissatisfied. Roughly shouldered two or three men out of a comfortable position, occupied it himself, gave a sleeping dog a kick that sent him howling under a bench, then spread his long legs and his blanket coat tails apart and proceeded to warm his back. In a little while he fell to grumbling to himself, and soon he slouched back to the bar and said, "'Landlord, what's your idea for raking up old personalities and blowing about your father?' Ain't this company agreeable to you? Ain't it? If this company ain't agreeable to you, perhaps we'd better leave. Is that your idea? Is that what you're coming at? Why, bless your soul, Arkansas, I weren't thinking of such a thing. My father and my mother— Landlord, don't crowd a man. Don't do it. If nothing will do you but a disturbance, out with it like a man. <laughs> but don't rake up old bygones and fling them in the teeth of a passel of people that wants to be peaceable, if they could get a chance. What's the matter with you this morning, anyway? I never see a man carry on so. Arkansas, I, I really didn't mean no harm, and I won't go on with it if it's unpleasant to you. I reckon my liquor's got into my head, and what with the food, and having so many to feed and look out for. So that's what's a rankle in your heart, is it? You want us to leave, do you? There's too many of us. You want us to pack up and swim, is that it? Come. Please be reasonable, Arkansas. Now you know I ain't the man to— Are you threatening me? Are you? By George, the man don't live that can skeer me. Don't you try to come up that game, my chicken, cause I can stand a good deal, but I won't stand that. Come out from behind that bar till I clean you. You want to drive us out, do you, you sneaking underhanded hound? Come out from behind that bar. I'll learn you to bully and badger and browbeat a gentleman that's forever trying to befriend you and keep you out of trouble. Please, Arkansas, please don't shoot. If there's got to be bloodshed— you Hear that, gentlemen? 
You hear him talk about bloodshed? So it's blood you want, is it, you raven desperado? You've made up your mind to murder somebody this morning. I knowed it perfectly well. Now, I'm the man, am I? It's me you're going to murder, is it? But you can't do it thout I get one chance first, you thieving, black-hearted, white-livered son of a nigger. Draw your weepin'. With that, Arkansas began to shoot, and the landlord to clamber over benches, men, and every sort of obstacle in a frantic desire to escape. In the midst of the wild hubbub, the landlord crashed through a glass door, and as Arkansas charged after him, the landlord's wife suddenly appeared in the doorway and confronted the desperado with a pair of scissors. Her fury was magnificent. With head erect and flashing eyes, she stood a moment, and then advanced, with her weapon raised. The astonished ruffian hesitated, and then fell back a step. She followed. She backed him, step by step, into the middle of the bar-room, and then, while the wondering crowd closed up and gazed, she gave him such another tongue-lashing as never a cowed and shamefaced braggart got before, perhaps. As she finished and retired victorious, a roar of applause shook the house, and every man ordered drinks for the crowd in one and the same breath. The lesson was entirely sufficient. The reign of terror was over and the Arkansas domination broken for good. During the rest of the season of island captivity there was one man who sat apart in a state of permanent humiliation, never mixing in any quarrel or uttering a boast, and never resenting the insults the once cringing crew now constantly leveled at him. And that man was Arkansas. By the fifth or sixth morning the waters had subsided from the land, but the stream in the old river-bed was still high and swift and there was no possibility of crossing it. On the eighth it was still too high for an entirely safe passage, but life in the inn had become next to insufferable by reason of the dirt, drunkenness, fighting, etc., and so we made an effort to get away. In the midst of a heavy snowstorm we embarked in a canoe, taking our saddles aboard and towing our horses after us by their halters. The Prussian, Ollendorf, was in the bow with a paddle. Ballou paddled in the middle, and I sat in the stern holding the halters. When the horses lost their footing and began to swim, Ollendorf got frightened, for there was great danger that the horses would make our aim uncertain, and it was plain that if we failed to land at a certain spot the current would throw us off and almost surely cast us into the main Carson, which was a boiling torrent now. Such a catastrophe would be death in all probability, for we would be swept to sea in the sink, or overturned and drowned. We warned Ollendorf to keep his wits about him and handle himself carefully, but it was useless. The moment the bow touched the bank, he made a spring, and the canoe whirled upside down in ten-foot water. Ollendorf seized some brush and dragged himself ashore, but Ballou and I had to swim for it, encumbered with our overcoats. But we held on to the canoe, and although we were washed down nearly to Carson, we managed to push the boat ashore and make a safe landing. We were cold and water-soaked but safe. The horses made a landing, too, but our saddles were gone, of course. We tied the animals in the sagebrush, and there they had to stay for twenty-four hours. We bailed out the canoe, and ferried over some food and blankets for them, but we slept one more night in the inn before making another venture on our journey. The next morning it was still snowing furiously when we got away with our new stock of saddles and accoutrements. We mounted and started. The snow lay so deep on the ground that there was no sign of a road perceptible, and the snowfall was so thick that we could not see more than a hundred yards ahead, else we could have guided our course by the mountain ranges. The case looked dubious, but Ollendorf said his instinct was as sensitive as any compass, and that he could strike a bee-line for Carson City and never diverge from it. He said that if he were to straggle a single point out of the true line his instinct would assail him like an outraged conscience. Consequently, we dropped into his wake, happy and content. For half an hour we poked along warily enough, but at the end of that time we came upon a fresh trail, and Ollendorf shouted proudly, "'I knew I was dead as certain as a compass, boys. Here we are, right in somebody's tracks that will hunt the way for us without any trouble. Let's hurry up and join company with the party.' So we put the horses into as much of a trot as the deep snow would allow, and before long it was evident that we were gaining on our predecessors, for the tracks grew more distinct. We hurried along, and at the end of an hour the tracks looked still newer and fresher. But what surprised us was that the number of travellers in advance of us seemed to steadily increase. 
we wondered how so large a party came to be traveling at such a time and in such a solitude. Somebody suggested that it must be a company of soldiers from the fort, and so we accepted that solution and jogged along a little faster still, for they could not be far off now. But the tracks still multiplied, and we began to think the platoon of soldiers was miraculously expanding into a regiment. Ballou said they had already increased to five hundred. Presently he stopped his horse and said, "'Boys, these are our own tracks, and we've actually been circusing around and round in a circle for more than two hours out here in this blind desert. By George, this is perfectly hydraulic!' Then the old man waxed wroth and abusive. He called Ollendorf all manner of hard names, said he never saw such a lurid fool as he was, and ended with a peculiarly venomous opinion that he did not know as much as a logarithm. We certainly had been following our own tracks. Ollendorf and his mental compass were in disgrace from that moment. After all our hard travel, here we were on the bank of the stream again, with the inn beyond dimly outlined through the driving snowfall. While we were considering what to do, the young Swede landed from the canoe and took his pedestrian way Carsonwards, singing his same tiresome song about his sister and his brother, and the child in the grave with its mother, and in a short minute faded and disappeared in the white oblivion. He was never heard of again. He no doubt got bewildered and lost, and fatigue delivered him over to sleep, and sleep betrayed him to death. Possibly he followed our treacherous tracks till he became exhausted and dropped. Presently the overland stage forded the now fast receding stream, and started toward Carson, on its first trip since the flood came. We hesitated no longer now, but took up our march in its wake, and trotted merrily along, for we had good confidence in the driver's bump of locality. But our horses were no match for the fresh stage team. We were soon left out of sight. But it was no matter, for we had the deep ruts of the wheels made for a guide. By this time it was three in the afternoon, and consequently it was not very long before night came, and not with a lingering twilight, but with a sudden shutting down like a cellar door, as is its habit in that country. The snowfall was still as thick as ever, and of course we could not see fifteen steps before us, but all about us the white glare of the snow-bed enabled us to discern the smooth sugar-loaf mounds made by the covered sage-bushes, and just in front of us the two faint grooves which we knew were the steadily filling and slowly disappearing wheel-tracks. Now those sage-brushes were all about the same height, three or four feet. They stood just about seven feet apart, and all over the vast desert. Each of them was a mere snow-mound now. In any direction that you proceeded, the same as in a well-laid-out orchard, you would find yourself moving down a distinctly defined avenue, with a row of these snow-mounds on either side of it an avenue the customary width of a road, nice and level in its breadth, and rising at the sides in the most natural way by reason of the mounds. But we had not thought of this. Then imagine the chilly thrill that shot through us when it finally occurred to us, far in the night, that since the last faint trace of the wheel-tracks had long ago been buried from sight, we might now be wandering down a mere sagebrush avenue, miles away from the road, and diverging further and further away from it all the time. Having a cake of ice slipped down one's back is placid comfort compared to it. There was a sudden leap and stir of blood that had been asleep for an hour, and as sudden a rousing of all the drowsing activities in our minds and bodies. We were alive and awake at once, and shaking and quaking with consternation, too. There was an instant halting and dismounting a bending low, and an anxious scanning of the road-bed. Useless, of course, for if a faint depression could not be discerned from an altitude of four or five feet above it, it certainly could not, with one's nose nearly against it. End of chapter 31 This is chapter 32 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain Chapter 32 We seemed to be in a road, but that was no proof. We tested this by walking off in various directions. The regular snow-mounds and the regular avenues between them convinced each man that he had found the true road, and that the others had found only false ones. Plainly the situation was desperate. We were cold and stiff, and the horses were tired. We decided to build a sagebrush fire and camp out till morning. 
This was wise, because if we were wandering from the right road, and the snowstorm continued another day, our case would be the next thing to hopeless if we kept on. All agreed that a campfire was what would come nearest to saving us now, and so we set about building it. We could find no matches, and so we tried to make shift with the pistols. Not a man in the party had ever tried to do such a thing before, but not a man in the party doubted that it could be done, and without any trouble, because every man in the party had read about it in books many a time, and had naturally come to believe it with trusting simplicity, just as he had long ago accepted and believed that other common book fraud about Indians and lost hunters, making a fire by rubbing two dry sticks together. We huddled together on our knees in the deep snow, and the horses put their noses together and bowed their patient heads over us. And while the feathery flakes eddied down and turned us into a group of white statuary, we proceeded with the momentous experiment. We broke twigs from a sage-bush and piled them on a little cleared place in the shelter of our bodies. In the course of ten or fifteen minutes all was ready, and then— while conversation ceased, our pulses beat low with anxious suspense, Ollendorf applied his revolver, pulled the trigger, and blew the pile clear out of the county. It was the flattest failure that ever was. This was distressing, but it paled before a great horror. The horses were gone. I had been appointed to hold the bridles, but in my absorbing anxiety over the pistol experiment I had unconsciously dropped them, and the released animals had walked off in the storm. It was useless to try to follow them, for their footfalls could make no sound, and one could pass within two yards of the creatures and never see them. We gave them up without an effort at recovering them, and cursed the lying books that said horses would stay by their masters for protection and companionship in a distressful time like ours. We were miserable enough before. We felt still more forlorn now. Patiently, but with blighted hope, we broke more sticks and piled them, and once more the Prussians shot them into annihilation. Plainly, to light a fire with a pistol was an art requiring patience and experience, and the middle of a desert, at midnight, in a snowstorm, was not a good place or time for the acquiring of the accomplishment. We gave it up and tried the other. Each man took a couple of sticks and fell to chafing them together. At the end of half an hour we were thoroughly chilled, and so were the sticks. We bitterly execrated the Indians, the hunters, and the books that had betrayed us with the silly device, and wondered dismally what was next to be done. This critical moment Mr. Ballou fished out four matches from the rubbish of an overlooked pocket. To have found four gold bars would have seemed poor and cheap good luck compared to this. One cannot think how good a match looks under such circumstances, or how lovable and precious, and sacredly beautiful to the eye. This time we gathered sticks with high hopes, and when Mr. Ballou prepared to light the first match, there was an amount of interest centered upon him that pages of writing could not describe. The match burned hopefully a moment, and then went out. It could not have carried more regret with it than if it had been a human life. The next match simply flashed and died. The wind puffed the third one out, just as it was on the imminent verge of success. We gathered together, closer than ever, and developed a solicitude that was rapt and painful, as Mr. Ballou scratched our last hope on his leg. It lit, turned blue and sickly, and then budded into a robust flame. Shading it with his hands, the old gentleman bent gradually down, and every heart went with him, everybody too, for that matter, and blood and breath stood still. The flame touched the sticks at last, took gradual hold upon them, hesitated, took a stronger hold, hesitated again, held its breath five heart-breaking seconds, then gave a sort of human gasp, and went out. Nobody said a word for several minutes. It was a solemn sort of silence. Even the wind put on a stealthy, sinister quiet, and made no more noise than the falling flakes of snow. Finally a sad-voiced conversation began, and it was soon apparent that in each of our hearts lay the conviction that this was our last night with the living. I had so hoped that I was the only one who felt so. When the others calmly acknowledged their conviction, it sounded like the summons itself. Ollendorf said, "'Brothers, let us die together, and let us go without one hard feeling toward each other. 
let us forget and forgive bygones. I know that you have felt hard toward me for turning over the canoe, and for knowing too much, and leading you round and round in the snow. But I meant well. Forgive me. I acknowledge freely that I have had hard feelings against Mr. Blue for abusing me and calling me a logarithm, which is a thing I do not know what, but no doubt a thing considered disgraceful and unbecoming in America, and it has scarcely been out of my mind and has hurt me a great deal. But let it go. I forgive Mr. Ballou with all my heart, and—poor Ollendorf broke down and the tears came. He was not alone, for I was crying too, and so was Mr. Ballou. Ollendorf got his voice again, and forgave me for things I had done and said. Then he got out his bottle of whiskey and said that, whether he lived or died, he would never touch another drop. He said he had given up all hope of life, and although ill-prepared, was ready to submit humbly to his fate that he wished he could be spared a little longer, not for any selfish reason, but to make a thorough reform in his character, and by devoting himself to helping the poor, nursing the sick, and pleading with the people to guard themselves against the evils of intemperance, make his life a beneficent example to the young, and lay it down at last with a precious reflection that it had not been lived in vain. He ended by saying that his reform should begin at this moment, even here, in the presence of death, since no longer time was to be vouchsafed wherein to prosecute it to men's help and benefit, and with that he threw away the bottle of whiskey. Mr. Ballou made remarks of similar purport, and began the reform he could not live to continue by throwing away the ancient pack of cards that had solaced our captivity during the flood, and made it bearable. He said he never gambled, but still was satisfied that the meddling with cards in any way was immoral and injurious, and no man could be wholly pure and blemishless without eschewing them. "'And therefore,' continued he, "'in doing this act I already feel more in sympathy with that spiritual Saturnalia necessary to entire and obsolete reform.' These rolling syllables touched him as no intelligible eloquence could have done and the old man sobbed, with a mournfulness not unmingled with satisfaction. My own remarks were of the same tenor as those of my comrades, and I know that the feelings that prompted them were heartfelt and sincere. We were all sincere, and all deeply moved and earnest, for we were in the presence of death and without hope. I threw away my pipe, and in doing it felt that at last I was free of a hated vice, and one that had ridden me like a tyrant all my days. While I yet talked, the thought of the good I might have done in the world, and the still greater good I might now do, with these new incentives and higher and better aims to guide me, if I could only be spared a few years longer, overcame me, and the tears came again. We put our arms about each other's necks, and awaited the warning drowsiness that precedes death by freezing. It came stealing over us presently, and then we bade each other a last farewell. A delicious dreaminess wrought its web about my yielding senses, while the snowflakes wove a winding sheet about my conquered body. Oblivion came. The battle of life was done. End of chapter 32 This is chapter 33 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain Chapter 33 I do not know how long I was in a state of forgetfulness, but it seemed an age. A vague consciousness grew upon me by degrees, and then came a gathering anguish of pain in my limbs and through all my body. I shuddered. The thought flitted through my brain, This is death. This is the hereafter. Then came a white upheaval at my side, and a voice said with bitterness, Will some gentleman be so good as to kick me behind? It was Baloo. At least it was a tousled snow image in a sitting posture with Baloo's voice. I rose up, and there in the gray dawn, not fifteen steps from us, were the frame buildings of a stage station, and under a shed stood our still saddled and bridled horses. An arch snowdrift broke up, now, and Ollendorf emerged from it, and the three of us sat and stared at the houses without speaking a word. We really had nothing to say. We were like the profane man who could not do the subject justice. The whole situation was so painfully ridiculous and humiliating that words were tame, 
and we did not know where to commence anyhow. The joy in our hearts at our deliverance was poisoned. Well nigh dissipated, indeed. We presently began to grow pettish by degrees, and sullen, and then angry at each other, angry at ourselves, angry at everything in general. We moodily dusted the snow from our clothing, and in unsociable single file plowed our way to the horses, unsaddled them, and sought shelter in the station. I have scarcely exaggerated a detail of this curious and absurd adventure. It occurred almost exactly as I have stated it. We actually went into camp in a snowdrift in a desert, at midnight in a storm, forlorn and hopeless, within fifteen steps of a comfortable inn. For two hours we sat apart in the station, and ruminated in disgust. The mystery was gone now, and it was plain enough why the horses had deserted us. Without a doubt they were under that shed a quarter of a minute after they had left us, and they must have overheard and enjoyed all our confessions and lamentations. After breakfast we felt better, and the zest of life soon came back. The world looked bright again, and existence was as dear to us as ever. Presently an uneasiness came over me, grew upon me, assailed me without ceasing. Alas, my regeneration was not complete. I wanted to smoke. I resisted with all my strength. But the flesh was weak. I wandered away alone, and wrestled with myself an hour. I recalled my promises of reform, and preached to myself persuasively, upbraidingly, exhaustively. But it was all vain. I shortly found myself sneaking among the snowdrifts, hunting for my pipe. I discovered it after a considerable search, and crept away to hide myself and enjoy it. I remained behind the barn a good while, asking myself how I would feel if my braver, stronger, truer comrades should catch me in my degradation. At last I lit the pipe, and no human being can feel meaner and baser than I did then. I was ashamed of being in my own pitiful company. Still dreading discovery, I felt that perhaps the further side of the barn would be somewhat safer, and so I turned the corner. As I turned the one corner, smoking, Ollendorf turned the other, with his bottle to his lips, and between us sat unconscious Baloo, deep in a game of solitaire, with the old greasy cards. Absurdity could go no farther. We shook hands, and agreed to say no more about reform and examples to the rising generation. The station we were at was at the verge of the twenty-six-mile desert. If we had approached it half an hour earlier the night before, we must have heard men shouting there and firing pistols, for they were expecting some sheep-drovers and their flocks, and knew that they would infallibly get lost and wander out of reach of help unless guided by sounds. While we remained at the station, three of the drovers arrived, nearly exhausted with their wanderings, but two others of their party were never heard of afterward. We reached Carson in due time, and took a rest. This rest, together with preparations for the journey to Esmeralda, kept us there a week, and the delay gave us the opportunity to be present at the trial of the great landslide case of Hyde v. Morgan, an episode which is famous in Nevada to this day. After a word or two of necessary explanation, I will set down the history of this singular affair just as it transpired. End of chapter 33 This is chapter 34 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain. Chapter 34 the mountains are very high and steep about Carson, Eagle, and Washoe Valleys, very high and very steep, and so when the snow gets to melting off fast in the spring, and the warm-surfaced earth begins to moisten and soften, the disastrous landslides commence. The reader cannot know what a landslide is, unless he has lived in that country, and seen the whole side of a mountain taken off some fine morning and deposited down in the valley, leaving a vast, treeless, unsightly scar upon the mountain's front, to keep the circumstance fresh in his memory all the years that he may go on living within seventy miles of that place. General Buncombe was shipped out to Nevada in the invoice of territorial officers to be United States Attorney. 
he considered himself a lawyer of parts and he very much wanted an opportunity to manifest it partly for the pure gratification of it and partly because his salary was territorially meagre which is a strong expression now the older citizens of a new territory look down upon the rest of the world with a calm benevolent compassion as long as it keeps out of the way when it gets in the way they snub it sometimes this latter takes the shape of a practical joke one morning dick hyde rode furiously up to general buncombe's door in carson city and rushed into his presence without stopping to tie his horse he seemed much excited he told the general that he wanted him to conduct a suit for him and would pay him five hundred dollars if he achieved a victory and then with violent gestures and a world of profanity he poured out his grief he said it was pretty well known that for some years he had been farming or ranching as the more customary term is in washoe district and making a successful thing of it and furthermore it was known that his ranch was situated just in the edge of the valley and that tom morgan owned a ranch immediately above it on the mountain side and now the trouble was that one of those hated and dreaded landslides had come and slid morgan's ranch fences cabins cattle barns and everything down on top of his ranch and exactly covered up every single vestige of his property to a depth of about thirty-eight feet morgan was in possession and refused to vacate the premises said he was occupying his own cabin and not interfering with anybody else's and said the cabin was standing on the same dirt and same ranch it had always stood on and he would like to see anybody make him vacate and when i reminded him said hyde weeping that it was on top of my ranch and that he was trespassing he had the infernal meanness to ask me why didn't i stay on my ranch and hold possession when i see him a-comin why didn't i stay on it the blathering lunatic by george when i heard that racket and looked up that hill it was just like the whole world was a-rippin and a-tearin down that mountainside splinters and cordwood thunder and lightning hail and snow odds and ends of haystacks and awful clouds of dust trees going end over end in the air rocks as big as a house jumping about a thousand feet high and busting into ten million pieces cattle turned inside out and a-comin head on with their tails hanging out between their teeth and in the midst of all that rack and destruction sought that cussed morgan on his gate-post a wonderin why i didn't stay and hold possession laws bless me i just took one glimpse general and lit out in the county in three jumps exactly but what grinds me is that that morgan hangs on there and won't move off in that ranch says it's his'n and he's going to keep it likes it better than he did when it was higher up the hill mad well i've been so mad for two days i couldn't find my way to town been wandering round in the brush in a starving condition got anything here to drink general but i'm here now and i'm a-going to law you hear me never in all the world perhaps were a man's feelings so outraged as were the general's he said he had never heard of such high-handed conduct in all his life as this morgan's and he said there was no use in going to law morgan had no shadow of right to remain where he was nobody in the wide world would uphold him in it and no lawyer would take his case and no judge listen to it hyde said that right there was where he was mistaken everybody in town sustained morgan hal brayton a very smart lawyer had taken his case the courts being in vacation it was to be tried before a referee and ex-governor roop had already been appointed to that office and would open his court in a large public hall near the hotel at two that afternoon the general was amazed he said he had suspected before that the people of that territory were fools and now he knew it but he said rest easy rest easy and collect the witnesses for the victory was just as certain as if the conflict were already over hyde wiped away his tears and left at two in the afternoon referee roop's court opened and roop appeared throned among his sheriffs the witnesses and spectators and wearing upon his face a solemnity so awe-inspiring that some of his fellow conspirators had misgivings that maybe he had not comprehended after all that this was merely a joke an unearthly stillness prevailed for at the slightest noise the judge uttered sternly the command order in the court and the sheriffs promptly echoed it 
Presently the general elbowed his way through the crowd of spectators, with his arms full of law-books, and on his ears fell an order from the judge, which was the first respectful recognition of his high official dignity that had ever saluted them, and it trickled pleasantly through his whole system. "'Way for the United States Attorney!' The witnesses were called legislators, high government officers, ranchmen, miners, Indians, Chinamen, Negroes. Three-fourths of them were called by the defendant Morgan, but no matter, their testimony invariably went in favor of the plaintiff Hyde. Each new witness only added new testimony to the absurdity of a man's claiming to own another man's property because his farm had slid down on top of it. Then the Morgan lawyers made their speeches, and seemed to make singularly weak ones. They did really nothing to help the Morgan cause, and now the general, with exultation in his face, got up and made an impassioned effort. He pounded the table, he banged the law-books, he shouted and roared and howled, he quoted from everything and everybody—poetry, sarcasm, statistics, history, pathos, bathos, blasphemy and wound up with a grand war-whoop for free speech, freedom of the press, free schools, the glorious bird of America, and the principles of eternal justice. Applause. When the general sat down, he did it with a conviction that if there was anything in good strong testimony, a great speech, and believing and admiring countenances all around, Mr. Morgan's case was killed. Ex-Governor Roop leant his head upon his hand for some minutes, thinking— and the still audience waited for his decision. Then he got up and stood erect, with bended head, and thought again. Then he walked the floor with long, deliberate strides, his chin in his hand, and still the audience waited. At last he returned to his throne, seated himself, and began impressively, "'Gentlemen, I feel the great responsibility that rests upon me this day. This is no ordinary case.' On the contrary, it is plain that it is the most solemn and awful that ever man was called upon to decide. Gentlemen, I have listened attentively to the evidence, and have perceived that the weight of it, the overwhelming weight of it, is in favor of the plaintive Hyde. I have listened also to the remarks of counsel with high interest, and especially will I commend the masterly and irrefutable logic of the distinguished gentleman who represents the plaintive. But, gentlemen, let us beware how we allow mere human testimony, human ingenuity in argument, and human ideas of equity to influence us at a moment so solemn as this. Gentlemen, it ill becomes us, worms as we are, to meddle with the decrees of heaven. It is plain to me that heaven, in its inscrutable wisdom, has seen fit to move this defendant's ranch for a purpose. We are but creatures, and we must submit." If heaven has chosen to favor the defendant Morgan in this marked and wonderful manner, and if heaven, dissatisfied with the position of the Morgan ranch upon the mountainside, has chosen to remove it to a position more eligible and more advantageous for its owner, it ill becomes us insects as we are to question the legality of the act, or inquire into the reasons that prompted it. No, heaven created the ranches, and it is heaven's prerogative to rearrange them, to experiment with them around at its pleasure. It is for us to submit, without repining. I warn you that this thing which has happened is a thing with which the sacrilegious hands and brains and tongues of men must not meddle. Gentlemen, it is the verdict of this court that the plaintiff, Richard Hyde, has been deprived of his ranch by the visitation of God, and from this decision there is no appeal. Buncombe seized his cargo of law-books, and plunged out of the courtroom frantic with indignation. He pronounced Roop to be a miraculous fool, an inspired idiot. In all good faith he returned at night, and remonstrated with Roop upon his extravagant decision, and implored him to walk the floor and think for half an hour, and see if he could not figure out some sort of modification of the verdict. Roop yielded at last, and got up to walk. He walked two hours and a half, and at last his face lit up happily, and he told Buncan it had occurred to him that the ranch underneath the new Morgan ranch still belonged to Hyde, that his title to the ground was just as good as it had ever been, and therefore he was of the opinion that Hyde had a right to dig it out from under there, and the general never waited to hear the end of it. 
He was always an impatient and irascible man that way. At the end of two months the fact that he had been played upon with a joke had managed to bore itself, like another Hussek tunnel, through the solid adamant of his understanding. End of chapter 34 This is chapter 35 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain. Chapter 35. We finally left for Esmeralda, horseback. We had an addition to the company in the person of Captain John Nye, the governor's brother. He had a good memory, and a tongue hung in the middle. This is a combination which gives immortality to conversation. Captain John never suffered the talk to flag or falter once during the hundred and twenty miles of the journey. In addition to his conversational powers, he had one or two other endowments of a marked character. One was a singular handiness about doing anything and everything, from laying out a railroad or organizing a political party, down to sewing on buttons, shoeing a horse, or setting a broken leg or a hen. Another was a spirit of accommodation that prompted him to take the needs, difficulties, and perplexities of anybody and everybody upon his own shoulders at any and all times, and dispose of them with admirable facility and alacrity. Hence he always managed to find vacant beds in crowded inns, and plenty to eat in the emptiest larders. And finally, wherever he met a man, woman, or child in camp, inn, or desert, he either knew such parties personally, or had been acquainted with a relative of the same. Such another traveling comrade was never seen before. I cannot forbear giving a specimen of the way in which he overcame difficulties. On the second day out we arrived, very tired and hungry, at a poor little inn in the desert, and were told that the house was full, no provisions on hand, and neither hay nor barley to spare for the horses. Must move on. The rest of us wanted to hurry on while it was yet light, but Captain John insisted on stopping a while. We dismounted and entered. There was no welcome for us on any face. Captain John began his blandishments, and within twenty minutes he had accomplished the following things, viz. found old acquaintances in three teamsters, discovered that he used to go to school with the landlord's mother, recognized his wife as a lady whose life he had saved once in California by stopping her runaway horse, mended a child's broken toy, and won the favor of its mother, a guest of the inn, helped the hosteler bleed a horse, and prescribed for another horse that had the heaves, treated the entire party three times at the landlord's bar, produced a later paper than anybody had seen for a week, and sat himself down to read the news to a deeply interested audience. The result, summed up, was as follows. The hosteler found plenty of feed for our horses, we had a trout supper, an exceedingly sociable time after it, good beds to sleep in, and a surprising breakfast in the morning. And when we left, we left lamented by all. Captain John had some bad traits, but he had some uncommonly valuable ones to offset them with. Esmeralda was in many respects another Humboldt, but in a little more forward state. The claims we had been paying assessments on were entirely worthless, and we threw them away. The principal one cropped out of the top of a knoll that was fourteen feet high, and the inspired board of directors were running a tunnel under that knoll to strike the ledge. The tunnel would have to be seventy feet long, and would then strike the ledge at the same depth that a shaft twelve feet deep would have reached. The board were living on the assessments. Note bene, this hint comes too late for the enlightenment of New York silver miners. They have already learned all about this neat trick by experience. The board had no desire to strike the ledge, knowing that it was as barren of silver as a curbstone. This reminiscence calls to mind Jim Townsend's tunnel. He had paid assessments on a mine called the Daily, till he was well-nigh penniless. Finally an assessment was levied to run a tunnel two hundred and fifty feet on the daily, and Townsend went up on the hill to look into the matters. He found the daily cropping out of the apex of an exceedingly sharp-pointed peak, and a couple of men up there facing the proposed tunnel. Townsend made a calculation. Then he said to the men, "'So you have taken a contract to run a tunnel into this hill two hundred and fifty feet to strike this ledge?' "'Yes, sir.' 
well do you know that you have got one of the most expensive and arduous undertakings before you that was ever conceived by man why no how is that because this hill is only twenty-five feet through from side to side and so you have got to build two hundred and twenty-five feet of your tunnel on trestle work the ways of silver mining boards are exceedingly dark and sinuous we took up various claims and commenced shafts and tunnels on them but never finished any of them we had to do a certain amount of work on each to hold it else uh, other parties could seize our property after the expiration of ten days we were always hunting up new claims and doing a little work on them and then waiting for a buyer who never came we never found any ore that would yield more than fifty dollars a ton and as the mills charged fifty dollars a ton for working ore and extracting the silver our pocket money melted steadily away and none returned to take its place we lived in a little cabin and cooked for ourselves and altogether it was a hard life though a hopeful one for we never ceased to expect fortune and a customer to burst upon us some day at last when flour reached a dollar a pound and money could not be borrowed on the best security at less than eight per cent a month i being without the security too i abandoned mining and went to milling that is to say i went to work as a common laborer in a quartz mill at ten dollars a week and board end of chapter thirty five this is chapter thirty six of roughing it this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer visit librivox dot org roughing it by mark twain chapter thirty six i had already learned how hard and long and dismal a task it is to burrow down into the bowels of the earth and get out the coveted ore and now i learned that the burrowing was only half the work and that to get the silver out of the ore was the dreary and laborious other half of it we had to turn out at six in the morning and keep at it till dark this mill was a six-stamp affair driven by steam six tall upright rods of iron as large as a man's ankle and heavily shod with a mass of iron and steel at their lower ends were framed together like a gate and these rose and fell one after the other in a ponderous dance in an iron box called a battery each of these rods or stamps weighed six hundred pounds one of us stood by the battery all day long breaking up masses of silver bearing rock with a sledge and shoveling it into the battery the ceaseless dance of the stamps pulverized the rock to powder and a stream of water that trickled into the battery turned it into a creamy paste the minutest particles were driven through a fine wire screen which fitted close round the battery and were washed into great tubs warmed by superheated steam amalgamating pans they are called the mass of pulp in the pans was kept constantly stirred up by revolving mullers a quantity of quicksilver was kept always in the battery and this seized some of the liberated gold and silver particles and held on to them quicksilver was shaken in a fine shower into the pans also about every half hour through a buckskin sack quantities of coarse salt and sulphate of copper were added from time to time to assist the amalgamation by destroying these base metals which coated the gold and silver and would not let it unite with the quicksilver all these tiresome things we had to attend to constantly streams of dirty water flowed always from the pans and were carried off in broad wooden troughs to the ravine one would not suppose that atoms of gold and silver would float on top of six inches of water but they did and in order to catch them coarse blankets were laid in the troughs and little obstructing riffles charged with quicksilver were placed here and there across the troughs also these riffles had to be cleaned and the blankets washed out every evening to get their precious accumulations and after all this eternity of trouble one-third of the silver and gold in a ton of rock would find its way to the end of the troughs in the ravine at last and have to be worked over again some day there is nothing so aggravating as silver mining there never was any idle time in that mill there was always something to do it is a pity that adam could not have gone straight out of eden into a quartz mill in order to understand the full force of his doom to 
earn his bread by the sweat of his brow. Every now and then during the day we had to scoop some pulp out of the pans and tediously wash it in a horn spoon, wash it little by little over the edge till at last nothing was left but some little dull globules of quicksilver in the bottom. If they were soft and yielding, the pan needed some salt or some sulfate of copper or some other chemical rubbish to assist digestion. If they were crisp to the touch and would retain a dint, they were freighted with all the silver and gold they could seize and hold, and consequently the pan needed a fresh charge of quicksilver. When there was nothing else to do, one could always screen tailings, that is to say, he could shovel up the dried sand that had washed down to the ravine through the troughs, and dash it against an upright wire screen, to free it from pebbles and prepare it for working over. The process of amalgamation differed in the various mills, and this included changes in the style of pans and other machinery, and a great diversity of opinion existed as to the best in use, but none of the methods employed involved the principle of milling or without screening the tailings. Of all recreations in the world, screening tailings on a hot day with a long-handled shovel is the most undesirable. At the end of the week the machinery was stopped, and we cleaned up. That is to say, we got the pulp out of the pans and batteries, and washed the mud patiently away till nothing was left but the long accumulating mass of quicksilver, with its imprisoned treasures. This we made into heavy, compact snowballs, and piled them up in a bright, luxurious heap for inspection. Making these snowballs cost me a fine gold ring, that and ignorance, together for the quicksilver invaded the ring with the same facility with which water saturates a sponge, separated its particles, and the ring crumbled to pieces. We put our pile of quicksilver balls into an iron retort that had a pipe leading from it to a pail of water, and then applied a roasting heat. The quicksilver turned to vapor, escaped through the pipe into the pail, and the water turned it into good wholesome quicksilver again. Quicksilver is very costly, and they never waste it. On opening the retort there was our week's work, a lump of pure white, frosty-looking silver, twice as large as a man's head. Perhaps a fifth of the mass was gold, but the color of it did not show, would not have shown, if two-thirds of it had been gold. We melted it up, and made a solid brick of it by pouring it into an iron brick mold. By such a tedious and laborious process were silver bricks obtained. This mill was but one of many others in operation at the time. The first one in Nevada was built at Egan Canyon, and was a small insignificant affair, and compared most unfavorably with some of the immense establishments afterwards located at Virginia City and elsewhere. From our bricks a little corner was chipped off for the fire assay, a method used to determine the proportions of gold, silver, and base metals in the mass. This is an interesting process. The chip is hammered out as thin as paper, and weighed on scales so fine and sensitive that if you weigh a two-inch scrap of paper on them, and then write your name on the paper with a coarse, soft pencil, and weigh it again, the scales will take marked notice of the addition. Then a little lead, also weighed, is rolled up with the flake of silver, and the two are melted at a great heat in a small vessel called a cupel made by compressing bone ashes into a cup shape in a steel mold. The base metals oxidize and are absorbed with the lead into the pores of the cupel. A button or globule of perfectly pure gold and silver is left behind, and by weighing it and noting the loss, the assayer knows the proportion of base metal the brick contains. He has to separate the gold from the silver now. The button is hammered out flat and thin put in the furnace and kept some time at a red heat. After cooling it off, it is rolled up like a quill and heated in a glass vessel containing nitric acid. The acid dissolves the silver and leaves the gold pure, and ready to be weighed on its own merits. Then salt water is poured into the vessel containing the dissolved silver, and the silver returns to palpable form again, and sinks to the bottom. Nothing now remains but to weigh it. Then the proportions of the several metals contained in the brick are known, and the assayer stamps the value of the brick upon its surface. The sagacious reader will know now, without being told, that the speculative miner, 
in getting a fire assay made of a piece of rock from his mine to help him sell the same was not in the habit of picking out the least valuable fragment of rock on his dump pile but quite the contrary i have seen men hunt over a pile of nearly worthless quartz for an hour and at last find a little piece as large as a filbert which was rich in gold and silver and this was reserved for a fire assay of course the fire assay would demonstrate that a ton of such rock would yield hundreds of dollars and on such assays many an utterly worthless mine was sold assaying was a good business and so some men engaged in it occasionally who were not strictly scientific uh, and capable one assayer got such rich results out of all specimens brought to him that in time he acquired almost a monopoly of the business but like all men who achieve a success he became an object of envy and suspicion and other assayers entered into a conspiracy against him and let some prominent citizens into the secret in order to show that they meant fairly then they broke a little fragment off a carpenter's grindstone and got a stranger to take it to the popular scientist and get it assayed in the course of an hour the result came whereby it appeared that a ton of that rock would yield one thousand one hundred and eighty four dollars and forty cents in silver and three hundred and sixty six dollars and thirty six cents in gold due publication of the whole matter was made in the paper and the popular assayer left town between two days i will remark in passing that i only remained in the milling business one week i told my employer i could not stay longer without an advance in my wages that i liked quartz milling indeed was infatuated with it that i had never before grown so tenderly attached to an occupation in so short a time that nothing it seemed to me gave such scope to intellectual activity as feeding a battery and screening tailings and nothing so stimulated the moral attributes as retorting bullion and washing blankets still i felt constrained to ask an increase of salary he said he was paying me ten dollars a week and thought it a good round sum how much did i want i said about four hundred thousand dollars a month and board was about all i could reasonably ask considering the hard times i was ordered off the premises and yet when i look back to those days and call to mind the exceeding hardness of the labor i performed in that mill i only regret that i did not ask him seven hundred thousand shortly after this i began to grow crazy along with the rest of the population about the mysterious and wonderful cement mine and to make preparations to take advantage of any opportunity that might offer to go and help hunt for it end of chapter thirty six this is chapter thirty seven of roughing it this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer visit librivox dot org roughing it by mark twain chapter thirty seven it was somewhere in the neighborhood of mono lake that the marvelous whiteman cement mine was supposed to lie every now and then it would be reported that mr w had passed stealthily through esmeralda at dead of night in disguise and then we would have a wild excitement because he must be steering for his secret mine and now was the time to follow him in less than three hours after daylight all the horses and mules and donkeys in the vicinity would be bought hired or stolen and half the community would be off for the mountains following in the wake of whiteman but w would drift about through the mountain gorges for days together in a purposeless sort of way until the provisions of the miners ran out and they would have to go back home i have known it reported at eleven at night in a large mining camp that whiteman had just passed through and in two hours the streets so quiet before would be swarming with men and animals every individual would be trying to be very secret but yet venturing to whisper to just one neighbor that w had passed through and long before daylight this in the dead of winter the stampede would be complete the camp deserted and the whole population gone chasing after w the tradition was that in the early immigration more than twenty years ago three young germans brothers who had survived an indian massacre on the plains 
wandered on foot through the deserts, avoiding all trails and roads, and simply holding a westerly direction, and hoping to find California before they starved, or died of fatigue. And in a gorge in the mountains they sat down to rest one day, when one of them noticed a curious vein of cement running along the ground, shot full of lumps of dull yellow metal. They saw that it was gold, and that here was a fortune to be acquired in a single day. The vein was about as wide as a curbstone, and fully two-thirds of it was pure gold. Every pound of the wonderful cement was worth well-nigh two hundred dollars. Each of the brothers loaded himself with about twenty-five pounds of it, and then they covered up all traces of the vein, made a rude drawing of the locality and the principal landmarks in the vicinity, and started westward again. But troubles thickened about them. In their wanderings one brother fell and broke his leg, and the others were obliged to go on and leave him to die in the wilderness. Another, worn out and starving, gave up by and by and laid down to die, but after two or three weeks of incredible hardships the third reached the settlements of California, exhausted, sick, and his mind deranged by his sufferings. He had thrown away all his cement but a few fragments, but these were sufficient to set everybody wild with excitement. However, he had had enough of the cement country, and nothing could induce him to lead a party thither. He was entirely content to work on a farm for wages. But he gave Whiteman his map, and described the cement region as well as he could, and thus transferred the curse to that gentleman. For when I had my one accidental glimpse of Mr. W. in Esmeralda, he had been hunting for the lost mine, in hunger and thirst, poverty and sickness, for twelve or thirteen years. Some people believed he had found it, but most people believed he had not. I saw a piece of cement as large as my fist, which was said to have been given to Whiteman by the young German, and it was of a seductive nature. Lumps of virgin gold were as thick in it as raisins in a slice of fruit cake. The privilege of working such a mine one week would be sufficient for a man of reasonable desires. A new partner of ours, a Mr. Higby, knew Whiteman well by sight and a friend of ours, a Mr. Van Dorn, was well acquainted with him, and not only that, but had Whiteman's promise that he should have a private hint in time to enable him to join the next cement expedition. Van Dorn had promised to extend the hint to us. One evening Higby came in greatly excited, and said he felt certain he had recognized Whiteman uptown, disguised, and in a pretended state of intoxication. In a little while Van Dorn arrived and confirmed the news, and so we gathered in our cabin, and with heads close together arranged our plans in impressive whispers. We were to leave town quietly, after midnight, in two or three small parties, so as not to attract attention, and meet at dawn on the divide, overlooking Mono Lake, eight or nine miles distant. We were to make no noise after starting, and not speak above a whisper under any circumstances. It was believed that for once Whiteman's presence was unknown in the town, and his expedition unsuspected. Our conclave broke up at nine o'clock, and we set about our preparation diligently and with profound secrecy. At eleven o'clock we saddled our horses, hitched them with their long riatas, or lassoes, and then brought out a side of bacon, a sack of beans, a small sack of coffee, some sugar, a hundred pounds of flour in sacks, some tin cups and a coffee-pot, frying-pan, and some few other necessary articles. All these things were packed on the back of a lead horse, and whoever has not been taught by a Spanish adept to pack an animal, let him never hope to do the thing by natural smartness. That is impossible. Higby had had some experience, but was not perfect. He put on the pack saddle, a thing like a saw-buck, piled the property on it, and then wound a rope all over and about it, and under it, every which way, taking a hitch in it every now and then, and occasionally surging back on it, till the horse's sides sunk in and he gasped for breath. But every time the lashings grew tight in one place, they loosened in another. We never did get the load tight all over, but we got it so that it would do, after a fashion, and then we started, in single file, close order, and without a word. It was a dark night. We kept the middle of the road, and proceeded in a slow walk past the rows of cabins, and whenever a miner came to his door, I trembled for fear the light would shine on us and excite curiosity. 
But nothing happened. We began the long winding ascent of the canyon, toward the divide, and presently the cabins began to grow infrequent, and the intervals between them wider and wider, and then I began to breathe tolerably freely and feel less like a thief and a murderer. I was in the rear, leading the pack-horse. As the ascent grew steeper, he grew proportionately less satisfied with his cargo, and began to pull back on his riata occasionally and delay progress. My comrades were passing out of sight in the gloom. I was getting anxious. I coaxed and bullied the pack-horse till I presently got him into a trot, and then the tin cups and pans strung about his person frightened him, and he ran. His riata was wound around the pummel of my saddle, and so, as he went by, he dragged me from my horse, and the two animals traveled briskly on without me. But I was not alone. The loosened cargo tumbled overboard from the pack-horse and fell close to me. It was abreast of almost the last cabin. A miner came out and said, Hello! I was thirty steps from him and knew he could not see me. It was so very dark in the shadow of the mountain. So I lay still. Another head appeared in the light of the cabin door, and presently the two men walked toward me. They stopped within ten steps of me, and one said, Shh! Listen! I could not have been in a more distressed state if I had been escaping justice with a price on my head. Then the miners appeared to sit down on a boulder, though I could not see them distinctly enough to be very sure what they did. One said, I heard a noise, as plain as I ever heard anything. It seemed to be about there. A stone whizzed by my head. I flattened myself out in the dust like a postage stamp, and thought to myself, if he mended his aim ever so little, he would probably hear another noise. In my heart now I execrated secret expeditions. I promised myself that this should be my last, though the Sierras were ribbed with cement veins. Then one of the men said, "'I'll tell you what. Welch knew what he was talking about when he said he saw a white man today. I heard horses. That was the noise. I am going down to Welch's right away.' They left, and I was glad. I did not care whither they went. So they went. I was willing they should visit Welch, and the sooner the better. As soon as they closed their cabin door, my comrades emerged from the gloom. They had caught the horses, and were waiting for a clear coast again. We remounted the cargo on the pack-horse, and got under way, and as day broke we reached the divide, and joined Van Dorn. Then we journeyed down into the valley of the lake, and feeling secure we halted to cook breakfast, for we were tired and sleepy and hungry. Three hours later, the rest of the population filed over the divide in a long procession, and drifted off out of sight around the borders of the lake. Whether or not my accident had produced this result we never knew, but at least one thing was certain. The secret was out, and Whiteman would not enter upon a search for the cement mine this time. We were filled with chagrin. We held a council, and decided to make the best of our misfortune, and enjoy a week's holiday on the borders of the curious lake. Mono, it is sometimes called, and sometimes the Dead Sea of California. It is one of the strangest freaks of nature to be found in any land, but it is hardly ever mentioned in print, and very seldom visited, because it lies away off the usual routes of travel, and besides is so difficult to get at that only men content to endure the roughest life will consent to take upon themselves the discomforts of such a trip. On the morning of our second day we traveled around to a remote and particularly wild spot on the borders of the lake, where a stream of fresh ice-cold water entered it from the mountainside, and then we went regularly into camp. We hired a large boat and two shotguns from a lonely ranchman who lived some ten miles further on, and made ready for comfort and recreation. We soon got thoroughly acquainted with the lake and all its peculiarities. End of chapter 37 This is chapter 38 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain Chapter 38 Mono Lake lies in a lifeless, treeless, hideous desert, eight thousand feet above the level of the sea, and is guarded by mountains two thousand feet higher, whose summits are always clothed in clouds. This solemn, silent, sailless sea, this lonely tenant of the loneliest spot on earth, 
is little graced with the picturesque. It is an unpretending expanse of grayish water, about a hundred miles in circumference, with two islands in its center, mere upheavals of rent and scorched and blistered lava, snowed over with gray banks and drifts of pumice-stone and ashes, the winding sheet of the dead volcano, whose vast crater the lake has seized upon and occupied. The lake is two hundred feet deep, and its sluggish waters are so strong with alkali that if you only dip the most hopelessly soiled garment into them once or twice, and wring it out, it will be found as clean as if it had been through the ablest of washerwomen's hands. While we camped there, our laundry work was easy. We tied the week's washing astern of our boat, and sailed a quarter of a mile, and the job was complete. All to the wringing out. If we threw the water on our heads and gave them a rubber so, the white lather would pile up three inches high. This water is not good for bruised places and abrasions of the skin. We had a valuable dog. He had raw places on him. He had more raw places on him than sound ones. He was the rawest dog I almost ever saw. He jumped overboard one day to get away from the flies. But it was bad judgment. In his condition it would have been just as comfortable to jump into the fire. The alkali water nipped him in all the raw places simultaneously, and he struck out for the shore with considerable interest. He yelped and barked and howled as he went, and by the time he got to the shore there was no bark to him, for he had barked the bark all out of his inside, and the alkali water had cleaned the bark all off his outside, and he probably wished he had never embarked in any such enterprise. He ran around and around in circles, and pawed the earth and clawed the air, and threw double somersaults, sometimes backward and sometimes forward, in the most extraordinary manner. He was not a demonstrative dog as a general thing, but rather of a grave and serious turn of mind, and I never saw him take so much interest in anything before. He finally struck out over the mountains, at a gait which we estimated at about two hundred and fifty miles an hour, and he is going yet. This was about nine years ago. We look for what is left of him along here every day. A white man cannot drink the water of Mono Lake, for it is nearly pure lye. It is said that the Indians in the vicinity drink it sometimes, though. It is not improbable, for they are among the purest liars I ever saw. There will be no additional charge for this joke except to parties requiring an explanation of it. This joke has received high commendation from some of the ablest minds of the age. There are no fish in Mono Lake, no frogs, no snakes, no pollywogs, nothing, in fact, that goes to make life desirable. Millions of wild ducks and seagulls swim about the surface, but no living thing exists under the surface except a white feathery sort of worm, one half an inch long, which looks like a bit of white thread frayed out at the sides. If you dip up a gallon of water, you will get about fifteen thousand of these. They give to the water a sort of grayish-white appearance. Then there is a fly, which looks something like our house fly. These settle on the beach to eat the worms that wash ashore. And any time you can see there a belt of flies an inch deep and six feet wide, and this belt extends clear around the lake, a belt of flies one hundred miles long. If you throw a stone among them, they swarm up so thick that they look dense like a cloud. You can hold them under the water as long as you please. They do not mind it. They are only proud of it. When you let them go, they pop up to the surface as dry as a patent office report, and walk off as unconcernedly as if they had been educated especially with a view to affording instructive entertainment to man in that particular way. Providence leaves nothing to go by chance. All things have their uses, and their part and proper place in nature's economy. The ducks eat the flies, the flies eat the worms, the Indians eat all three, the wild cats eat the Indians, the white folks eat the wild cats, and thus all things are lovely. Mono Lake is a hundred miles in a straight line from the ocean, and between it and the ocean are one or two ranges of mountains, yet thousands of seagulls go there every season to lay their eggs and rear their young. One would as soon expect to find seagulls in Kansas. And in this connection let us observe another instance of nature's wisdom. 
the islands in the lake being merely huge masses of lava coated over with ashes and pumice stone and utterly innocent of vegetation or anything that would burn and seagulls eggs being entirely useless to anybody unless they be cooked nature has provided an unfailing spring of boiling water on the largest island and you can put your eggs in there and in four minutes you can boil them as hard as any statement i have made during the past fifteen years within ten feet of the boiling spring is a spring of pure cold water sweet and wholesome so in that island you get your board and washing free of charge and if nature had gone further and furnished a nice american hotel clerk who was crusty and disobliging and didn't know anything about the timetables or the railroads or anything and was proud of it i would not wish for a more desirable boarding-house half a dozen little mountain brooks flow into mono lake but not a stream of any kind flows out of it it neither rises nor falls apparently and what it does with its surplus water is a dark and bloody mystery there are only two seasons in the region round about mono lake and these are the breaking up of one winter and the beginning of the next more than once in esmeralda i have seen a perfectly blistering morning open up with the thermometer at ninety degrees at eight o'clock and seen the snow fall fourteen inches deep and that same identical thermometer go down to forty-four degrees under shelter before nine o'clock at night under favorable circumstances it snows at least once in every single month in the year in the little town of mono so uncertain is the climate in summer that a lady who goes out visiting cannot hope to be prepared for all emergencies unless she takes her fan under one arm and her snowshoes under the other when they have a fourth of july procession it generally snows on them and they do say that as a general thing when a man calls for a brandy toddy there the barkeeper chops it off with a hatchet and wraps it up in a paper like maple sugar and it is further reported that the old soakers haven't any teeth wore them out eating gin cocktails and brandy punches i do not endorse that statement i simply give it for what it is worth and it is worth well i should say millions to any man who can believe it without straining himself but i do endorse the snow on the fourth of july because i know that to be true end of chapter thirty eight this is chapter thirty nine of roughing it this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer visit librivox dot org roughing it by mark twain chapter thirty nine about seven o'clock one blistering hot morning for it was now dead summer time higby and i took the boat and started on a voyage of discovery to the two islands we had often longed to do this but had been deterred by the fear of storms for they were frequent and severe enough to capsize an ordinary rowboat like ours without great difficulty and once capsized death would ensue in spite of the bravest swimming for that venomous water would eat a man's eyes out like fire and burn him out inside too if he shipped a sea it was called twelve miles straight out to the islands a long pull and a warm one but the morning was so quiet and sunny and the lake so smooth and glassy and dead that we could not resist the temptation so we filled two large tin canteens with water since we were not acquainted with the locality of the spring said to exist on the large island and started higby's brawny muscles gave the boat good speed but by the time we reached our destination we judged that we had pulled nearer fifteen miles than twelve we landed on the big island and went ashore we tried the water in the canteens now and found that the sun had spoiled it it was so brackish that we could not drink it so we poured it out and began a search for the spring for thirst augments fast as soon as it is apparent that one has no means at hand of quenching it the island was a long moderately high hill of ashes nothing but gray ashes and pumice stone in which we sunk to our knees at every step and all around the top was a forbidding wall of scorched and blasted rocks when we reached the top and got within the wall we found simply a shallow far-reaching basin carpeted with ashes and here and there a patch of fine sand in places picturesque jets of steam shot up out of crevices giving evidence that although this ancient crater had gone out of active business there was still some fire left in its furnaces 
Close to one of these jets of steam stood the only tree on the island, a small pine of most graceful shape and most faultless symmetry. Its color was a brilliant green, for the steam drifted unceasingly through its branches and kept them always moist. It contrasted strangely enough, did this vigorous and beautiful outcast, with its dead and dismal surroundings. It was like a cheerful spirit in a mourning household. We hunted for the spring everywhere, traversing the full length of the island, two or three miles, and crossing it twice, climbing ash hills patiently, and then sliding down the other side in a sitting posture, plowing up smothering volumes of gray dust. But we found nothing but solitude, ashes, and a heart-breaking silence. Finally we noticed that the wind had risen, and we forgot our thirst in a solitude of greater importance for the lake being quiet we had not taken pains about securing the boat we hurried back to a point overlooking our landing place and then but mere words cannot describe our dismay the boat was gone the chances were that there was not another boat on the entire lake the situation was not comfortable in truth to speak plainly it was frightful we were prisoners on a desolate island in aggravating proximity to friends who were for the present helpless to aid us, and what was still more uncomfortable was the reflection that we had neither food nor water. But presently we sighted the boat. It was drifting along leisurely, about fifty yards from shore, tossing in a foamy sea. It drifted, and continued to drift, but at the same safe distance from land, and we walked along abreast it and waited for fortune to favor us. At the end of an hour it approached a jutting cape, and Higby ran ahead and posted himself on the utmost verge, and prepared for the assault. If we failed there, there was no hope for us. It was driving gradually shoreward all the time now, but whether it was driving fast enough to make the connection or not was the momentous question. When it got within thirty steps of Higby, I was so excited that I fancied I could hear my own heart beat. When a little later it dragged slowly along and seemed about to go by, only one little yard out of reach, it seemed as if my heart stood still. And when it was exactly abreast of him, and began to widen away, and he still standing like a watching statue, I knew my heart did stop. But when he gave a great spring the next instant, and lit fairly in the stern, I discharged a war-whoop that woke the solitudes." but it dulled my enthusiasm presently, when he told me that he had not been caring whether the boat came within jumping distance or not, so that it passed within eight or ten yards of him, for he had made up his mind to shut his eyes and mouth and swim that trifling distance. Imbecile that I was, I had not thought of that. It was only a long swim that could be fatal. The sea was running high, and the storm increasing. It was growing late, too three or four in the afternoon. Whether to venture toward the mainland or not was a question of some moment. But we were so distressed by thirst that we decided to try it. And so Higby fell to work, and I took the steering oar. When we had pulled a mile, laboriously, we were evidently in serious peril, for the storm had greatly augmented. The billows ran very high and were capped with foaming crests. The heavens were hung with black, and the wind blew with great fury. We would have gone back now, but we did not dare to turn the boat around, because as soon as she got in the trough of the sea she would upset, of course. Our only hope lay in keeping her head on to the seas. It was hard work to do this, she plunged so, and so beat and belabored the billows with her rising and falling bows. And now and then one of Higby's oars would trip on the top of a wave, and the other one would snatch the boat half round in spite of my cumbersome steering apparatus. We were drenched by the sprays constantly, and the boat occasionally shipped water. By and by, powerful as my comrade was, his great exertions began to tell on him, and he was anxious that I should change places with him till he could rest a little. But I told him this was impossible, for if the steering oar were dropped a moment while we changed, the boat would slew around into the trough of the sea capsize, and in less than five minutes we would have a hundred gallons of soap suds in us, and be eaten up so quickly that we could not even be present at our own inquest. But things cannot last always. Just as the darkness shut down, we came booming into port, head on. Higby dropped his oars to hurrah. I dropped mine to help. The sea gave the boat a twist, and over she went. 
the agony that alkali water inflicts on bruises chafes and blistered hands is unspeakable and nothing but greasing all over will modify it but we ate drank and slept well that night notwithstanding in speaking of the peculiarities of mono lake i ought to have mentioned that at intervals all around its shores stand picturesque turret-looking masses and clusters of a whitish coarse-grained rock that resembles inferior mortar dried hard and if one breaks off fragments of this rock he will find perfectly shaped and thoroughly petrified gulls eggs deeply embedded in the mass how did they get there i simply state the fact for it is a fact and leave the geological reader to crack the nut at his leisure and solve the problem after his own fashion at the end of a week we adjourned to the sierras on a fishing excursion and spent several days in camp under snowy castle peak and fished successfully for trout in a bright miniature lake whose surface was between ten and eleven thousand feet above the level of the sea cooling ourselves during the hot august noons by sitting on snowbanks ten feet deep under whose sheltering edges fine grass and dainty flowers flourished luxuriously and at night entertaining ourselves by almost freezing to death then we returned to mono lake and finding that the cement excitement was over for the present packed up and went back to esmeralda mr blue reconnoitred a while and not liking the prospect set out alone for humboldt about this time occurred a little incident which has always had a sort of interest to me from the fact that it came so near instigating my funeral at a time when an indian attack had been expected the citizens hid their gunpowder where it would be safe and yet convenient to hand when wanted a neighbor of ours hid six cans of rifle powder in the bake oven of an old discarded cooking stove which stood on the open ground near a frame outhouse or shed and from and after that day never thought of it again we hired a half-tamed indian to do some washing for us and he took up quarters under the shed with his tub the ancient stove reposed within six feet of him and before his face finally it occurred to him that hot water would be better than cold and he went out and fired up under that forgotten powder magazine and set on a kettle of water then he returned to his tub i entered the shed presently and threw down some more clothes and was about to speak to him when the stove blew up with a prodigious crash and disappeared leaving not a splinter behind fragments of it fell in the streets full two hundred yards away nearly a third of the shed roof over our heads was destroyed and one of the stove lids after cutting a small stanchion half in two in front of the indian whizzed between us and drove partly through the weather boarding beyond i was as white as a sheet and as weak as a kitten and speechless but the indian betrayed no trepidation no distress not even discomfort he simply stopped washing leaned forward and surveyed the clean blank ground a moment and then remarked humph damn stove heap gone and resumed his scrubbing as placidly as if it were an entirely customary thing for a stove to do i will explain that heap is injun english for very much the reader will perceive the exhaustive expressiveness of it in the present instance end of chapter thirty nine this is chapter forty of roughing it this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer visit librivox dot org roughing it by mark twain chapter forty i now come to a curious episode the most curious i think that had yet accented my slothful valueless heedless career out of a hillside toward the upper end of the town projected a wall of reddish-looking quartz croppings the exposed comb of a silver-bearing ledge that extended deep down into the earth of course it was owned by a company entitled the wide west there was a shaft sixty or seventy feet deep on the under side of the croppings and everybody was acquainted with the rock that came from it and tolerably rich rock it was too but nothing extraordinary I will remark here that although to the inexperienced stranger all the quartz of a particular district looks about alike, an old resident of the camp can take a glance at a mixed pile of rock, separate the fragments, and tell you which mine each came from, as easily as a confectioner can separate and classify the various kinds and qualities of candy in a mixed heap of the article. All at once the town was thrown into a state of extraordinary excitement. 
In mining parlance the Wide West had struck it rich. Everybody went to see the new developments, and for some days there was such a crowd of people about the Wide West shaft that a stranger would have supposed there was a mass meeting in session there. No other topic was discussed but the rich strike, and nobody thought or dreamed about anything else. Every man brought away a specimen, ground it up in a hand-mortar, washed it out in his horn-spoon, and glared speechless upon the marvelous result. It was not hard rock, but black, decomposed stuff which could be crumbled in the hand like a baked potato, and when spread out on a paper exhibited a thick sprinkling of gold and particles of native silver. Higby brought a handful to the cabin, and when he had washed it out his amazement was beyond description. Wide West stock soared skywards. It was said that repeated offers had been made for it at a thousand dollars a foot, and promptly refused. We have all had the blues, the mere sky blues, but mine were indigo now, because I did not own in the Wide West. The world seemed hollow to me, and existence a grief. I lost my appetite, and ceased to take an interest in anything. Still I had to stay and listen to other people's rejoicings, because I had no money to get out of the camp with. The Wide West Company put a stop to the carrying away of specimens, and well they might, for every handful of the ore was worth a sum of some consequence. To show the exceeding value of the ore, I will remark that a sixteen hundred pounds parcel of it was sold, just as it lay, at the mouth of the shaft, at one dollar a pound, and the man who bought it packed it on mules a hundred and fifty or two hundred miles over the mountains to San Francisco, satisfied that it would yield at a rate that would richly compensate him for his trouble. The Wide West people also commanded their foremen to refuse any but their own operatives permission to enter the mine at any time or for any purpose. I kept up my blue meditations, and Higby kept up a deal of thinking, too, but of a different sort. He puzzled over the rock, examined it with a glass, inspected it in different lights and from different points of view, and after each experiment delivered himself in a soliloquy of one and the same unvarying opinion in the same unvarying formula. It is not Wide West rock. He said once twice that he meant to have a look into the Wide West shaft if he got shot for it. I was wretched and did not care whether he got a look into it or not. He failed that day, and tried again at night, failed again, got up at dawn and tried and failed again. Then he lay in ambush in the sagebrush hour after hour, waiting for the two or three hands to adjourn to the shade of a boulder for dinner. Made a start once, but was premature. One of the men came back for something. Tried it again, but when almost at the mouth of the shaft, another of the men rose up from behind the boulder as if to reconnoiter, and he dropped on the ground and lay quiet. Presently he crawled on his hands and knees to the mouth of the shaft, gave a quick glance around, then seized the rope and slid down the shaft. He disappeared in the gloom of a side drift, just as a head appeared in the mouth of the shaft, and somebody shouted, "Hallo!" which he did not answer. He was not disturbed any more. An hour later he entered the cabin, hot, red, and ready to burst with smothered excitement, and exclaimed in a stage whisper, "'I knew it! We are rich! It's a blind lead!' I thought the very earth reeled under me. Doubt, conviction, doubt again, exultation, hope, amazement, belief, unbelief. Every emotion imaginable swept in wild procession through my heart and brain, and I could not speak a word. After a moment or two of this mental fury I shook myself to rights and said, "'Say it again. It's blind lead. Cal, let's—let's let's burn the house or kill somebody. Let's get out of where there's room to hurrah. But what is the use? It is a hundred times too good to be true. It's a blind lead for a million. Hanging wall, foot wall, clay casings, everything complete.' He swung his hat and gave three cheers, and I cast doubt to the winds and chimed in with a will, for I was worth a million dollars, and did not care whether school kept or not. But perhaps I ought to explain. A blind lead is a lead or ledge that does not crop out above the ground. A miner does not know where to look for such leads, but they are often stumbled upon by accident in the course of driving a tunnel or sinking a shaft. Higby knew the wide west rock perfectly well, 
and the more he had examined the new developments, the more he was satisfied that the ore could not have come from the wide west vein. And so had it occurred to him alone, of all the camp, that there was a blind lead down in the shaft, and that even the wide west people themselves did not suspect it. He was right. When he went down the shaft, he found that the blind lead held its independent way through the wide west vein, cutting it diagonally, and that it was enclosed in its own well-defined casing rocks and clay. Hence it was public property. Both leads being perfectly well-defined, it was easy for any miner to see which one belonged to the wide west and which did not. We thought it well to have a strong friend, and therefore we brought the foreman of the wide west to our cabin that night, and revealed the great surprise to him. Higby said, "'We are going to take possession of this blind lead, record it, and establish ownership, and then forbid the Wide West Company to take out any more of the rock. You cannot help your company in this matter. Nobody can help them. I will go into the shaft with you and prove to your entire satisfaction that it is a blind lead. Now we propose to take you in with us, and claim the blind lead in our three names. What do you say?' What could a man say who had an opportunity to simply stretch forth his hand and take possession of a fortune, without risk of any kind, and without wronging any one, or attaching the least taint of dishonor to his name? He could only say, Agreed. The notice was put up that night, and duly spread upon the recorder's books before ten o'clock. We claimed two hundred feet each, six hundred feet in all, the smallest and compactest organization in the district, and the easiest to manage. No one can be so thoughtless as to suppose that we slept that night. Higby and I went to bed at midnight, but it was only to lie broad awake and think, dream, scheme. The floorless, tumble-down cabin was a palace, the ragged gray blankets silk, the furniture rosewood and mahogany. Each new splendor that burst out of my visions of the future whirled me bodily over in bed or jerked me to a sitting posture, just as if an electric battery had been applied to me. We shot fragments of conversation back and forth at each other. Once, Higby said, "'When are you going home to the States?' "'Tomorrow,' with an evolution or two, ending with a sitting position. "'Well, no, but next month, at furthest. "'We'll go in the same steamer.' "'Agreed. "'A pause. "'Steamer of the tenth? "'Yes. "'No, the first. "'All right.' "'Another pause. "'Where are you going to live?' said Higby. "'San Francisco.' That's me. Pause. Too high. Too much climbing. From Higby. What is? I was thinking of Russian Hill, building a house up there. Too much climbing. Shan't you keep a carriage? Of course. I forgot that. Pause. Cal, what kind of a house are you going to build? I was thinking about that. Three-story and an attic. But what kind? Well, I don't hardly know. Brick, I suppose. Brick? Bosh! Why? What is your idea? Brown stone front, French plate glass, billiard room off the dining room, statuary and paintings, shrubbery and two acre grass plat, greenhouse, iron dog on the front stoop, gray horses, Lando, and uh, a coachman with a bug on his hat. By George! A long pause. Cal, when are you going to Europe? Well, I hadn't thought of that. When are you? In the spring. Going to be gone all summer? All summer. I shall remain there three years. No. But are you in earnest? Indeed I am. I will go along, too. Why, of course you will. What part of Europe shall you go to? All parts. France, England, Germany, Spain, Italy, Switzerland, Syria, Greece, Palestine, Arabia, Persia, Egypt, all over, everywhere. I'm agreed. All right. Won't it be a swell trip? We'll spend forty or fifty thousand dollars trying to make it one, anyway. Another long pause. Higby, we owe the butcher six dollars, and he has been threatening to stop our— Hang the butcher! Amen. And so it went on. By three o'clock we found it was no use, and so we got up and played cribbage and smoked pipes till sunrise. It was my week to cook. I always hated cooking. Now I abhorred it. The news was all over town. The former excitement was great. This one was greater still. I walked the streets serene and happy. Higby said the foreman had been offered two hundred thousand dollars for his third of the mine. I said I would like to see myself selling for any such price. My ideas were lofty. My figure was a million. Still, I honestly believe that if I had been offered it, 
it would have had no other effect than to make me hold off for more. I found abundant enjoyment in being rich. A man offered me a three-hundred-dollar horse, and wanted to take my simple unendorsed note for it. That brought the most realizing sense I had yet had that I was actually rich, beyond shadow of doubt. It was followed by numerous other evidences of a similar nature, among which I may mention the fact of the butcher leaving us a double supply of meat and saying nothing about money. By the laws of the district the locators or claimants of a ledge were obliged to do a fair and reasonable amount of work on their new property within ten days after the date of the location, or the property was forfeited, and anybody could go and seize it that chose. So we determined to go to work the next day. About the middle of the afternoon, as I was coming out of the post-office, I met a Mr. Gardiner who told me that Captain John Nye was lying dangerously ill at his place, the Nine Mile Ranch, and that he and his wife were not able to give him nearly as much care and attention as his case demanded. I said, if he would wait for me a moment, I would go down and help in the sick-room. I ran to the cabin to tell Higby. He was not there, but I left a note on the table for him, and a few minutes later I left town in Gardner's wagon. End of chapter 40 This is chapter 41 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain. Chapter 41. Captain Nye was very ill indeed, with spasmodic rheumatism. But the old gentleman was himself, which is to say, he was kind-hearted and agreeable when comfortable, but a singularly violent wildcat when things did not go well. He would be smiling along pleasantly enough when a sudden spasm of his disease would take him and he would go out of his smile into a perfect fury. He would groan and wail and howl with the anguish and fill up the odd chinks with the most elaborate profanity that strong convictions and a fine fancy could contrive. With fair opportunity he could swear very well and handle his adjectives with considerable judgment but when the spasm was on him it was painful to listen to him, he was so awkward. However, I had seen him nurse a sick man himself, and put up patiently with the inconveniences of the situation, and consequently I was willing that he should have full license now that his own turn had come. He could not disturb me, with all his raving and ranting, for my mind had work on hand, and it labored on diligently, night and day, whether my hands were idle or employed. I was altering and amending the plans for my house, and thinking over the propriety of having the billiard-room in the attic, instead of on the same floor with the dining-room. Also I was trying to decide between green and blue for the upholstery of the drawing-room, for, although my preference was blue, I feared it was a color that would be too easily damaged by dust and sunlight. Likewise, while I was content to put the coachman in a modest livery, I was uncertain about a footman. I needed one, and was even resolved to have one, but wished he could properly appear and perform his functions out of livery, for I somewhat dreaded so much show, and yet, inasmuch as my late grandfather had had a coachman and such things, but no liveries, I felt rather drawn to beat him, or beat his ghost at any rate. I was also systematizing the European trip, and managed to get it all laid out as to route and length of time to be devoted to it, everything with one exception, namely, whether to cross the desert from Cairo to Jerusalem per camel, or go by sea to Beirut and thence down through the country per caravan. Meantime I was writing to the friends at home every day, instructing them concerning all my plans and intentions, and directing them to look up a handsome homestead for my mother, and agree upon a price for it against my coming, and also directing them to sell my share of the Tennessee land, and tender the proceeds to the Widows and Orphans Fund of the Typographical Union, of which I had long been a member in good standing. This Tennessee land had been in the possession of the family many years, and promised to confer high fortune upon us some day. It still promises it, but in a less violent way. When I had been nursing the captain nine days, he was somewhat better, but very feeble. During the afternoon we lifted him into a chair and gave him an alcoholic vapor bath, and then set about putting him on the bed again. We had to be exceedingly careful, for the least jar produced pain. 
Gardner had his shoulders, and I his legs. In an unfortunate moment I stumbled, and the patient fell heavily on the bed in an agony of torture. I never heard a man swear so in my life. He raved like a maniac, and tried to snatch a revolver from the table, but I got it. He ordered me out of the house, and swore a world of oaths that he would kill me wherever he caught me when he got on his feet again. It was simply a passing fury, and meant nothing. I knew he would forget it in an hour, and maybe be sorry for it, too, but it angered me a little, at the moment, so much so, indeed, that I determined to go back to Esmeralda. I thought he was able to get along alone now, since he was on the war-path. I took supper, and as soon as the moon rose, began my nine-mile journey on foot. Even millionaires needed no horses in those days, for a mere nine-mile jaunt without baggage. As I raised the hill overlooking the town, it lacked fifteen minutes of twelve. I glanced at the hill over beyond the canyon, and in the bright moonlight saw what appeared to be about half the population of the village massed on and around the wide west croppings. My heart gave an exulting bound, and I said to myself, "'They have made a new strike tonight, and struck it richer than ever, no doubt.' I started over there, but gave it up. I said the strick would keep, and I had climbed hill enough for one night. I went on down through the town, and as I was passing a little German bakery, a woman ran out and begged me to come in and help her. She said her husband had a fit. I went in, and judged she was right. He appeared to have a hundred of them, compressed into one. Two Germans were there, trying to hold him, and not making much of a success of it. I ran up the street half a block or so, and routed out a sleeping doctor, brought him down half-dressed, and we four wrestled with the maniac, and doctored, and drenched, and bled him for more than an hour, and the poor German woman did the crying. He grew quiet now, and the doctor and I withdrew and left him to his friends. It was a little after one o'clock. As I entered the cabin door, tired but jolly, the dingy light of a tallow-candle revealed Higby, sitting by the pine-table, gazing stupidly at my note, which he held in his fingers, and looking pale, old, and haggard. I halted and looked at him. He looked at me, stolidly. I said, "'Higby, what—what is it?' "'We're ruined. We didn't do the work. The blind leads relocated.' It was enough. I sat down sick, grieved broken-hearted indeed. A minute before I was rich and brimful of vanity. I was a pauper now, and very meek. We sat still an hour, busy with thought, busy with vain and useless self-upbraidings, busy with, why didn't I do this, and why didn't I do that, but neither spoke a word. Then we dropped into mutual explanations, and the mystery was cleared away. It came out that Higby had depended on me as I had on him, and as both of us had on the foreman. The folly of it, it was the first time that ever stayed and steadfast Higby had left an important matter to chance, or failed to be true to his full share of a responsibility. But he had never seen my note till this moment, and this moment was the first time he had been in the cabin since the day he had seen me last. He also had left a note for me, on that same fatal afternoon, had ridden up on horseback, and looked through the window, and, being in a hurry and not seeing me, had tossed the note into the cabin through a broken pane. Here it was, on the floor, where it had remained undisturbed for nine days. Don't fail to do the work before the ten days expire. W. has passed through and given me notice. I am to join him at Mono Lake, and we shall go on from there to-night. He says he will find it this time, sure. Cal. W. meant Whiteman, of course that thrice-accursed cement. That was the way of it. An old miner like Higby could no more withstand the fascination of a mysterious mining excitement like this cement foolishness than he would refrain from eating when he was famishing. Higby had been dreaming about the marvelous cement for months, and now, against his better judgment, he had gone off and taken the chances on my keeping secure a mine worth a million undiscovered cement veins. They had not been followed this time. His riding out of town in broad daylight was such a commonplace thing to do that it had not attracted any attention. He said they prosecuted their search in the fastnesses of the mountains during nine days without success. They could not find the cement. Then a ghastly fear came over him that something might have happened to prevent the doing of the necessary work to hold the blind lead, though indeed he thought such a thing hardly possible, 
and forthwith he started home with all speed. He would have reached Esmeralda in time, but his horse broke down and he had to walk a great part of the distance. And so it happened that as he came into Esmeralda by one road, I entered it by another. His was the superior energy, however, for he went straight to the wide west, instead of turning aside as I had done, and he arrived there about five or ten minutes too late. The notice was already up, the relocation of our mind completed beyond recall, and the crowd rapidly dispersing. He learned some facts before he left the ground. The foreman had not been seen about the streets since the night we had located the mine. A telegram had called him to California on a matter of life and death, it was said. At any rate, he had done no work, and the watchful eyes of the community were taking note of the fact. At midnight of this woeful tenth day, the ledge would be relocatable, and by eleven o'clock the hill was black with men prepared to do the relocating. That was the crowd I had seen when I fancied a new strike had been made. Idiot that I was! We three had the same right to relocate the lead that other people had, provided we were quick enough. As midnight was announced, fourteen men, duly armed and ready to back their proceedings, put up their notice and proclaimed their ownership of the blind lead under the new name of Johnson. But A. D. Allen, our partner, the foreman, put in a sudden appearance about that time, with a cocked revolver in his hand, and said his name must be added to the list, or he would thin out the Johnson Company some. He was a manly, splendid, determined fellow, and known to be as good as his word, and therefore a compromise was effected. They put in his name for a hundred feet, reserving to themselves the customary two hundred feet each. Such was the history of the night's events, as Higby gathered from a friend on the way home. Higby and I cleared out on a new mining excitement the next morning, glad to get away from the scene of our sufferings, and after a month or two of hardship and disappointment, returned to Esmeralda once more. Then we learned that the Wide West and the Johnson Companies had consolidated, that the stock, thus united, comprised five thousand feet, or shares, that the foreman, apprehending tiresome litigation, and considering such a huge concern unwieldy, had sold his hundred feet for ninety thousand dollars in gold, and gone home to the States to enjoy it. If the stock was worth such a gallant figure, with five thousand shares in the corporation, it makes me dizzy to think what it would have been worth with only our original six hundred in it. It was the difference between six hundred men owning a house and five thousand owning it. We would have been millionaires if we'd only worked with pick and spade one little day on our property, and so secured our ownership. It reads like a wild fancy sketch, but the evidence of many witnesses, and likewise that of the official records of Esmeralda District, is easily obtainable in proof that it is a true history. I can always have it to say that I was absolutely and unquestionably worth a million dollars once, for ten days. A year ago my esteemed and in every way estimable old millionaire partner Higby wrote me from an obscure little mining camp in California that after nine or ten years of buffetings and hard striving, he was at last in a position where he could command twenty-five hundred dollars, and said he meant to go into the fruit business in a modest way. How such a thought would have insulted him the night we lay in our cabin planning European trips! and brownstone houses on Russian Hill. End of chapter 41 This is chapter 42 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain, chapter 42 What to do next? It was a momentous question. I had gone out into the world to shift for myself at the age of thirteen, for my father had endorsed for friends, and although he left us a sumptuous legacy of pride in his fine Virginian stock and its national distinction, I presently found that I could not live on that alone without occasional bread to wash it down with. I had gained a livelihood in various vocations, but had not dazzled anybody with my successes. Still the list was before me and the amplest liberty in the matter of choosing, provided I wanted to work, which I did not, after being so wealthy. I had once been a grocery clerk, for one day, but had consumed so much sugar in that time that I was relieved from further duty by the proprietor, said he wanted me outside, so that he could have my custom. I had studied law an entire week, and then given it up, 
because it was so prosy and tiresome. I had engaged briefly in the study of blacksmithing, but wasted so much time trying to fix the bellows so that it would blow itself that the master turned me adrift in disgrace, and told me I would come to no good. I had been a bookseller's clerk for a while, but the customers bothered me so much I could not read with any comfort, and so the proprietor gave me a furlough and forgot to put a limit to it. I had clerked in a drug store part of a summer, but my prescriptions were unlucky, and we appeared to sell more stomach pumps than soda water, so I had to go. I had made of myself a tolerable printer, under the impression that I would be another Franklin some day, but somehow had missed the connection thus far. There was no berth open in the Esmeralda Union, and, besides, I had always been such a slow compositor that I looked with envy upon the achievements of apprentices of two years' standing, and when I took a take, foremen were in the habit of suggesting that it would be wanted some time during the year. I was a good average St. Louis and New Orleans pilot, and by no means ashamed of my abilities in that line. Wages were two hundred and fifty dollars a month, and no board to pay, and I did long to stand behind a wheel again and never roam any more. But I had been making such an ass of myself lately in grandiloquent letters home about my blind lead and my European excursion, that I did what many and many a poor disappointed miner had done before, said, It is all over with me now, and I will never go back home to be pitied and snubbed. I had been a private secretary, a silver miner, and a silver mill operative, and amounted to less than nothing in each. And now, what to do next? I yielded to Higby's appeals and consented to try the mining once more. We climbed far up on the mountainside and went to work on a little rubbishy claim of ours that had a shaft on it eight feet deep. Higby descended into it and worked bravely with his pick until he had loosened up a deal of rock and dirt, and then I went down with a long-handled shovel, the most awkward invention yet contrived by man, to throw it out. You must brace the shovel forward with the side of your knee till it is full, and then, with a skillful toss, throw it backward over your left shoulder. I made the toss and landed the mess just on the edge of the shaft, and it all came back on my head and down the back of my neck. I never said a word, but climbed out and walked home. I inwardly resolved that I would starve before I would make a target of myself and shoot rubbish at it with a long-handled shovel. I sat down in the cabin and gave myself up to solid misery, so to speak. Now, in pleasanter days, I had amused myself with writing letters to the chief paper of the territory, the Virginia Daily Territorial Enterprise, and had always been surprised when they appeared in print. My good opinion of the editors had steadily declined, for it seemed to me that they might have found something better to fill up with than my literature. I had found a letter in the post office as I came home from the hillside, and finally I opened it. Eureka! Never did know what Eureka meant, but it seems to be as proper a word to heave in as any when no other that sounds pretty offers. It was a deliberate offer to me of twenty-five dollars a week to come up to Virginia and be city editor of the Enterprise. I would have challenged the publisher in the blind lead days. I wanted to fall down and worship him now. Twenty-five dollars a week. It looked like bloated luxury, a fortune, a sinful and lavish waste of money. But my transports cooled when I thought of my inexperience and consequent unfitness for the position. And straightway on top of this my long array of failures rose up before me. Yet, if I refused this place, I must presently become dependent upon somebody for my bread, a thing necessarily distasteful to a man who had never experienced such a humiliation since he was thirteen years old. Not much to be proud of, since it is so common, but then it was all I had to be proud of. So I was scared into being a city editor. I would have declined otherwise. Necessity is the mother of taking chances. I do not doubt that if, at that time, I had been offered a salary to translate the Talmud from the original Hebrew, I would have accepted, albeit with diffidence and some misgivings, and thrown as much variety into it as I could for the money. I went up to Virginia and entered upon my new vocation. I was a rusty-looking city editor, I am free to confess, coatless, slouch hat, blue woolen shirt, pantaloons stuffed into boot tops, whiskered half down to the waist, and the universal navy revolver slung to my belt. 
but I secured a more Christian costume and discarded the revolver. I had never had occasion to kill anybody, nor ever felt a desire to do so, but had worn the thing in deference to popular sentiment, and in order that I might not, by its absence, be offensively conspicuous and a subject of remark. But the other editors and all the printers carried revolvers. I asked the chief editor and proprietor, Mr. Goodman, I will call him, since it describes him as well as any name could do, for some instructions with regard to my duties, and he told me to go all over town and ask all sorts of people all sorts of questions, and make notes of the information gained, and write them out for publication. And he added, Never say, We learn so-and-so, or It is reported, or It is rumored, or We understand so-and-so, but go to the headquarters and get the absolute facts, and then speak out and say, It is so-and-so. Otherwise people will not put confidence in your news. Unassailable certainty is the thing that gives a newspaper the firmest and most valuable reputation. It was the whole thing in a nutshell, and to this day when I find a reporter commencing his article with, We understand, I gather a suspicion that he has not taken as much pains to inform himself as he ought to have done. I moralize well, but I did not always practice well when I was a city editor. I let fancy get the upper hand of fact too often when there was a dearth of news. I can never forget my first day's experience as a reporter. I wandered about town questioning everybody, boring everybody, and finding out that nobody knew anything. At the end of five hours my notebook was still barren. I spoke to Mr. Goodman. He said, Dan used to make a good thing out of the hay wagons in a dry time when there were no fires or inquests. Are there no hay wagons in front of the truckee? If there are, you might speak of the renewed activity and all that sort of thing. In the hay business, you know. It isn't sensational or exciting, but it fills up and looks businesslike. I canvassed the city again and found one wretched old hay truck dragging in from the country, but I made affluent use of it. I multiplied it by sixteen, brought it into town from sixteen different directions, made sixteen separate items out of it, and got up such another sweat about hay as Virginia City had never seen in the world before. This was encouraging. Two non-parel columns had to be filled, and I was getting along. Presently, when things began to look dismal again, a desperado killed a man in a saloon, and joy returned once more. I never was so glad over any mere trifle before in my life. I said to the murderer, "'Sir, you are a stranger to me, but you have done me a kindness this day which I can never forget. If whole years of gratitude can be to you any slight compensation, they shall be yours. I was in trouble, and you have relieved me nobly, and at a time when all seemed dark and drear. Count me your friend from this time forth, for I am not a man to forget a favor.' If I did not really say that to him, I at least felt a sort of itching desire to do it. I wrote up the murder with a hungry attention to details, and when it was finished experienced but one regret, namely that they had not hanged my benefactor on the spot, so that I could work him up too. Next I discovered some emigrant wagons going into camp on the plaza, and found that they had lately come through the hostile Indian country, and had fared rather roughly. I made the best of the item that the circumstances permitted, and felt that if I were not confined within rigid limits by the presence of the reporters of the other papers, I could add particulars that would make the article much more interesting. However, I found one wagon that was going on to California, and made some judicious inquiries of the proprietor. When I learned, through his short and surly answers to my cross-questioning, that he was certainly going on and would not be in the city next day to make trouble, I got ahead of the other papers, for I took down his list of names and added his party to the killed and wounded. Having more scope here, I put this wagon through an Indian fight that to this day has no parallel in history. My two columns were filled. When I read them over in the morning I felt that I had found my legitimate occupation at last. I reasoned within myself that news, and stirring news too, was what a paper needed and I felt that I was particularly endowed with the ability to furnish it. Mr. Goodman said that I was as good a reporter as Dan. I desired no higher commendation. With encouragement like that, I felt that I could take my pen and murder all the immigrants on the plains, if need be, and the interests of the paper demanded it. End of chapter 42 This is chapter 43 of Roughing It. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain. Chapter 43. However, as I grew better acquainted with the business and learned the run of the sources of information, I ceased to require the aid of fancy to any large extent, and became able to fill my columns without diverging noticeably from the domain of fact. I struck up friendships with the reporters of the other journals, and we swapped regulars with each other, and thus economized work. Regulars are permanent sources of news, like courts, bullion returns, clean-ups at the courts' mills, and inquests. Inasmuch as everybody went armed, we had an inquest about every day, and so this department was naturally set down among the regulars. We had lively papers in those days. My great competitor among the reporters was Boggs of the Union. He was an excellent reporter. Once in three or four months he would get a little intoxicated, but as a general thing he was a wary and cautious drinker, although always ready to tamper a little with the enemy. He had the advantage of me in one thing. He could get the monthly public school report, and I could not, because the principal hated the enterprise. One snowy night, when the report was due, I started out sadly, wondering how I was going to get it. Presently, a few steps up the almost deserted street, I stumbled on Boggs, and asked him where he was going. "'After the school report. I'll go along with you. No, sir, I'll excuse you. Just as you say.' A saloon-keeper's boy passed by with a steaming pitcher of hot punch, and Boggs snuffed the fragrance gratefully. He gazed fondly after the boy, and saw him start up the Enterprise stairs. I said, "'I wish you could help me get that school business, but since you can't, I must run up to the Union office and see if I can get them to let me have a proof of it after they have it set up, though I don't begin to suppose they will. Good night.' "'Hold on a minute. I don't mind getting the report and sitting around with the boys a little while you copy it, if you're willing to drop down to the principals with me. Now you talk like a rational being. Come along.' We ploughed a couple of blocks through the snow, got the report, and returned to our office. It was a short document, and soon copied. Meantime Boggs helped himself to the punch. I gave the manuscript back to him, and we started out to get an inquest, for we had heard pistol-shots nearby. We got the particulars with little loss of time, for it was only an inferior sort of barroom murder, and of little interest to the public, and then we separated. Away at three o'clock in the morning, when we had gone to press, and were having a relaxing concert as usual, for some of the printers were good singers, and others good performers on the guitar, and on that atrocity the accordion. The proprietor of the union strode in, and desired to know if anybody had heard anything of Boggs or the school report. We stated the case, and all turned out to help hunt for the delinquent. We found him standing on a table in a saloon, with an old tin lantern in one hand, and the school report in the other haranguing a gang of intoxicated Cornish miners on the iniquity of squandering the public monies on education, when hundreds and hundreds of honest, hard-working men are literally starving for whiskey. Riotous applause. He had been assisting in a regal spree with those parties for hours. We dragged him away and put him to bed. Of course there was no school report in the Union, and Boggs held me accountable though I was innocent of any intention or desire to compass its absence from that paper, and was as sorry as any one that the misfortune had occurred. But we were perfectly friendly. The day that the school report was next due, the proprietor of the Genesee mine furnished us a buggy, and asked us to go down and write something about the property, a very common request, and one always gladly acceded to when people furnished buggies, for we were as fond of pleasure excursions as other people. In due time we arrived at the mine, nothing but a hole in the ground, ninety feet deep, and no way of getting down into it, but by holding on to a rope and being lowered with a windlass. The workmen had just gone off somewhere to supper. I was not strong enough to lower Boggs' bulk, so I took an unlighted candle in my teeth, made a loop for my foot in the end of the rope, implored Boggs not to go to sleep or let the windlass get the start of him and then swung out over the shaft. 
I reached the bottom, muddy and bruised about the elbows, but safe. I lit the candle, made an examination of the rock, selected some specimens, and shouted to Boggs to hoist away. No answer. Presently a head appeared in the circle of daylight, a way aloft, and a voice came down. "'Are you all set? All set. Hoist away. Are you comfortable? Perfectly. Could you wait a little?' "'Oh, uh, certainly. Uh, no particular hurry. Well, good-bye. Why? Where are you going?' "'After the school report.' And he did. I stayed down there an hour, and surprised the workmen when they hauled up and found a man on the rope instead of a bucket of rock. I walked home, too, five miles, uphill. We had no school report next morning, but the Union had. Six months after my entry into journalism, the grand flush times of Silverland began, and they continued with unabated splendor for three years. All difficulty about filling up the local department ceased, and the only trouble now was how to make the lengthened columns hold the world of incidents and happenings that came to our literary net every day. Virginia had grown to the livest town for its age and population, that America had ever produced. The sidewalks swarmed with people, to such an extent, indeed, that it was generally no easy matter to stem the human tide. The streets themselves were just as crowded with quartz wagons, freight teams, and other vehicles. The procession was endless. So great was the pack that buggies frequently had to wait half an hour for an opportunity to cross the principal street. Joy sat on every countenance, and there was a glad, almost fierce intensity in every eye that told of the money-getting schemes that were seething in every brain, and the high hope that held sway in every heart. Money was as plenty as dust. Every individual considered himself wealthy, and a melancholy countenance was nowhere to be seen. There were military companies, fire companies, brass bands, banks, hotels theatres, hurdy-gurdy houses, wide-open gambling palaces, political pow-wows, civic processions, street fights, murders, inquests, riots, a whiskey-mill every fifteen steps, a board of aldermen, a mayor, a city surveyor, a city engineer, a chief of the fire department, with first, second, and third assistants, a chief of police, city marshal, and a large police force, two boards of mining brokers, a dozen breweries, and half a dozen jails and station-houses in full operation, and some talk of building a church. The flush times were in magnificent flower. Large, fireproof brick buildings were going up in the principal streets, and the wooden suburbs were spreading out in all directions. Town lots soared up to prices that were amazing. The great Comstock load stretched its opulent length straight through the town from north to south, and every mine on it was in diligent process of development. One of these mines alone employed six hundred and seventy-five men, and in the matter of election the adage was, as the Gould and Curry goes, so goes the city. Laboring men's wages were four and six dollars a day, and they worked in three shifts or gangs, and the blasting and picking and shoveling went on without ceasing night and day. The city of Virginia roosted royally midway up the steep side of Mount Davidson, 7,200 feet above the level of the sea, and in the clear Nevada atmosphere was visible from a distance of fifty miles. It claimed a population of 15,000 to 18,000, and all day long half of this little army swarmed the streets like bees and the other half swarmed among the drifts and tunnels of the Comstock, hundreds of feet down in the earth, directly under those same streets. Often we felt our chairs jar, and heard the faint boom of a blast down in the bowels of the earth under the office. The mountainside was so steep that the entire town had a slant to it like a roof. Each street was a terrace, and from each to the next street below the descent was forty or fifty feet. The fronts of the houses were level with the street they faced, but their rear first floors were propped on lofty stilts. A man could stand at a rear first-floor window of a C Street house and look down the chimneys of the row of houses below him facing D Street. It was a laborious climb in that thin atmosphere, 
to ascend from D to A Street, and you were panting and out of breath when you got there. But you could turn around and go down again like a house afire, so to speak. The atmosphere was so rarefied on account of the great altitude that one's blood lay near the surface always, and the scratch of a pin was a disaster worth worrying about, for the chances were that a grievous erysipelas would ensue. But to offset this, the thin atmosphere seemed to carry healing to gunshot wounds, and therefore to simply shoot your adversary through both lungs was a thing not likely to afford you any permanent satisfaction, for he would be nearly certain to be around looking for you within the month, and not with an opera-glass either. From Virginia's airy situation one could look over a vast, far-reaching panorama of mountain ranges and deserts, and whether the day was bright or overcast, whether the sun was rising or setting, or flaming in the zenith, or whether night and the moon held sway, the spectacle was always impressive and beautiful. Over your head Mount Davidson lifted its gray dome, and before and below you a rugged canyon clove the battlemented hills, making a somber gateway through which a soft-tinted desert was glimpsed, with a silver thread of a river winding through it, bordered with trees which many miles of distance diminished to a delicate fringe, and still further away the snowy mountains rose up and stretched their long barrier to the filmy horizon, far enough beyond a lake that burned in the desert like a fallen sun, though that itself lay fifty miles removed. Look from your window where you would, there was fascination in the picture. At rare intervals, but very rare, there were clouds in our skies, and then the setting sun would gild and flush and glorify this mighty expanse of scenery with a bewildering pomp of color that held the eye like a spell and moved the spirit like music. End of chapter 43 this is chapter 44 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain Chapter 44 My salary was increased to forty dollars a week, but I seldom drew it. I had plenty of other resources and what were two broad twenty-dollar gold pieces to a man who had his pockets full of such, and a cumbersome abundance of bright half-dollars besides? Paper money has never come into use on the Pacific coast. Reporting was lucrative, and every man in the town was lavish with his money and his feet. The city and all the great mountainside were riddled with mining shafts. There were more mines than miners. True, not ten of these mines were yielding rock worth hauling to a mill, but everybody said, "'Wait till the shaft gets down where the ledge comes in solid, and then you'll see.' So nobody was discouraged. These were nearly all wildcat mines, and wholly worthless, but nobody believed it then. The Ophir, the Gould and Curry, the Mexican, and other great mines on the Comstock lead in Virginia and Gold Hill were turning out huge piles of rich rock every day, and every man believed that his little wildcat claim was as good as any on the main lead, and would infallibly be worth a thousand dollars a foot when he got down where it came in solid. Poor fellow, he was blessedly blind to the fact that he never would see that day. So the thousand wildcat shafts burrowed deeper and deeper into the earth day by day, and all men were beside themselves with hope and happiness. How they labored, prophesied, exulted! Surely nothing like it was ever seen before since the world began. Every one of these wildcat mines—not mines, but holes in the ground over imaginary mines— was incorporated and had handsomely engraved stock, and the stock was saleable, too. It was bought and sold with a feverish avidity in the boards every day. You could go up on the mountainside, scratch around, and find a ledge—there was no lack of them—put up a notice with a grandiloquent name in it, start a shaft, get your stock printed, and with nothing whatever to prove that your mine was worth a straw, you could put your stock on the market and sell out for hundreds and even thousands of dollars. To make money and make it fast was as easy as it was to eat your dinner. Every man owned feet in fifty different wildcat mines, and considered his fortune made. Think of a city with not one solitary poor man in it. 
one would suppose that when month after month went by and still not a wildcat mine by wildcat i mean in general terms any claim not located on the mother vein i e the comstock yielded a ton of rock worth crushing the people would begin to wonder if they were not putting too much faith in their prospective riches but there was not a thought of such a thing they burrowed away bought and sold and were happy new claims were taken up daily and it was the friendly custom to run straight to the newspaper offices give the reporter forty or fifty feet and get them to go and examine the mine and publish a notice of it they did not care a fig what you said about the property so you said something consequently we generally said a word or two to the effect that the indications were good or that the ledge was six feet wide or that the rock resembled the comstock and so it did but as a general thing the resemblance was not startling enough to knock you down if the rock was moderately promising we followed the custom of the country used strong adjectives and frothed at the mouth as if a very marvel in silver discoveries had transpired if the mine was a developed one and had no pay ore to show and of course it hadn't we praised the tunnel said it was one of the most infatuating tunnels in the land driveled and driveled about the tunnel till we ran entirely out of ecstasies and never said a word about the rock we would squander half a column of adulation on a shaft or a new wire rope or a dressed pine windlass or a fascinating force pump and close with a burst of admiration of the gentlemanly and efficient superintendent of the mine but never utter a whisper about the rock and those people were always pleased always satisfied occasionally we patched up and varnished our reputation for discrimination and stern undeviating accuracy by giving some old abandoned claim a blast that ought to have made its dry bones rattle and then somebody would seize it and sell it on the fleeting notoriety thus conferred upon it there was nothing in the shape of a mining claim that was not saleable we received presents of feet every day if we needed a hundred dollars or so we sold some if not we hoarded it away, satisfied that it would ultimately be worth a thousand dollars a foot. I had a trunk about half full of stock. When a claim made a stir in the market and went up to a high figure, I searched through my pile to see if I had any of its stock, and generally found it. The prices rose and fell constantly, but still a fall disturbed us little, because a thousand dollars a foot was our figure and so we were content to let it fluctuate as much as it pleased till it reached it my pile of stock was not all given to me by people who wished their claims noticed at least half of it was given me by persons who had no thought of such a thing and looked for nothing more than a simple verbal thank you and you were not even obliged by law to furnish that if you are coming up the street with a couple of baskets of apples in your hands and you meet a friend you naturally invite him to take a few that describes the condition of things in virginia in the flush times every man had his pockets full of stock and it was the actual custom of the country to part with small quantities of it to friends without the asking very often it was a good idea to close the transaction instantly when a man offered a stock present to a friend for the offer was only good and binding at that moment and if the price went to a high figure shortly afterward the procrastination was a thing to be regretted mr stewart senator now from nevada one day told me he would give me twenty feet of justice stock if i would walk over to his office it was worth five or ten dollars a foot i asked him to make the offer good for next day as i was just going to dinner he said he would not be in town so i risked it and took my dinner instead of the stock within the week the price went up to seventy dollars and afterward to a hundred and fifty but nothing could make that man yield i suppose he sold that stock of mine and placed the guilty proceeds in his own pocket my revenge will be found in the accompanying portrait i met three friends one afternoon who said they had been buying overman stock at auction at eight dollars a foot one said if i would come up to his office he would give me fifteen feet another said he would add fifteen the third said he would do the same but i was going after an inquest and could not stop a few weeks afterward they sold all their overmen at six hundred dollars a foot and generously came around to tell me about it 
and also to urge me to accept of the next forty-five feet of it that people tried to force on me. These are actual facts, and I could make the list a long one and still confine myself strictly to the truth. Many a time friends gave us as much as twenty-five feet of stock that was selling at twenty-five dollars a foot, and they thought no more of it than they would of offering a guest a cigar. These were flush times indeed. I thought they were going to last always, but somehow I never was much of a prophet. To show what a wild spirit possessed the mining brain of the community, I will remark that claims were actually located in excavations for cellars, where the pick had exposed what seemed to be quartz veins, and not cellars in the suburbs either, but in the very heart of the city, and forthwith stock would be issued and thrown on the market. It was small matter who the seller belonged to, the ledge belonged to the finder, and unless the United States government interfered, inasmuch as the government holds the primary right to mines of the noble metals in Nevada, or at least did then, it was considered to be his privilege to work it. Imagine a stranger staking out a mining claim among the costly shrubbery in your front yard, and calmly proceeding to lay waste the ground with pick and shovel and blasting powder. It has been often done in California. In the middle of one of the principal business streets of Virginia, a man located a mining claim and began a shaft on it. He gave me a hundred feet of the stock, and I sold it for a fine suit of clothes, because I was afraid somebody would fall down the shaft and sue for damages. I owned in another claim that was located in the middle of another street, and to show how absurd people can be, that East India stock, as it was called, sold briskly, although there was an ancient tunnel running directly under the claim, and any man could go into it and see that it did not cut a quartz ledge or anything that remotely resembled one. One plan of acquiring sudden wealth was to salt a wildcat claim and sell out while the excitement was up. The process was simple. The schemer located a worthless ledge, sunk a shaft on it, bought a wagon-load of rich Comstock ore, dumped a portion of it into the shaft, and piled the rest by its side, above ground. Then he showed the property to a simpleton, and sold it to him at a high figure. Of course, the wagon-load of rich ore was all that the victim ever got out of his purchase. A most remarkable case of salting was that of the North Ophir. It was claimed that this vein was a remote extension of the original Ophir, a valuable mine on the Comstock. For a few days everybody was talking about the rich developments in the North Ophir. It was said that it yielded perfectly pure silver in small solid lumps. I went to the place with the owners, and found a shaft six or eight feet deep in the bottom of which was a badly shattered vein of dull, yellowish, unpromising rock. One would as soon expect to find silver in a grindstone. We got out a pan of the rubbish, and washed it in a puddle, and sure enough, among the sediment, we found half a dozen black, bullet-looking pellets of unimpeachable native silver. Nobody had ever heard of such a thing before. Science could not account for such a queer novelty. The stock rose to sixty-five dollars a foot, and at this figure the world-renowned tragedian, McKean Buchanan, bought a commanding interest and prepared to quit the stage once more. He was always doing that. And then it transpired that the mine had been salted, and not in any hackneyed way either, but in a singularly bold, barefaced, and peculiarly original and outrageous fashion. On one of the lumps of native silver was discovered the minted legend, Ted States of and then it was plainly apparent that the mine had been salted with melted half-dollars. The lumps thus obtained had been blackened till they resembled native silver, and were then mixed with a shattered rock in the bottom of the shaft. It is literally true. Of course the price of the stock at once fell to nothing, and the tragedian was ruined. But for this calamity we might have lost McKean Buchanan from the stage. End of chapter 44 this is chapter 45 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain. Chapter 45. 
The flush times held bravely on, something over two years before Mr. Goodman and another journeyman printer had borrowed forty dollars and set out from San Francisco to try their fortunes in the new city of Virginia. They found the territorial enterprise, a poverty-stricken weekly journal gasping for breath and likely to die. They bought it, type, fixtures, goodwill and all, for a thousand dollars on long time. The editorial sanctum, newsroom, press-room, publication office, bedchamber, parlor, and kitchen were all compressed into one apartment, and it was a small one, too. The editors and printers slept on the floor, a Chinaman did their cooking, and the imposing stone was the general dinner-table. But now things were changed. The paper was a great daily, printed by steam. There were five editors and twenty-three compositors. The subscription price was sixteen dollars a year. The advertising rates were exorbitant, and the columns crowded. The paper was clearing from six to ten thousand dollars a month, and the enterprise building was finished and ready for occupation, a stately fireproof brick. Every day from five all the way up to eleven columns of live advertisements were left out or crowded into spasmodic and irregular supplements. The Gould and Curry Company were erecting a monster hundred-stamp mill at a cost that ultimately fell little short of a million dollars. Gould and Curry stock paid heavy dividends, a rare thing, and an experience confined to the dozen or fifteen claims located on the main lead, the Comstock. The superintendent of the Gould and Curry lived, rent-free, in a fine house built and furnished by the company. He drove a fine pair of horses, which were a present from the company, and his salary was twelve thousand dollars a year. The superintendent of another of the great mines traveled in grand state, had a salary of twenty-eight thousand dollars a year, and in a lawsuit in after days claimed that he was to have had one per cent on the gross yield of the bullion likewise. Money was wonderfully plenty. The trouble was, not how to get it, but how to spend it, how to lavish it, get rid of it, squander it. And so it was a happy thing that just at this juncture the news came over the wires that a great United States Sanitary Commission had been formed, and money was wanted for the relief of the wounded sailors and soldiers of the Union languishing in the Eastern hospitals. Right on the heels of it came word that San Francisco had responded superbly before the telegram was half a day old. Virginia rose as one man. A sanitary committee was hurriedly organized, and its chairman mounted a vacant cart in C Street and tried to make the clamorous multitude understand that the rest of the committee were flying hither and thither, and working with all their might and main, and that if the town would only wait an hour, an office would be ready, books opened, and the commission prepared to receive contributions. His voice was drowned, and his information lost in a ceaseless roar of cheers and demands that the money be received now. They swore they would not wait. The chairman pleaded and argued, but, deaf to all entreaty, men ploughed their way through the throng and rained checks of gold coin into the cart and scurried away for more. Hands clutching money were thrust aloft out of the jam by men who hoped this eloquent appeal would cleave a road their strugglings could not open. The very Chinamen and Indians caught the excitement and dashed their half-dollars into the cart without knowing or caring what it was all about. Women plunged into the crowd, trimly attired, fought their way to the cart with their coin, and emerged again by and by with their apparel in a state of hopeless dilapidation. It was the wildest mob Virginia had ever seen, and the most determined and ungovernable, and when at last it abated its fury and dispersed, it had not a penny in its pocket. To use its own phraseology, it came there flush, and went away busted. After that the commission got itself into systematic working order, and for weeks the contributions flowed into its treasury in a generous stream. Individuals and all sorts of organizations levied upon themselves a regular weekly tax for the sanitary fund, graduated according to their means, and there was not another grand universal outburst till the famous sanitary floor sack came our way. Its history is peculiar and interesting. A former schoolmate of mine, by the name of Ruel Gridley, was living at the little city of Austin, in the Reese River country at this time, and was the Democratic candidate for mayor. He and the Republican candidate made an agreement that the defeated man 
should be publicly presented with a fifty-pound sack of flour by the successful one, and should carry it home on his shoulder. Gridley was defeated. The new mayor gave him the sack of flour, and he shouldered it, and carried it a mile or two from Lower Austin to his home in Upper Austin, attended by a band of music and the whole population. Arrived there, he said he did not need the flour, and asked what the people thought he had better do with it. A voice said, "'Sell it to the highest bidder for the benefit of the sanitary fund.' The suggestion was greeted with a round of applause, and Gridley mounted a dry-goods box and assumed the role of auctioneer. The bids went higher and higher as the sympathies of the pioneers awoke and expanded, till at last the sack was knocked down to a millman at two hundred and fifty dollars, and his check taken. He was asked where he would have the flower delivered, and he said, "'Nowhere! Sell it again!' Now the cheers went up royally, and the multitude were fairly in the spirit of the thing, so Gridley stood there and shouted and perspired till the sun went down, and when the crowd dispersed he had sold the sack to three hundred different people, and had taken in eight thousand dollars in gold, and still the flour sack was in his possession. The news came to Virginia, and a telegram went back, "'Fetch along your flour sack!' Thirty-six hours afterward Gridley arrived, and an afternoon mass meeting was held in the opera house, and the auction began. But the sack had come sooner than it was expected. The people were not thoroughly aroused, and the sale dragged. At nightfall only five thousand dollars had been secured, and there was a crestfallen feeling in the community. However, there was no disposition to let the matter rest here and acknowledge vanquishment at the hands of the village of Austin. Till late in the night the principal citizens were at work arranging the morrow's campaign, and when they went to bed they had no fears for the result. At eleven the next morning a procession of open carriages, attended by clamorous bands of music, and adorned with a moving display of flags, filed along C Street, and was soon in danger of blockade by a huzzahing multitude of citizens. In the first carriage sat Gridley, with the flour-sack in prominent view, the latter splendid with bright paint and gilt lettering. Also in the same carriage sat the mayor and the recorder. The other carriages contained the common council, the editors and reporters, and other people of imposing consequence. The crowd pressed to the corner of C. and Taylor Streets, expecting the sale to begin there, but they were disappointed, and also unspeakably surprised, for the cavalcade moved on as if Virginia had ceased to be of importance and took its way over the divide toward the small town of Gold Hill. Telegrams had gone ahead to Gold Hill, Silver City, and Dayton, and those communities were at fever heat and rife for the conflict. It was a very hot day, and wonderfully dusty. At the end of a short half-hour we descended into Gold Hill with drums beating and colors flying, and enveloped in imposing clouds of dust. The whole population, men, women, and children, Chinamen and Indians were massed in the main street, all the flags in town were at the masthead, and the blare of the bands was drowned in cheers. Gridley stood up and asked who would make the first bid for the National Sanitary Flour Sack. General W. said, The Yellow Jacket Silver Mining Company offers a thousand dollars coin. A tempest of applause followed. A telegram carried the news to Virginia and fifteen minutes afterward that city's population was massed in the streets devouring the tidings, for it was part of the program that the bulletin boards should do a good work that day. Every few minutes a new dispatch was bulletined from Gold Hill, and still the excitement grew. Telegrams began to return to us from Virginia, beseeching Gridley to bring back the flour sack, but such was not the plan of the campaign. At the end of an hour, Gold Hill's small population had paid a figure for the flour sack that awoke all the enthusiasm of Virginia when the grand total was displayed upon the bulletin boards. Then the Gridley cavalcade moved on, a giant refreshed with new lager beer and plenty of it, for the people brought it to the carriages without waiting to measure it. And within three hours more the expedition had carried Silver City and Dayton by storm, and was on its way back covered with glory. Every move had been telegraphed and bulletined, and as the procession entered Virginia and filed down C Street at half-past eight in the evening, the town was abroad in the thoroughfares, torches were glaring, flags flying, bands playing, cheer on cheer cleaving the air, and the city ready to surrender at discretion. The auction began. Every bid was greeted with bursts of applause. 
and at the end of two hours and a half a population of fifteen thousand souls had paid in coin for a fifty-pound sack of flour a sum equal to forty thousand dollars in greenbacks it was at a rate in the neighborhood of three dollars for each man woman and child of the population the grand total would have been twice as large but the streets were very narrow and hundreds who wanted to bid could not get within a block of the stand and could not make themselves heard they grew tired of waiting and many of them went home long before the auction was over this was the greatest day virginia ever saw perhaps gridley sold the sack in carson city and several california towns also in san francisco then he took it east and sold it in one or two atlantic cities i think I'm not sure of that, but I know that he finally carried it to St. Louis, where a monster sanitary fair was being held, and after selling it there for a large sum, and helping on the enthusiasm by displaying the portly silver bricks which Nevada's donation had produced, he had the flour baked up into small cakes and retailed them at high prices. It was estimated that when the flour sack's mission was ended, it had been sold for a grand total of a hundred and fifty thousand dollars in greenbacks. This is probably the only instance on record where common family flour brought three thousand dollars a pound in the public market. It is due to Mr. Gridley's memory to mention that the expenses of his sanitary flour sack expedition of fifteen thousand miles going and returning were paid in large part, if not entirely, out of his own pocket. The time he gave to it was not less than three months. Mr. Gridley was a soldier in the Mexican War and a pioneer Californian. He died at Stockton, California, in December, 1870, greatly regretted. End of chapter 45